Lord Faulkner of Worcester. My Lords, I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, whilst there has not been a specific assessment on the link between anti-establishment politics and public confidence in vaccination, we take the issue of misinformation about vaccines extremely seriously and are working across government to tackle this. We are aware of global concerns regarding confidence in vaccinations, knowing the protection that they give against deadly diseases, and I am pleased to say that in this country, confidence in our vaccines is very high. I am grateful to the Minister for that, <coughs> for that positive answer. She will know that the World Health Organization has declared the anti-vaccine movement as one of the top global health yeah. threats for 2019, and that follows the tripling of the number of uh, measles cases across Europe and the rise in the United States sixfold. The paper in the European Journal uh, of Public Health, to which my question <coughs> refers, does say that there is a direct link between uh, the rise of populist politics and vaccine hesitancy, and cites particularly Greece, Italy, and France, and of course one would add the United States as well. And there was also much dis disinformation about vaccines spread on Twitter uh, and other social media. Will the government make vaccination compulsory, as their response to this, uh, as, as over one third of countries have done, and as indeed we did in Britain in 1853 to combat smallpox? And secondly, what progress have they made in forcing the social media companies to take down these misleading information, this misleading, misleading information about vaccines? Yeah, yeah. Well, I thank the noble lord for a very important question. The UK has one of the most sophisticated vaccination programmes in the world, and we constantly guard against threats that may reduce vaccination rates. I'm pleased to say that 93% of parents trust NHS staff and advice. The government recognises the threat posed by disinformation, and, and the upcoming online harms white paper will set out a new uh, framework for tackling this. PHE's monitoring data on patient and public trust, however, shows that there is no loss of trust in vaccination vaccination, which is to be welcomed. Um, on the issue of compulsory vaccination, vaccination programmes in the UK currently operate, like all other medical care, on a system of informed consent, and at the moment there is little evidence that compulsion would lead to an increased uptake, and so the government currently has no in, uh, plans to introduce such a system, but instead intends to work with those who have concerns about vaccination. My Lord. Trust of experts send out a terrible message to all those young people who spend years of study and thousands of pounds becoming experts. And doesn't our education system fail unless it produces a population who can properly interrogate scientific evidence? The noble Baroness is exactly right that we should have great confidence in experts and we should ensure that young people coming up through our education system should have that confidence in experts. This is why we can be proud of the high uptake that we do have in vaccinations in this country and we have um, a key number of components which have achieved the high, number, the high coverage of vaccinations. This includes national coordination of our vaccination programmes, fully trained staff and access to relevant information. We must ensure that that this continues going forward so that that high level of confidence from parents and patients continues. Uh, my Lord, in the study um, that the Noble Lord referred to in his question, the correlation <laughs> between populist voting and hes uh, vaccine hesitancy in the United Kingdom uh, was less than in a number of other European countries. Um, but a study in America demonstrated that um, what was most likely to lead to a positive response from parents was time spent with paediatricians. Uh, now, of course, it is about finding doctors who have the time to explain the purposes of vaccination and to respond to any parental concerns. So would my noble friend, the Minister, look at the extent to which family doctors can have this time incorporated into, for example, their quality and outcomes framework remuneration? Well, the noble lord is quite right um, that um, one of the things that was highlighted in the recent survey that was done about uh, public trust in vaccinations was that 93% of parents trust NHS staff and advice, but also 93% of parents remain confident in immunisation programme, um, which means that in order to cover off that last percentage, we need to ensure that those parents have access to a GP programme. So I would therefore encourage parents to speak to their GP or a health professional about vaccinations, look to 
credible sources such as NHS cho choices for their information, and I will certainly consider the point raised by my noble friend. My Lords, by coincidence, tomorrow here in this House, I'm hosting an event about vaccine policy, specifically about how we improve vaccine coverage in this country, because in spite of what the noble lady said, I think there is room for improvement, and some of us are really quite worried about the, the decline amongst some communities, particularly uh, some parts of the country. Does the noble Lord, lady, the minister, agree with me that much better use of social media is extremely important and necessary if we're to get the positive message about vaccine out there to counter the negative scare stories which do so much harm? And does she agree with me that more should be made of the intergenerational message? Older people, my lords, I don't only refer to people in this house, but the older population um, often have memories of the terrible impact of infectious diseases, whether we're talking about yellow fever, polio, or measles. They can tell those who are still young all about them. Surely this will reinforce the importance of the vaccination process. Well, I think that the noble uh, Baroness raises a very important point, which is that while um, social media can be uh, used to um, spread disinformation or misinformation, it can be also used in a positive way to spread the positive value of vaccinations. And that is why we want to work with those who have doubts about vaccination to, raise the to highlight the benefits of vaccinations, the protection that they bring from the very serious diseases which she highlights and how safe they are. A wealth of information is available online through trusted NHS channels. This will enable parents to make well-informed decisions about getting their children vaccinated, and I would encourage her in her event next week to highlight some of those channels which are available and which we will continue to push. My Lord, Lord. vaccination programmes are the most effective public health measures that we can imagine, and uh, I have two questions. One is, what encouragement is the government doing to ensure that uh, pharmaceutical companies are encouraged to develop new vaccines for infectious <coughs> diseases. And the other is I understand that there are some schools which have made it imperative for parents to ensure that their children are vaccinated before they can attend the schools. Is this something that we can extend? Um, well, the Noble Lord raises an important point. There are occasions where there are global shortages um, of vaccines, as has happened uh, with uh, some vaccines, and where those do occur, discussions uh, with manufacturers are ongoing, and we do also um, have ongoing work to develop new vaccines, um, which is part of the life sciences strategy and sector deal, which he may be aware of. Uh, Public Health England advises clinicians on how to prioritise available vaccines uh, where these situations do occur. On the issue um, of compulsory vaccinations and schools uh, which do restrict access on vaccinations. I think I covered that in my first answer, which is that Public Health England and clinicians do not believe that this is the appropriate route, as medical care in the UK is delivered by informed consent. And generally it is seen that those who are hesitant about vaccinations respond better to um, close work with them to explain to them the benefits of vaccines and how safe <laughs> that they are, because otherwise the risk is that they would withdraw entirely from schooling, um, which would be a much worse outcome from the children involved. Baroness yeah. Gardner of Parks. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper and, of course, remind you of my, my interest is declared in the registry. <laughs> my Lords, the Government seeks to prevent non-compliance of tax through targeted education and support while responding strongly to those breaking the rules. HM Revenue and Customs has dedicated teams looking into those who haven't voluntarily made themselves known, known as the hidden economy, including those who let property on either a short-term or a long-term basis. I thank the Minister for that answer. But will HMRC be persuaded to introduce an express declaration on all tax returns so that short-term let property addressees and income have to be disclosed in full and provide the information to local councils who will then help to enforce the 90-day limit. But that's important because it follows the Inside Out program uh, on the BBC One station identifying how you could go way beyond 90 days with impunity if you followed their advice. 
Well, the, the, the answer to the question is that via the uh, tax form SA105, people do have to uh, uh, make that uh, declaration uh, already. For the latest two years that uh, we have numbers available, there were 2.48 million, then it rose to 2.58 million, recognising the increase in traffic to which she was referring to in people actually earning a property from their income. But of course, it is limited to 90 days uh, in London. Of course, it's very important that people do declare uh, or all income because it is taxable. Uh, Airbnb, a significant company in this field, is apparently being uh, looked at closely by uh, Her Majesty's uh, Revenue. Uh, but they seem to be engaging in a practice as we associate all too well with multinationals, transferring profits outside the UK taxation regime elsewhere. Is the government tackling this measure fully, and don't we need international support in getting control over these companies? I mean, I think that's a, it's a good question. I think it's something that we are genuinely wrestling with as to how, you know, whether it's Uber or Amazon, how people actually we capture the uh, income which is due here. We made some changes in that in terms of taxing digital companies uh, going forward. But I think that as the technology and as the way in which the sharing economy and the online economy increases, all governments are going to have to do more in this area. Um, in answering the question, um, the noble or the minister talked about f people filling these things on their tax returns. But in fact, many people, if they don't do a self-assessment tax return, but are still letting property, do not fill in such a form. So that is one weakness in the, in the minister's answer. But could I also say there was a freedom of information request which reported that HMRC's Let Property campaign produced us a fraction of the number of disclosures that HMRC was expecting. The government, your government, estimated up to 1.5 million landlords had underpaid or failed to pay up to £500 million in tax in 2010. At the same time, people on low incomes cannot find a place to live in. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've, we, we've, we have done some things on that. I think the tax return which uh, I was referring to was SA 105, which is a self-assessment uh, 105 uh, tax form. Uh, the um, HMRC letting property campaign to which you referred has actually encouraged 35,000 more registered landlords to register and yield another £150 million to the Exchequer. It's not quite the full extent, but I think that it is a step in the right direction. Um, a long-term rental licensing scheme whereby the landlords have to register on long-term lets. Why can't the government devise a scheme for short-term lets on the same basis? Because that would help the, the, the revenue, gathering the revenue of the money that was due to them. I think it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting idea. I know there's a Newham scheme. There's also a Westminster scheme which is looking at where we're open uh, on these areas to look at whether uh, more needs to be done. But I do think that we also recognise that uh, this uh, you know, short-term letting, the kind of Air Airbnb sharing economy, is uh, filling a useful gap in the market. And there are schemes which are there in property allowances and rental room that can help people take advantage of it. Has the Minister seen written in the paper in the Times last week, um, but also it's been broadcast, that the Hilton Hotel claims in New York, the child chain, claims that they've been so undermined by Airbnb that it is killing the tourist industry in New York as far as the Hilton chain goes, and that was about the biggest there is. Does that not make us realise it is pretty important for us to have someone giving it a good watching eye on this? and the local authorities seem to be the best people. Uh, well, local authorities do have responsibility. They're responsible for enforcement. If they feel that the schemes are being uh, abused, they must look at that. But uh, it's not our responsibility to defend uh, uh, large international hotel chains. We're here to also look after small people who are getting some valuable extra income into their homes as a result of a legitimate activity. Would the minister confirm that anyone who evades rather than avoids paying United Kingdom tax would not be permitted to sit as a member of the House of Lords. <laughs> Well, the, the, the noble lord asks a, a, a leading question. I'm kind of getting very worried in giving a, a, a precise. But listen, tax, tax uh, evasion 
uh, is wrong and is against uh, uh, the law. And I'm sure that uh, all members of, uh, who are responsible for legislating the law must be held to a higher standard of account for actually upholding the laws which they say. Yeah. Yeah. Roberts have landed now. Lords, I beg leave to ask the question in my name on the order paper. My, my Lords, the Government is committed to ending rough sleeping by 2027 with the aim of halving it by 2022. We're all already taking action. Last year we published a cross-government strategy backed by £100 million of funding. The Rough Sleeping Initiative, launched a year ago, has provided over 1,750 new bed spaces and 500 staff to support rough sleepers since March 2018. And it's making an impact in rough sleeping initiative areas. Rough sleeping decreased by 19% in the last year. Well, I, I'm grateful to the Minister for that reply. It just doesn't add with the, uh, it doesn't uh, add, with the, uh, add up to the figures that I have. Yeah. Because I've been told that in 2000, 2010, um, we had 1,786 rough sleepers at the count then. But last year, 4,677, which is nearly triple the, 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 the numbers in 2010. And even in the new strategy, we, we halve the numbers who are sleeping rough. That also will be more than it was in 2010. So also, why is this, this? Many, many reasons. But one is, of course, that the, some of the um, hostels, for instance, in... in um, in uh, Tower Hamlets, 1,400 lost hostel beds in the last three years. You know, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. So I would suggest that we look at those again, but also that we look at the Vagrancy Act of 1824, which has also seen the, 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 the imprisonment for some, usually arrest for thousands of people who are sleeping rough. That certainly needs to be, uh, you, you know, uh, re have, the, 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 have, have it um, re revoked. So I would ask that the government. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm too long. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it, it's never my my fault. <laughs> but cer certainly, two, two two things we need: a massive investment for those organisations that provide the, the the beds, and also um, the end of the vacancy act. Uh, my, my Lords, on the point the Noble Lord made about the statistics, 4,677 in 2018, but he didn't go on to say that that was a fall since 2017 when it had been 4,751. So the trend is in a downwards direction, which the Noble Lord omitted to say. Also, he cited a Tower Hamlets, which is, is of course, receiving money, money as a rough sleeping initiative area, which you'll be pleased to know, and that money obviously will have a continuing impact as we see those uh, figures coming down. He's right, more needs to be done, but we are investing more money. We've just announced another 53 uh, areas that are benefiting from the rapid rehousing pathways uh, money, which is part of the initiative. Um, he, he should know that the Vagrancy Act, we are looking at a review of, the, a review of that. I can if, offer that, uh, the Noble Lord, the comfort on that particular point. A few months ago, the HCLG Secretary of State acknowledged there may be a link between rough sleeping and so-called welfare reform. Mm -hmm. And I quote, he said, we need to ask ourselves some very hard questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What steps are the government therefore taking to investigate and act on the links between social security cuts and rough sleeping, identified both by research and by organisations on the ground. Yeah. Well uh, my Lord, f first of all, I know the noble lady has done much work in this area, and indeed we've done some work in a, in a related area, and I know she will be pleased about the money that is being invested, particularly with regard to women rough sleepers, which again is part of this area. It is... Uh, across the board. There are many different aspects to this. Obviously, in MHCLG, we're focusing on money specifically for the housing aspects of it, but she's right. There is a broader front that we need to look at, and we are doing that, my lords. Is the noble minister aware of the particular problem in Westminster of rough sleeping in tents? Uh, and two things arise from that. One is uh, the concern that drug dealing may be going on in the tents. And secondly, uh, although they have got powers, the police, I think, are reluctant to be too aggressive in addressing the problem. 
Uh, my, my Lords, one, once again, my noble friend uh, refers to different aspects of this. He is, he is right that sensitive policing often helps in tackling these issues, and that, I know, is something that the police uh, throughout the country are very, very aware of. He is also right that there are a complex uh, range of issues, in, in, including addiction, which is very much an issue in relation to rough sleeping, and we're very intent on trying to deal with that, my Lords, as, as we are with other aspects. For example, a lot of people who sleep rough are people who've come from a secure background, sometimes uh, prison, sometimes the armed forces. It's a much more complex issue than just the finances, though that is an important part of it. My Lords, I refer the House my vote of interest as a Vice President of the Local Government Association. In addition to the figure the Lord Noble gave about individual trade year to year, could he set out why he believes the homes are more than trebled since 2010? Uh, my, my, my Lords, the, the Noble Lord is, is, is right. The figures had gone up re relentlessly over a period of time until this last year, which is, uh, I think, in response to the money that's being invested and the concentration the Government is putting on this. As, as I've indicated, perhaps, in my earlier response, it is a much more complex issue than, than just the monies. It is related to addiction, it's related to mental health, it's related to people in a secure environment. We are looking at this on a broad front, my Lords, as the Noble Lord will appreciate. It is a, a very, very complex problem, but I'm pleased that the money that we're spending on the rough uh, sleeping initiative and the money that we've invested on the rapid rehousing pathway has succeeded in bringing the figures down by assigning, for example, individuals to look after particular people who are rough sleeping to see what is the particular issue for that rough sleeper, because every, ish, every, every person is an individual, every case is different, my lords. My lords, uh, my lords I, I thank the noble lord, the minister, for the answers he's given so far and for the government's investment in this. Uh, in, in the city of Peterborough, we've seen, as in many other places, a, a large increase in rough sleeping, and the third sector groups, including churches, have been doing a, a great deal to support rough sleepers. But one of the problems we are very conscious of is, is how tight money is for local government. Is, does he agree with me that local government uh, financial settlements could be part of the solution with targeted money to local government specifically to help rough sleepers? My, my, my Lords, the, the Right Reverend Prelant makes a perfectly fair point, and he will be conscious of the fact that by a relatively small amount, but the financial settlement for local government this year was uh, a, an increase in resources for core funding in real terms. Also, if I could offer him some uh, very good news in relation to Peterborough, they are again a rough sleeping initiative area, as he's probably aware, and also, of course, the government is putting in direct funding in relation to integration in Peterborough, because it's one of our integration areas, one of the five areas. Uh, my Lords, uh, on the point of the Lord Roberts raised his second point about the, uh, the Vagrancy Act, it's often a point of contention with the police and those who obviously live on the street. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little more about when the review that he mentioned will conclude. I've been asked to chair a, a debate in the next two weeks, which is about the decriminalisation of living on the streets. Not about all aspects of the vagrancy law, but particularly about living on the streets, i.e. blaming somebody for something that generally they have no control over. And just to the second point that my Lord raised re just now about uh, living in tents, I've heard recently that some people being let from prison, released from prison, are being given a tent because they cannot get accommodation. And I don't expect the Minister to be able to answer that easily, but I just wonder if someone from the Government would look at that and see if it's accurate, because it sounds to me uh, unfair and uh, a not very good idea. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, my, my Lord, so on the second point first, if I may, um, I, I know nothing of that, and it does sound on the surface of it alarming. If the noble Lord has further information on that, I'd be grateful if you could uh, see, see me on that, uh, as it were, and, and I will certainly investigate that. On the Vagrancy Act, again, I will have to write to the noble Lord. I don't know when the uh, consultation and review is ending. I agree with him that there are aspects of that that uh, do require attention, but once again, I think it is probably more complex than it looks on the surface. But I will write to the Noble Lord on that issue. Lord Fox. I beg leave to, to ask the question standing on the order paper in my name. Uh, my Lords, the work of the ONS demonstrates the significant transitional challenge posed by automation but overlooks the considerable opportunity for creation of new highly skilled employment opportunities. The industrial strategy sets out the Government's vision to make the UK a global centre for AI and data innovation, alongside measures to ensure our people are equipped to capitalise on those opportunities. I thank the, the Minister for his answer, which uh, um, 
looks at the benefits, and there are certainly benefits for automation, but uh, there are also risks, not just uh, in gender terms, but also geographic. And uh, in addition to the, uh, the, the study that came out last week, the Centre for Cities issued a stud study last year which highlighted that those economies which are already weakest in the United Kingdom will be the economies whose jobs are most at risk. So I'll repeat the answer now asking a geographical bend. What in the industrial strategy and what in the government's plans is specifically focusing the danger of putting further diversity, further issues on our weakest economies? Uh, my Lord, so I'm glad that the Noble Lord recognises there are uh, very positive sides uh, to uh, developments in this field. I'm the World Economic Forum, as the Noble Lord will know, estimates that though there might be some 75 billion jobs lost globally as a result of change of this sort, uh, they reckon another 133 million uh, could be created. Uh, but the Noble Lord is right to point out that there will be a disadvantage of people, um, particularly those uh, low-skilled, uh, particularly, uh, he mentions the gender point, uh, particularly uh, women, and therefore, um, as the industrial strategy makes clear, it is very important that we look to uh, retraining, and I could refer the Noble Lord to large parts of the industrial strategy that points in the direction of retraining and upskilling. Uh, uh, our workforce as much as possible. My Lord, my Lord, uh, my Lord, can my noble friend tell us what happened to all the women who were employed as secretaries and personal assistants with the um, introduction of the word processor, which uh, made them all redundant? Uh, my Lord, uh, my noble friend is quite right. They found new jobs, better jobs, and more highly skilled jobs, and probably more interesting jobs. The government, quite rightly, has tried to deal with the issue of skills training in the UK. But it's quite clear that the FE colleges have been starved of resources for the last few years. What's the government going to do to put that money back into the FE sector so they can provide the skills that we need? Well, my lords, I, I could go at length to, uh, about what the government is doing in terms of uh, funding for uh, new training. I could just start off with the 506 million we've offered for uh, maths, digital and technical education. We've committed another 100 million for the first stage of developing the national retraining scheme to support people vulnerable to technological change. Uh, 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 I think in the seven minutes I've got, uh, I, I will leave it there, but uh, th there is a great deal going on. That is what the industrial strategy is all about. My Lord. Uh, worklessness as a result of innovation uh, have been coming around monotonously decade after decade since at least the days of Ned Ludd uh, and have been proved wrong uh, again and again. In fact, it's evident, it's evident that uh, innovation produces more and better jobs uh, over the long run. Is it possible that the current alarm is because, for the first time, artificial intelligence is affecting the jobs of doctors and lawyers and people like us uh, for the first time? Uh, and does my noble friend agree that the way to deal with this problem is to encourage people to retrain uh, as easily as possible to take advantage of new opportunities in the new economy. Well, my noble friend, as the House will be aware, is uh, an optimist. He is a, a rational optimist, if I give a, a little plug for his book. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he is quite right to mention that there's always been worries that uh, with each new wave of automation, uh, jobs will be lost. But what has happened, as my noble friend has said, is with each new wave of automation, we've seen jobs go, but we've seen boring repetitive jobs disappear and those jobs being replaced by machines. And it might be, as my noble friend points out, that some of the boring repetitive jobs that solicitors do, such as conveyancing, can be more easily done by machine. Lords, only 19% of the digital technology workforce is female, only 15% of computing graduates, only 17% of uh, a fintech founder. So in an age where automation is going to become dominant, isn't it time that the government abandoned relying on these sort of piecemeal scattered small-scale initiatives to increase diversity and launched a holistic, well-resourced, high-profile strategy along the lines of the anti-smoking campaign to challenge everything from unconscious bias, lack of training, lack of role models and to de-risk change generally? Yeah. Well, my, my my lords, I don't quite take the sort of almost semi-Stalinist approach that the noble baroness is putting forward. What I am saying is that uh, society will change as a result 
of these things, but the government must also recognise it is going to change, and that is what the industrial strategy is all about, and we will go along with that. Uh, my Lords, uh, it's all very well to be uh, optimistic and to even to be rationally optimistic, but uh, boring jobs, however boring they may be to, to the, those who have got better and more highly paid ones, also pay wages and keep people out of poverty and make sure that families are supported. These are serious issues, my Lords, and we're talking about 1.5 million people whose jobs are likely to be affected. I do hope the government got, has got more than just some forward thinking about where they might find educational support for these people. In, in a practical sense, though, my Lords, is it not possible that this sort of challenge, which is a big challenge for society as a whole, should be referred to those experts who are, are able to give us advice on where it should go? And would the Noble Lord Minister suggest that this be an issue at the centre of the work of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation just established? Uh, the point I was making is it's not just government that will be uh, leading on changes here. It will be the employers themselves. The, the, the employers, uh, the, the, themselves. If he just takes some of those boring jobs, such as uh, checking out at a supermarket, many of those are being replaced by uh, the self-checkout mechanism. That allows the employers, as is happening both in supermarkets, in warehousing and others, uh, to shift employees uh, to more interesting jobs. My Lords, I would like to make uh, a statement to update the House regarding next week and the Easter recess. Uh, following on from the vote on Friday in the House of Commons, we know that the end of our current extension of the Article 50 period, and therefore the default day on which we leave the EU, is Friday the 12th of April. Noble Lords will be aware that there is another European Council on Wednesday the 10th of April, when any further extension would need to be discussed and agreed. As this House did so ably last week, we may need again to react swiftly to consider any necessary legislation to ensure continuing legal certainty. My Lords, I can confirm that it is our intention to sit next week to ensure this House is able to respond to any emerging developments. I will come back later this week with more precise details, following conversations with the usual channels. But I thought it right to give the House the earliest possible notice. I am grateful to all noble lords and, of course, to the hard-working staff of this House for their understanding. My Lord, I, th I thank the, the Government Chief Whip for his statement and confirm that in the usual channels uh, Her Majesty's loyal opposition have indicated they will cooperate in any further discussions required, any legislation required, uh, uh, arising from the constitutional debate over Brexit. Um, with hopefully, with the proviso that there is genuine business arising from Brexit. That, uh, can I also ask uh, the Noble Lord, the Chief Whip, if he would maintain a very strict review? of what is required, so that, as he has mentioned himself, so that any potential disruption to members and, more importantly, staff are curtailed to a minimum. I understand exactly the uh, point that the Noble Lord is mate making. He and I sit in usual channels, together with uh, the Noble Lord Stoneham and uh, Noble Lord Hope, as well, as convener of the crossbenches, and I promise to keep all in touch on a regular basis. I suspect we'll be talking about this every day until this uh, Thursday uh, and then uh, indeed into next week. But um, for the time being, at any rate, I'm grateful for the support that he has given. Baroness Verma.
My Lords, I'm grateful for the opportunity to debate the EU Committee's report, Brexit, the Customs Challenge, this afternoon. As Chair of the EU External Affairs Subcommittee, I would like to extend my thanks to the members of the Committee for their important contribution to this report and to those members that are speaking here today, as well as to everyone who has provided written and oral evidence to the Committee. My Lords, I'd also like to thank the Committee's Secretariat, as it was constituted at the time, Jennifer Martin Cole Morgan, Julia Ewart and Lauren, Lauren Harvey for their assistance with the inquiry and the preparation of this report. My Lords, last year the EU External Affairs Subcommittee investigated the customs challenges in the event of a no deal and considered the government's, government's checkers proposal for the facilitated customs arrangement. I strongly regret that even though the committee published its report in September 2018, and despite the rule that commits the government to respond within two months of a report's publication, more than six months on, the committee is still awaiting a response. Not only is the response outstanding, but the government has also not proposed an alternative date for its, for its submission. So may I urge my noble friend, the Minister, whom I know will take this very, very seriously, to provide the official government response as soon as possible and ask him to confirm when he expects to provide that to the committee. My Lords, returning to the report, the first half covered what trade with the EU under WTO rules, commonly referred to as no deal, would look like. Despite the various votes in the Commons on avoiding no deal, a no deal Brexit will continue to be a risk unless and until a withdrawal agreement is passed. I would also like to remind the House that even if there is a transition period, if the two sides fail to agree on future, their future relationship, there still could be a delayed no deal Brexit. Our report warned that no deal would cause significant disruption and would be costly. Tariffs would apply and traders would be required to make customs declarations, with customs and regulatory checks also to be carried out. Overall, the HMRC has estimated that if customs declarations were introduced between the UK and the EU, there would be a cost to business running into billions each year. The completion of customs declarations would raise the cost of UK-EU trade by £13 billion a year. Half of that, that is £6.5 billion, would be shouldered by UK businesses. There will also be additional tariff costs. So, my Lords, HMRC has originally estimated an additional £5 billion per year in such costs. Though the UK Government's intention is to reduce 87% of tariffs by value in the event of no deal, should this lower, this should lower the amount somewhat. Having said this, UK businesses will still face tariffs on most exports to the EU by value. Although EU tariffs are generally low, some sectors, such as agriculture and automotive sectors, will be disproportionately affected. My Lords, I also want to emphasise the report's findings that no technology currently exists or will be available in the short term, which will dispense with the need for border checks. In all cases, some form of physical infrastructure will be required. This is of particular relevance to the Northern Ireland island border, where trade under WTO rules risks reintroducing a hard border. We also found that the introduction of new customs checks at the border under no deal will cause congestion and delays at roll-on, roll-off ports. The Port of Dover's ability to handle its trade volume, for example, depends on vehicles flowing through the port without stopping for customs controls. Even if the UK adopts a light-touch approach to these checks, roll-on, roll-off ports like Dover operate in a closed loop with their French counterparts in Calais or Dunkirk. Congestion on the French side will inevitably have a knock-on effect on the UK. This, my Lords, poses a significant challenge to just-in-time production and to agri-foods businesses. 
and could lead to the disruption of highly integrated supply chains. In turn, this could make UK businesses that are part of such supply chains less attractive. My Lord's mitigation options are limited, but it is critical that the UK Government has contingency arrangements in place to manage the negative impacts of a no deal. While no specific plans were in place at the time of publication of the report, I welcome the fact that the UK Government has now set out its contingency arrangements and provided guidance to businesses. Last month it was announced that in the event of a no deal, the UK would set temporary tariff rates that would be in place for up to 12 months from exit date, leading to the elimination of tariffs in 87% of imports by value, which compares with 80% before Brexit. Consequently, in practice, many importers will be exempt from paying customs duties. Yet this approach is not without risk. While there are some protections for the car industry and the agricultural sector, this unilateral reduction of tariffs, which under WTO rules applies to the EU and non-EU goods, could affect the competitiveness of UK production. So could my noble friend confirm when the government intends to publish an impact assessment of its tariff reduction plan? The elimination of 87% tariffs will go hand in hand with simplified customs procedures for traders importing goods from the EU into the UK. These transitional simplified procedures will be in place until at least July 2020. However, they will not eliminate the need for customs declarations altogether. They will simply reduce the amount of information that importers will have to provide during a defined period. So, my Lord, in summary, the costs the disruptions to the flow of goods and potentially the imposition of customs checks on the Northern Ireland island border in the case of a no deal all underline the need for the government to reach an agreement with the EU on the terms of our withdrawal and the future economic relationship. As regards the future economic relationship, a facilitated customs arrangement was put forward by the UK government in July last year. However, initial reaction from the EU has been sceptical at best, and that parliamentary deadlock over the terms of the UK's withdrawal has all but sidelined it. Since the proposal, the political declaration setting out the framework for the future relationship between the EU and the UK has been published, even though it's not yet been agreed. The section on customs calls for ambitious customs arrangements and is, in, and is worded in a way that could be used to support a large variety of negotiation outcomes. So, my Lords, I would like to ask my noble friend whether the facilitated customs arrangement is still the government's preferred option and what, if any, um, further thinking has taken place. My Lords, I know my colleagues who are also members of the committee will be raising a number of other questions, um, so I will, I will leave it at that. But I know going forward, my Lords, that many of the witnesses that came and gave evidence to us um, were very, very um, concerned that um, this un uncertainty was putting a large impact on not just businesses, but the supply chains. This motion be agreed to. Uh, my Lords, it was uh, a pleasure to serve on the subcommittee chaired so effectively by the noble Baroness Lady Verma, whom I thank. After all these months of uh, delay waiting for the Government to respond, I think we should consider where we are overall. The Government is hardly prepared for the customs arrangements which would be needed for any version of hard Brexit. The businesses and individuals who will have to operate in this environment have few clues as to what to expect. People in haulage or in the ports or administration have a sense of application to do their best, but nobody has been able to tell them which best they should do. And all the time the clocks are ticking, and complex supply chains are facing multiple dif difficulties without a real prospect of resolving them. The small cavalcade of lorries in Kent, the appointment of a ferry company with zero experience, zero ships and zero port agreements, the emergency plans for food and medical shortages and declaring the possible need to contain civil unrest with military deployments. All of these, I think, give us no cause for surprise that nobody is oozing confidence. 
the sunny uplands are a fantasy. Now, we Brits are a, a pragmatic and phlegmatic lot, but this has felt to me like launching Eddie the Eagle down a precipitous slope to jump against seasoned ath ath athletes. The best aspirations that we have are hoping he'll survive. My Lords, in the area of customs, I still do not know what our national vision is. How does our vision, if indeed there is one, link trade and customs provisions with economic performance and thus with other vital interests like security, defence and foreign policy, with justice and home affairs and with other key sectors? Customs and trade are an essential component of a successful economy and a successful economy holds the key to everything else. My Lords, in all markets between nations, including the WTO's often dysfunctional systems, we generally acknowledge that there must be rules so that everybody knows what the standards are within which they'll trade. If we are outside the EU's customs union, checks and intrusive procedures are still inevitable. How else would we deal with, say, the enduring compliance with preferential rules of origin? If we're to enjoy frictionless benefits of being inside, would we really think it right to do so without accepting that there are both rights and responsibilities? Customs arrangements underpin many of the things that the United Kingdom values very highly. Mitigating risks to public health and reducing environmental risk, food safety, the operation of financial regulation, the social market and decent workers' rights, None of these is a second-order issue for the quality of our social fabric. The subcommittee pulled me back during its course to thinking about our national strategy. The United Kingdom may no longer be a great power, but we can be a very good second-tier power and project ourselves internationally with effect. But to do so means that we need to demonstrate our trustworthiness around our ethics, and this must be under, underpinned by serious intellectual endeavour. We need credible forces, as the noble and gallant Lords, Lord Stirrup and Lord West, often remind your Lordship's house. And the foundation for it all is a sustainable economic capacity to deliver on these other interlocking attributes. For there is no nation on earth which can do these things on its own, not one. Let the House be candid about the economic world we inhabit today. Customs problems are not the only problems on the economic horizon, and we had better understand the cumulative effect of all of the problems that we may very well face. China's growth is now far weaker than before 2007, and in essence has only been driven by the injection of a $586 billion stimulus in 2009. And that is now impacting on much of the world's economic prospects. The United States recovery is evidently unstable. The poor are becoming poorer. Average wages last year retreated to the purchasing power of 1978. And the United States retreats have always had their effects in Europe and Japan. Europe is sluggish at best. Germany had zero growth in Q4 last year and barely sidestepped recession. Italy has negative growth, and the UK's growth was the weakest since 2012. There is a correction from the post-2007 re recovery regimes as a monetary tightening uh, it takes effect. The yield curve, curve has inverted, showing how anxious investors have become, always a warning of recession. The Eurozone crisis deepens. Private debt once again threatens the stability of many major economies. In the United States, private debt is higher than before the housing and mortgage crisis of 2007 and is now fueled by borrowing to speculate. Global debt is three times global GDP. It impacts corporations and individuals and in China just about everything and everybody. Growth is squeezed out by unsustainable and unpayable debt. Investment in wages and productivity continue in grim decline. In short, 
The predictive indices which have preceded past financial collapses are as visible today as the queues <coughs> were once outside Northern Rock. This is the economic climate into which we want to add the uncertainties of trading without proper customs arrangements. To reintroduce significant friction between us and our nearest huge markets, our political and trading and security partners, it's hard to believe that anybody would, sh would take such a course willingly. There may, of course, be no certain and smooth economic path open to us, but following the worst options could well be the straw which breaks the camel's back. Our country has been served very poorly, both by its government and by the official opposition. But it would surely prefer to meet its global and domestic strategic objectives in leadership and values, in intellectual capability, in security and defence, through a viable military, to meet its obligations in the world as it always has tried to do. While customs may appear to be just a piece of this jigsaw, it's about economic capability and therefore about the interpl interplay of the overall strategic fabric. My Lords, we can do without cutting unmendable holes in that fabric. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My Lords, I too would like to thank Baroness Verma for introducing this extremely useful and comprehensive report this afternoon. I would also like to thank the excellent Committee Secretariat for all their hard work and commitment, as well as for their dogged determination to seek out the facts in this constantly rather opaque process. My Lords, when I was rereading this report yesterday afternoon ahead of today's debate, as well as reading my own notes from the extremely informative visit we went on to the Port of Dover with the Committee last July, it was difficult not to feel both angry and depressed. The lack of progress since this report was published last September is shameful. Clearly, the debate taking place at the other end of the building this afternoon and the second set of indicative votes will have a direct impact on these issues, not least if the proposal on the customs union passes. And the fact that over 6 million people have now signed a petition calling for Article 50 to be revoked shows just how concerned people are by Brexit, and in particular by the prospect of a no-deal Brexit. As the Brexit debate has increasingly taken on the quality of a quasi-religious fundamentalist debate rather than an analysis of the facts, it is not surprising that people, and most especially people working in small and medium-sized businesses, are increasingly in a state of despair. My Lords, I would like to focus my remaining remarks this afternoon on the impact on businesses and the preparations for a no-deal Brexit. An estimated 145,000 businesses in the UK trade only with the EU, and there are an estimated up to an extra 100,000 more in the same situation. These are businesses which over the last decades, and certainly since the creation of the single market in 1992, have been accustomed to trading with our EU partners without barriers and without friction. Trading with Hamburg or Lyon has been, as, has been little different for these companies from selling their products from Newcastle to London. A no-deal Brexit would involve these companies acquiring expertise in customs procedures that they previously never had to have. It will involve them facing urgent training, delays and costs. Indeed, it, indeed as this report uh, makes clear, HMRC estimates that the cost to UK businesses of a no-deal Brexit would be £18 billion per year. Given the reports over the weekend that a number of Cabinet members are now actively calling for a no-deal Brexit, can the Minister say what measures are now being put in, put in place ahead of the new date of the 12th of April to help small and medium-sized businesses prepare for this situation? As this report sets out very clearly, roll-on, roll-off ports such as Dover would be particularly strongly impacted by a no-deal Brexit. The evidence we heard from the experts on the ground at the Port of Dover was extremely powerful. Currently in the eastern dock in Dover, lorries coming into the UK from the EU take an average two minutes to process. In the western dock, where non-EU lorries are processed, the average time for a lorry to be processed is currently one hour and 15 minutes. At the moment, only 1% of the traffic coming through Dover is non-EU. 
The port currently handles up to 10,000 trucks per day. It is a slick operation at the Port of Dover, which has developed over many decades, and it currently works like a well-oiled machine. There are 60 crossings per day, and any delay, as Baroness Verma has already said, in either Dover or Cali has a direct impact on the other port. A no-deal departure without any kind of transition arrangements in place could result, it is estimated, up to 17 or 20-mile queues of traffic in Kent. The knock-on impact to just-in-time deliveries, food pharmaceuticals and other industries are of genuine concern to both business and ordinary people. I should, my lords, declare an interest as being a resident of the very beautiful town of Broadstairs in the Isle of Thanet in Kent for the last five years. Broadstairs is just next to Ramsgate, where the now infamous Seaborne Freight, the ferry company with no ferries, is based. In recent years, Ramsgate has lost its channel ferry, cross, channel ferry crossing to Ostend and has also lost its international airport at Manston. Both of these have had a very negative impact on the local economy. The Isle of Thanet voted strongly to leave the EU. And it is one of the ironies, my lords, that like many other regions, such as the northeast of England, it is those areas that voted strongly to leave the EU that are now the areas most likely to be negatively, negatively impacted by a no-deal Brexit. One of the relatively few visible signs of contingency planning for a no-deal Brexit in Kent has been Operation Brock. The results so far have been mixed. The trial run, which was carried out at the abandoned Manston International Airport in Ramsgate in January this year, saw only 89 lorries out of the planned 150 lorries turning up. And given that Dover deals with up to 10,000 lorries a day, a rehearsal with only 89 lorries surely cannot be seen as anything other than tokenistic. The rollout last week of the new contraflow system under Operation Brock on the M20 has also caused concern locally, not least regarding access for emergency vehicles. Now, can the Minister, who I fully appreciate is one of the good guys and not um, in any way responsible for this mess, can he update us nonetheless on the contingency planning in the light of these recent events? The solution of, to this, my Lords, is currently in the hands of the, other bil- of the other end of the building as we speak. Remaining in the European Union, or at the very least remaining in the customs union and the single market, would solve this customs challenge. But as... I'm very grateful to the noble Baroness giving away, and I congratulate her and the other members of the committee on the report. She mentioned the uh, delays at uh, Dover currently. I noticed in the report they related to lorries from Turkey which is in a customs union. I met a number of customs uh, agents last week who told me that the paperwork involved in trade with Turkey with a customs union is worse than that involved with America or China. Does she and her party think that a customs union would solve these problems? I do indeed actually think they would solve it, not least because of the figure that I just gave, that 1% currently of all the traffic going through the Port of Dover is from non-EU member states. The rest, 99%, is going through. It's a slick operation that if there is an unexpected, if there is a a no-deal Brexit, this will change overnight, not necessarily because of the Dover side, but because of the Calais side. They will have to put up, they will have to introduce uh, restrictions. But... If I, just to conclude, my Lords, as this report makes very clear, the consequences, I firmly believe, of a no-deal Brexit would not merely be a bit bumpy, as some Brexiters have claimed, but they would, be a very real, they would have a very real and damaging impact on business and the lives of ordinary people for generations to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My Lords, um, can I also join with the congratulations from my noble friend, the Baroness, Verma for her excellent chairmanship of our committee, to uh, my colleagues for their contributions through a long and sometimes rather exhausting but rather sometimes rather exhilarating uh, such a series of meetings and also to our ever diligent staff. This is in fact our third report in this area of customs and trade and it's right that we did concentrate so much attention on this because whether or not you remain in a customs union, the whole issue of a customs union 
is central to the, to the binary choice which the government is, I'm afraid, not making at the moment, and which we have at some stage to make. And as Baroness Sutton has just made the point uh, in her remarks that uh, down the corridor the very important debate is taking place on the indicative votes and the most popular vote, the most popular motion so far in the, in the one we already had last week was the motion moved by uh, Right Honourable Ken Clark in favour of remaining in the customs union. I make a distinction between the point that was just made on intervention, remaining in the customs union as opposed to having a customs union with the customs union as Turkey has. That's a quite different and separate point. Ken Clark, as I understand it, was, was arguing for us remaining in the existing customs union. But that is the only way to maintain the entirely frictionless trade which for 45 years we have enjoyed yeah. with our colleagues in uh, countries on the European Union. It's the only way to have no border in Ireland and to keep together the United Kingdom. So I do fear that if, in fact, there was to be a border in Ireland, the problems of Scottish independence would also loom their uh, hoary head. And therefore, this is a way of keeping the England, United Kingdom as a whole together. Also, do not forget, as an economist, I'm extremely aware of it, the, the value of inward investment into this country, which exists simply because we are part of a huge market of 500 million people. Uh, we have, it's the, the inward investment is the jewel in the crown for the United, United Kingdom. We have far more inward investment than in Germany, twice as much as France, twice as much as Italy, and that is something which would undoubtedly be threatened, is already being threatened, if we remove ourselves from these arrangements. Also, politically, uh, it may well be that this is the sort of ultimate compromise we have to make, that we, I vote to remain, if, if remainers accept that we are going to leave the European Union, as we are targeted to do, maybe the Brexiteers could accept that we should, should have a soft Brexit, a sensible Brexit, which we could support. The 52-48 split of public opinion suggests that is poss one possible way forward, and I notice the Chief Whip, indeed, is going to be revealed as saying on television this evening uh, that that is something that the Prime Minister should have thought about when the results of the last general election became apparent. However, it has to be acknowledged, and I do acknowledge it, there are important arguments against remaining in the customs union. That we, would have, we would not be able to have our own independent trade policy, and of course we would be a rule taker, the vassal state, as it's called, or the servile state, I think is also another phrase that's used about it. But I would argue that these are overrated, dis, uh, overrated as disadvantages. The idea of a uh, no independent trade uh, policy is too, uh, uh, is too strong uh, uh, a point to make. In fact, having an independent trade policy from where we are now is a disadvantage. It's not because you are, you are, if you have an independent trade policy, you are selling entry to a market for 65 million people, whereas at the moment we're selling entry to a market of 500 million people. And that's a hugely easier sale than, the, the, than if we have our own independent trade deal. So I don't really think that is an, is an argument that, one can be, that can be sustained. The other argument is about the vassal state and how we would accept regulations decided in the European Union. That misunderstands, I think, the way that regulations are made inside the European Union. They are made in expert committees. On those ex -commit expert committees sit not only members of the European Union, members who, are, who have an uh, European countries who have an interest outside the European Union. Norway has been on 200 expert committees, even though it is not inside the customs union. Britain, with its size, could expect to be on expert committees of that kind, making the rules as we went along, even though ultimately we do not have any, have any say in the parliamentary committees. But as, you, as the House will fully appreciate, it's very rare for a parliamentary committee to get involved in the detail uh, of the, uh, what is put in front of them by, an ex by experts. They tend to accept it with occasional, occasional disagreement, but they, they tend to accept it. So the fact of the matter is uh, we would have a strong, a strong position inside the system of making regulations in Europe, even if we were not um, uh, uh, 
actually in the European Union, so long as we are inside the customs union. And the fact of the matter is, fundamentally, when you just discuss this question of sovereignty and, and our own right to rule ourselves, you have to make a trade-off uh, in business between access and sovereignty. If you want access, you have to give up a bit of sovereignty. If you have no access, you can keep all your sovereignty, but you have no access. That is the trade-off that you have to make, and we should recognise the reality of this. I think a bigger objection to remain inside the customs union, actually, uh, is that it, the U European Union may not agree to give us such a deal. It may be, they may argue it's too good a deal. For, for, for Britain because we were getting once again many of the advantages uh, of being inside the European Union without actually being a member of the European Union. And so I think that is something which uh, uh, would obviously we would have to explore in negotiations which I hope would take place uh, and they could for example say you have to remain, UK has to remain inside the single, single market uh, they, they, they may want to, to t still maintain control of our fisheries and agriculture. Once you go down that path I agree uh, you do raise the issue of, of, um, of um, uh, Brexit in name only. And at that point, you have to consider whether you want to have a clean break and a free trade area. And also, the fact of the matter is that the Cabinet is split over this uh, and uh, there is no sign of a resolution of that. But I do bring, finally, good news to the, to you, the uh, noble lords. There was agreement... Uh, on the BBC television before lunch today, on the Politics Today programme, between a hard Brexiteer, a uh, Remainer who is willing to be a Brexiteer, and a Remainer. The three people involved were Steve Baker, there's no one harder than that, Margot James, who's the industry spokesman, and Jonathan Powell, who was Tony Blair's chief of staff when he was Prime Minister. They agreed. That's the good news. The bad news is they agreed there would be bound to be a long extension after March, after May the 10th. So I'm afraid, whether we like it or not, we're in for further debates on this subject. My Lords, we've been very fortunate in this House to have had uh, reports, many reports now, about uh, Brexit and all its complications from uh, various of the subcommittees and indeed the main committee for the European Union. And we're, I'm sure, very grateful to all the members who worked hard on those reports, and they are of immense detail and immense complexity, but also immense conviction and persuasion. And uh, uh, that doesn't gainsay my feeling at the end of reading them all carefully, which I try to do if I can, that one comes to the inevitable conclusion that there's no substitute for actually staying in the European Union. I would like to congratulate Baroness Burma very much for leading this discussion and, and the report and the, uh, 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 the debate today, and the other three members of the committee who have spoken so far, particularly the concluding remarks of Baroness Sutty, which I thought were very relevant and need looking at again by honourable members. And I thank to uh, Lord Horham for his words, and particularly highlighting again the dangers and difficulties of actually producing the custom union concept in the way that... Um, well, my great friend Kenneth Clark was trying to explain properly on the radio this morning and he did a very good job but there are many minuses as, many, as well as many pros but just on the report itself I agree very strongly with all the remarks made by the three ensuing speakers with their worries and anxieties about uh, what this all means but I would particularly like to hope that the Minister will very kindly look in the conclusions at the end of the report on page 48 Particularly, I'd be concerned with section 191, uh, the UK government's estimate that 96% of UK goods would be able to pay the correct or no tariff up front and not go through the repayment mechanism has been challenged. We call on the government to clarify the methodology it used to arrive at the 96% figure. And then in 193, a totally different subject, uh, we welcome the government's stated intention to uphold current UK food standards and not lower them in free trade agreements with third countries. Once again, all that is a danger if we go ahead with this matter, but I, I beg to differ and conclude with a few remarks about the broader scene now facing us in what is yet another, not the final, but yet another emergency drastic week for this House and particularly for the House of Commons. In doing so, would he address the question of the difficulties, particularly at Holyhead, which I don't think was visited 
by the committee, nor were there witnesses from Holyhead um, before the committee, because of the lack of infrastructure for customs dealings between Ireland and the UK that are using the UK as a land bridge. I've agreed Lord, with Lord Wigley on these matters, and I particularly do so strongly, partly in the nervous realisation that I know much less about Holyhead than he does, and he's referred to this in a number of speeches, but I do agree with the broad outline of his comments, and I thank him for intervening today. But the background, once again, my Lords, is a tragedy and a matter of great sadness for this country, what is actually happening. And I have to conclude with these remarks. No Prime Minister with any wisdom and good sense would have, with what was an advisory-only referendum, even although David Cameron said he would abide by the decision, would have set out to totally ignore the wishes of almost half the voters in that referendum contest, almost 50% of those who voted. And even before the futile election of the 8th of June, but even after she had lost the mandate, actually lost it definitely, and was only able to carry on artificially via a dubious deal and huge bribe to the DUP, and then, even then, defiantly carried on and <coughs> chose not only to treat, uh, uh, to uh, ignore what I've referred to as the wafer-thin majority, in effect, in the, in the first referendum, but then also just to deal with the uh, uh, ERG, as the, not even the whole party, her own party, the Conservative Party, but the ERG, and they were the ones who came first in all her treaty, treating and all her discussions. And uh, the, re, this does again, my Lord, reveal the huge weaknesses we have in what is our now totally dilapidated political and parliamentary system, which can only be removed with drastic and radical reforms, not done, of course, by politicians, because they'll never agree, but by outside sensible experts and professorial characters of distinction, men and women. We have to get rid of this bandit politics <coughs> disease in Britain and come back to reassuring the public. And so in that context, I conclude with saying this, that in contrast to the, the miseries we're all experiencing with this Brexit process, and I mean, it's almost on the verge of being registered with the NHS as an official disease, Brexit uh, uh, and anti-Brexit is a, a part of it. But it was really at last, because of public opinion has changed, my Lords, reassuring to go on the march on the 23rd of March with over one million like-minded people from all over the country, including many former Leave voters who now grasp the looming disaster of Brexit. And the six million plus petition now underlines that there's been a huge change in public opinion in this matter. None of these reports are rendered less important than valuable, because of that, but that is the totally reality. Especially for our precious and increasingly internationally minded younger generation, and often at the other end of the age scale, the many thousands of UK citizens working and living elsewhere in the perhaps more relevant precious union for us than the other union that Mrs May refers to, the precious union of the European Union for the modern population of its modern member states. And I quote finally from Margaret Beckett's speech in the Commons debate on the 27th of March. I invite colleagues who resist a confirming vote to look starkly at what they say they are willing to terminate our membership of the EU, even if it may now be against the total wishes of the majority of the British people. My Lords, I did not have the um, privilege of being a member of this committee uh, that is responsible for this excellent report. Um, but it is a very interesting read. Um, it's a historical document, unfortunately. It would have been a, a lot more appropriate to have debated it some months ago. But what is striking is that in the six months since it was published, Although we've learnt a lot more about the problems associated with customs arrangements, <coughs> there haven't been any solutions. And what the uh, com committee ad advises is as relevant now as it was then. The report draws attention to the fact, as my noble friend has said, 
that there are 145,000 VAT registered businesses in the UK and a further 100,000 under the VAT threshold that currently trade abroad but exclusively with the EU. And that, of course, means that they uh, haven't had to deal with the paperwork and bureaucracy associated with international trade. In addition, the report draws attention to the huge costs of no deal, uh, estimated by HMRC at £18 billion uh, as a cost to businesses per year. It's a pity, my lords, that that figure wasn't on the side of a bus. Now, the report also emphasises that all the talk of technology to overcome border issues, uh, particularly in Northern Ireland, is basically, and these are my words, not theirs, so much hot air. There is no technological solution. And essentially, there are bound to be hold-ups at the border, however brief they are, they will have a huge impact. Now, since the publication of this report, we know quite a lot more about the details of that impact. And uh, starting with Dover, that has already been mentioned, the largest roll-on, roll-off port in the UK, um, you'll be familiar with the expectation that there will be long queues and the report acknowledges that there's no space for additional checks for examination, sh uh, for, or for examination sheds, uh, checkpoints, no space for additional barriers and no space for lorries to park as they wait. 17% of the UK's total trade in goods goes through Dover, and it's dependent on going through without stopping. Indeed, both Dover and Eurotunnel market themselves as a continuous, non-stop motorway to Europe. I had a meeting with the Road Haulage Association uh, some weeks ago, and their representative said to me, an Amazon lorry can have 8,000 individual shipments on it. It could lead to an individual, it would normally have an individual customs declaration for each of those 8,000 shipments. And each customs declaration has 36 different fields that has to be com completed. So the RHA estimate that would take 170 staff one day's work to, to process that lorry. The implications, my lords, on a grand scale are very serious indeed. Now the government sought to combat these problems in two ways. Uh, first of all by saying essentially we will ignore the need for border checks and everything will continue as it's always done. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. One is, you know, why are we leaving if we're going to continue exactly as we always have done? But secondly, as a representative of the freight industry said to me, the moment we don't apply the rules, we lose control of the border. And that leads to smuggling of various nature, various types of smuggling, of people, um, of drugs, of armaments, and so on, as well as ordinary everyday goods. It also leads to the inflow of substandard goods, my lords, which is a very serious issue for those trying to produce good quality goods in the UK. Um, the government's also attempted emergency preparations the M20 uh, being turned into a giant lorry park, the use of Manston Airport uh, for emergency long-term parking. And uh, we're all familiar with the fact that that hasn't gone very well. Um, the, um, the Seabourn Ferry Company with no ferries um, that has seemed to think it was providing the Department for Transport with pizzas rather than ferries. Um, now, the serious point of this, of course, is that it led the, the subsidy for ferries led 
to Eurotunnel um, seeking compensation for the fact that, that their product, their services were being um, over, overtaken by the fact that there was subsidy for ferry services. Um, and then last week we discovered that the contract the government signed with the ferry operators starts on the 29th of March, even though we haven't left the EU. Um, so tickets for these additional ferries, I'm told, are now being sold on the open market. I would say that might be a good time to get a ferry in the next week or so, but, but if you met a tall, bald man called Chris trying to flog a few tickets in the ferry terminal, I don't think it would be good value for money. Now, the serious point is, it's already cost £89 million for the ferries, £6.5 million for the extra weeks of ferry subsidy that the government is having to cover until we do leave the EU, £800,000 for the financial advice, £33 million compensation to Eurostar, plus £30 million for the design, build and operation and of Operation Brock on the M20. That, in my calculation, is almost £160 million and counting as cost of Brexit uh, from the DFT alone. My Lords, I've dealt with the costs to us, the taxpayer, but remember the cost to the uh, businesses of Britain as the important thing. The SMMT talked about the uh, production of a single fuel injector. To make it, there are 35 components from 15 countries. They require 39 border crossings between the UK and the EU. Now you see why the automotive industry is thinking of leaving this country fast, and now you see why the uh, producers in the supply chain are extremely concerned about their future. My Lords, the report is basically once again illustrating the best deal this country has by far is the deal that we have at the moment as members of the European Union. I was shocked when the noble Lady Baroness Barmer introduced her committee's report, Brexit, the Customs Challenge, which was published on the 11th of September 2018, that over six months later the government has not provided an official response. Could the noble Lord, the Minister, who I respect greatly, confirm why this is the case? And on the 17th of January 2017, the Prime Minister uh, famously put down her red lines which involved leaving the European Union single market and customs union. And then it progressed towards this facilitated customs arrangement. Throughout this Brexit process, the government's approach has been to try and continue to have our cake and eat it too. And Europe has made it very clear. There's a clear mandate from 27 countries to one individual, Michel Barnier, and they've stuck to their guns They've been intransigent, but they've been fair in that, in that they have not moved this. You cannot leave and expect to have the same terms as if you're a member. And HMRC have very clearly said that under no deal, the estimated annual cost to UK traders would be £18 billion. £18 billion. The government's estimate, that's by the way more than twice what we contribute to the EU now on an annual basis for membership of the EU, which I'd pay for the peace that we get thanks to being members of the European Union. And if we go for WTO rules, there's no, no question about it. It would be disruptive and costly, as Baroness Walmer said earlier on. Tariffs would apply, and although tariffs are low, we will see that generally they, will, they would actually go up in many, many areas. Um, and we've heard 145,000 VAT-registered UK businesses and potentially a further 100,000 under the VAT threshold currently trade exclusively, ex exclusively with the EU. So this is a huge number of businesses that we have, and we're reliant on these roll-on, roll-off ports. 
and the introduction of any new customs checks under a no deal would be highly disruptive. There is no question about it. Many companies we've heard in the debate rely on just-in-time. Many manufacturers send products backwards and forwards to and from the EU. And this is where I, I think this is quite frankly, uh, what word should I use, laughable? That Dominic Raab, when he was Secretary of State for Brexit, said, I didn't realize how important the Calais-Dover corridor was for frictionless trade. I mean, that is astonishing, to put it mildly. <coughs> And, of course, then we have the whole implications on the UK-Irish relations. And, and this has also been mentioned in the debate, the bridge that exists that the UK fulfills between Ireland and the EU. Ten hours door-to-door -door for a lorry leaving Dublin to Calais using this land bridge. If we have to go all the way around, it would be 40, 40 hours. And at the moment, there is no technology that would sort out the issues to keep the Irish border absolutely frictionless and open. And would the noble Lord the Minister confirm, if I'm not mistaken, HMRC admitted they do not have the technology or ability to cope with a no-deal Brexit situation, even if there were a two-year two implementation period. And here's the, the reality. The UK, EU is the largest trading partner for goods. In, in the last year, 49% of UK goods um, Exports to the EU accounted 49% of the total value of UK goods, and imports from the EU were worth 55% of the value of all UK good imports. 50% of our trade, whichever way you look at it. And the government is openly admitting that it has limited options to mitigate any no-deal scenario. And yet there are over 170 MPs who've signed a letter saying we must go for a no-deal situation. We must commit suicide as a country. That's what they're saying. And the ports, Dover and Calais, Cali, operate on a closed-loop system. Temp and the temporary tariffs that the government spoke of on the 13th of March, well, the reality of this is that tariffs would still apply to 13% of goods, and some of them would be really high in areas like beef, lamb, pork, poultry. Half of the UK's food is imported. 30% comes from the EU, and another 11% comes from the non-EU countries under the terms of trade negotiated by the EU. And Brexit is likely to result in an average tariff of food imports of 22%. Would the noble lord, the minister, agree with that? And all these trade agreements that we have with over 56 countries, these cannot be easily rolled over. We've seen now the government has been able to hardly be ready to roll over six of these free trade agreements. And then if you look at the political declaration, I mean, this is a wish list. This is wonderful. The parties envisage having a trading and a relationship. The economic partnership should ensure there are no tariffs. The parties will put in place ambitious customs relationships. The parties should ensure, ensure nothing is definite. This is not a legal document. This is a wish list full of platitudes. And Professor Catherine Barnard of Cambridge University and Professor Anand Ma and Menon said that WTO terms provide a basic floor for world trade. And here's the quote. However, the inadequacies of these arrangements provide incentives for countries to go further and seek preferential access to tackle issues inadequately co covered by WTO rules. That's why we have free trade agreements. That's why we're part of the European Union. The WTO option alone would have a significantly disruptive impact on trade between the UK and EU, and even on some UK trade with other parts of the world, falling back on WTO terms would be, to say the least, suboptimal politically, economically, and socially. And pre-Brexit, we know this, that we have low tariffs. But let's look at the average EU tariffs on agricultural products. Some of them are very high. So ag our agricultural sector is protected through being members of the EU. And the EU explains as custom unions has very clear principles. No customs duties and in internal borders between EU member states, common customs duties and imports from outside the EU, common rules of origin for products from outside the EU, a common definition of customs value. So the firms, UK businesses are saying, please, please, let us remain in the customs union. There is no EU plan. The EU say they're ready for no deal. Quite frankly, the Irish government is not. Angela Merkel is in Dublin or going to Dublin now. What happens with Brexit? They want to make sure that Irish border is properly protected. So, my lords, to conclude, Simon Jenkins just recently, today, said 
It is time for common sense on Brexit. A customs union must prevail. And he said May will be accused of repeating Robert Peel's split in 1846 over the Corn Laws. She should remember that Peel faced down his backwoodsmen and created a Conservative Party fit for the Victorian age. He was in the right, and the Conservative Party were also out of power for 28 years. And the Evening Standard, just now, a titanic crash looms for the government. And finally, the head of Siemens, the UK chief executive of the German manufacturer, is pleading, pleading with Britain, saying Brexit is turning Britain into a laughing stock. Siemens turns over £5 billion and employs 15,000 people here. And he said, please, let us stay in the customs union. But, my lords, I conclude the customs union itself is not enough. We actually need to stay in the single market as well. And the best, best option by far would actually be, if we had the guts, to revoke Article 50 and then to put it to the people and say, now that you know everything, are you sure you really want to damage our economy, our livelihoods, our citizens and our children's future? And I'm convinced the public would say, absolutely not. Now we know we would rather remain in the European Union. My Lords, I was not a member of the committee, but having read its report several times, it's not an easy read, I am impressed. First, as many speakers have pointed out, it provides convincing evidence once again of what would be the disastrous consequences of no deal Brexit, and I trust the Commons will rule that option out conclusively. But the report should be, or should have been rather, um, compulsory reading for those who plan to vote for the Clark Amendment, a form, a form of customs union, presumably on the lines of the facilitated customs arrangement analysed in this report. Because this, the government claims, would enable the UK to control its own tariffs for trade with the rest of the world. It's the option which seems to be the present favourite to win the Commons Beauty Contest to be voted on today. But, my Lords, this option has many serious snags. As pointed out in Chapter 5 of the report, the present EU customs union requires a common commercial policy, in effect a single market. To allow for the freedom to make separate trade agreements with the rest of the world, the customs union proposed by the government, and one must assume by the Clark Amendment, seeks to avoid this. But the committee tells us for this kind of customs unions to work and enjoy a frictionless border with the EU as a non-member, there would still have to be convergence of regulations. We would, they were told, become a regulatory satellite of the EU. Would this be acceptable to most Brexiteers or to those who support a, frex, a, a soft Brexit? Instead of winning back control, we would be... A, we would, we are told, um, uh, we, we would be uh, s subject to a satellite. We would control taking satellite. The uh, facilitated customs arrangement would also be immensely complex, involving different tariffs for EU and non-EU countries, including possible payments and repayments collected or paid on behalf of other countries. Compliance would, as many other speakers again have pointed out, be a very hard and costly task for small to medium enterprises. A customs union without being a member would also require very complex negotiations, hardly likely to be welcomed by the 27 after their recent experience of endless delays and changes of tax by a succession of incompetent Brexit negotiators. But what all Brexit advocates, even soft Brexit advocates, ignore is the most important development of all, which the noble Lord Lord Dykes referred to. There is strong evidence that the people's will has changed since the referendum and is no longer the people's will today. The evidence is not just that march by over a million or the petition to revoke Article 50 signed by some six million, Professor Curtis, much invoked by government and Brexiteers, long maintained that opinion has not shifted. 
he has now changed his view and said it has shifted. And a vote today, according to his findings, would be 54 to 46 in favour of Remain. According to YouGov, it would be some 56 to 44. That shift should not come as a surprise, and there's every reason to suppose it will grow. Nearly all Brexit news is bad, and overseas on overseas investment from a growing number of manufacturing and service companies who are planning to leave the UK, a likely crippling shortage of nurses and other professionals in the NHS caused by the accidents of EU citizens, and so on. Now, true, there are lots of leavers crying, we want out and why haven't we left yet? No evidence will change their minds. However, there must be many of the 52% who voted leave who care about the future of their jobs and the prospects of their children and who will not be impervious to what manufacturer, manufacturers like those in the motor car industry and Airbus tell us. There was an extremely extensive poll on the eve of the referendum of intending leavers about the reasons why they intended to vote out. Many gave different reasons, but they all agreed that leave would have no downside, nothing but a prospect of life in sunny uplands. Now it is becoming plain what Brexit means. Any form of Brexit, however soft, will make us poorer, especially the most vulnerable. My Lord, it would be a strange twist to the present confusion if we left because MPs believed they were obeying the people's... Oh, sorry, yes. I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt the noble lord because I very, very agree very strongly with his words. But in the context of what he was saying two sentences ago, could he estimate what he thought would, was the number of people accompanying Nigel Farage on his long trip from Sunderland? <laughs> well, it wasn't exactly over a million. I can't give you more details. But it, it would be an extraordinary travesty of justice uh, if, in fact, people who voted uh, to leave because they thought that was what public opinion wanted and now find that most, in fact, want to remain. And the only way to make sure this travesty of justice won't happen and, indeed, to solve the present impasse amongst government and MPs is to give the final decision to the people. I much admire the MPs who have spoken out for the, this cause in defiance of party pressures, Conservative MPs who cannot support a party, 170 of whose public representatives have recently signed a letter and seem quite happy to tolerate the prospect of a no-deal Brexit. What an extraordinary retreat from sanity by a once great party. And no wonder people abroad feel we've gone mad. Similarly, I admire the Labour MPs who decided they couldn't support a party whose aims would be to make its leader Prime Minister a role for which they believe he's totally unsuited. But I want to mention one other MP, finally, one in particular, one of Labour's strong leaders in the battle against Brexit and the cause of a new people's vote. It is my old opponent in Lincoln, who nowadays has my, nowadays has my admiration and respect, Dame Margaret Beckett. More power to her output. Uh, a small, um, typically unpolemical point in, in the gap. Uh, this uh, admirable report says at paragraph 17 that the UK government has repeatedly ruled out entering into a customs union with the EU on the grounds that this would tie the UK to the EU's common commercial policy. I think that statement is true, but what the government say, as reported in that statement, is not true. Uh, customs union and common commercial policy are completely separate in the treaty, they're legally distinct, and the example of Turkey shows that you can have a customs union with the EU without uh, uh, having the EU running your trade policy. The, the Turks are outside uh, the common commercial policy. Customs union means no tariffs between you and your partners and common tariffs against the rest of the world doesn't mean that uh, the Commission would be negotiating for us uh, uh, with the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that we would benefit from existing EU free trade agreements. 
it doesn't mean that any new EU trade agreements would apply to us. Now, we know all that. Why am I saying it? Because next door, uh, in the other place, uh, the issue of customs union is, as, as Noble Lord, Lord Trevan said, being talked about right now. It seems to me a... I mean, don't get me wrong. I still believe that Brexit plus customs union is still a complete disaster, uh, a dreadful thing to do. But it would be wrong to argue against customs union on the grounds that it ties you to the EU's trade policy, because it absolutely doesn't, even though the government have frequently said that it does. Uh, you would be entirely free in the areas of services, intellectual property, public procurement, regulatory barriers, data. The only area where you, you would be bound by the EU's decisions would be on the level of tariffs in goods, a relatively small proportion of, of world trade now. But I repeat, don't get me wrong, it's still a very, very, in my view, a very dangerous way to go. I do think, though, that uh, when the House of Commons considers uh, the Customs Union Amendment written into the trade bill, it, it would be good if the government, when it took a view on that, would take a view on the merits of customs union. We said nothing in our amendment, this time on the trade bill or last time on the withdrawal bill, about losing our ability to do trade deals around the world. We did, said nothing about acceding to the common commercial policy, which is a completely separate question. And the question of customs union should be addressed solely on its merits. Well, I'm very grateful to the noble lord for uh, not being polemical, but for also being very precise and helping us with our arguments. It also gives me a chance to share with the House um, my favourite moment of the march uh, last Saturday, uh, more than a million strong. As far as I could see, if you certainly counted the people who weren't able to actually get onto the march, were wandering around making London their home for the day. There are many, many placards, many of them very witty and uh, erudite, some of them rather clever, some of them a bit rude, certainly not to be repeated in, in polite company. My favourite, because I'm sure we all have a favourite, was one that I saw just, to, just about halfway around and, of course, stupidly managed to drop my camera and I couldn't pick it up in time to take a picture of it in order to give it to the noble Lord Kerr. But it said, very simply, in very bold uh, Times uh, font, I concur with John Kerr. <laughs> he was holding it. <laughs> I hear calls that it was him, so he himself it wasn't. Uh, I actually have no idea what it means, but, but it, uh, it sort of says quite a lot about the debate, and uh, I thought it was rather good. My Lords, this has uh, been a useful and helpful debate uh, on a report that was uh, probably had its peak impact a few months ago, but is nevertheless, I think, is important, and I want to explain why as we go through it. Uh, what, what we've had today is, is a chance to, to be reminded of what was in that report, uh, to get speeches from four of the committee members, uh, which I think helps to explain why it was such a, a good report, because they all uh, said that it was a well-run well and well-organised report with uh, a, a series of sessions with, with good evidence and uh, out of which a, a fine report crafted by the staff but signed on by the committee were done. But we've also attracted, which doesn't always happen in these debates on committee reports, uh, uh, an equal number of external members who wanted to contribute to the debate, and that's always to the good. Our committee system is one of the strengths of, of your Lordship's House. It is a, a source of tremendous uh, information, evidence, and uh, the supply of, of good and uh, and important things that we need to consider and it, was, it is therefore very very sad that the government has not uh, honoured it with a response uh, I think it's a, dis, it's a disrespect to the committee itself, it's a disrespect to the house I think it's also a disrespect to the country and I hope that uh, the overlord oh the minister when he comes to respond will be able to have a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation of why we've been let down in this way I do think that uh, unless the government is prepared to support the committee's stress system by providing timeless responses to its uh, work, we will lose the quality of work that we've currently got. My Lords, um, the debates today have, have ranged far and wide, I think because I think we all share a, a worry about how you, report, how you respond to a report which was of its time but is perhaps no, not, not quite as uh, um, on, the, on the debate as we currently have it and with events happening only a few yards away 
in another place, it's obviously um, difficult to be uh, precise and, and to draw conclusions from this report in relation to uh, what we might hear later on. Indeed, we'll be already pinging out on the news channels as we speak. But I think it's important that we don't forget that the evidence that was presented to the committee and, the, and those who uh, wrote in and submitted as well as turned up provided a very interesting narrative about uh, the situation that, that is described in the report, and we would be foolish if we didn't uh, take, our, uh, take lessons from that, which we can take forward in any scenario that may go forward. Uh, I think there has been a tendency in some of the speeches to try and uh, use the committee report for a, a, a wider debate, but I think I will try and restrict my comments mainly to the report itself and hope that the Noble Lord the Minister will respond in kind when he comes to reply to the debate as a whole. So on the first section, which was about what happens uh, if the UK fails to secure a deal with the EU, still relevant, and therefore uh, uh, quite important to understand what the committee was saying in that. I think it's interesting to get government responses to the, re the uh, recommendation in paragraph 86, um, the administrative burdens that businesses involved in trade will, will have, whether the government has made any assessment of that, and if so, where we might find a consideration of that. There will be extra work, considerable extra work, for anybody involved in trade, whether or not it's on WTO terms, and these, would, these burdens need to be assessed. Um, in paragraph 88, there is a, a familiar a point for the Noble Lord Minister, who I think has had to answer this question on a number of occasions. I'm sure he's well briefed on this occasion. 145,000 VAT-registered UK businesses trading only with the EU and 100,000 businesses under the VAT threshold who may be trading. We don't know that. How many have actually now registered in this magical form, which will give them all the answers to what they want? I think the last number was just 52,000. I'm sure it's gone up. I'm sure he'll be able to update us. I think this is important. Um, in paragraph 90, um, the, the, the report re records that HRMC, HMRC have estimated that the cost to UK businesses under a new deal would be about £18 billion pounds per year. I'd be grateful uh, if, if the Noble Lord could respond to the point made in the report that HMRC perhaps could provide an itemised breakdown of those figures. And the committee were keen to see that and weren't able to get it. And I think it would be helpful that, that we, we had that read into the record. And if it isn't possible to provide it today, perhaps you could write to those who have spoken in this debate. In, in paragraph 92, um, there is a question about technological solutions, which comes up time, a number of times in the, uh, in the, uh, in the report. And, it, and in this case, in reference to Northern Ireland border, where trade under any sort of rules uh, requires reintroduction or might imply the reintroduction of a hard border. Um, the point, I think, at the time the committee was meeting was that the technological solutions were being prepared. Could the Noble Lord Minister update us about that? Is that still the government's uh, assertion that if, the, if in the event we are in a no-deal situation, then there is a technological solution which would be available to help with that problem or not? And uh, on paragraph 93, uh, in relation to points made by a number of, of members of the committee, but particularly the chair, uh, the, the impact of, of checks at ports, particularly the, the ports of Port of Dover, which we all understand, uh, uh, clearly there's been further work on that, including uh, various um, trial runs. Again, it would be helpful if the Neville or the Minister could, could support that. But I think the main issue on this part of the report was, was, was a bit difficult for the committee to get into because they did not know what the tariff regime would be. And indeed, we many of us in this House have been asking for a number of weeks and months for uh, the detail. That's now available and has been published. And indeed, I can't remember the total number of pages, but it's very large. But there are 4,000 4, lines of tariff information which has to be consult have to be read and understood if one's to get to the basis. Luckily, most of them are zero, so that's a relatively straightforward issue. But the reason they're zero is sometimes elusive and not difficult to go, and I'm sure the Noble Lord Minister will respond to, want to respond to that. Uh, I think the best comment I've had on that has been from the uh, organization, the UK uh, the Trade Policy Observatory at Sussex University, which raised, has done a number of, of, of work, a piece of work on the customs uh, impacts that are likely to arise from deal or no deal. And their conclusion on the tariffs, as far as it goes, and, and, and I'm not going to quote it, but just, just in general terms, are that, that even these tariff arra uh, arrangements, which have broadly been welcomed, I think, by most, most commentators, will, will result in a negative impact on, uh, on the UK economy. And they, although there are some positives from having a, a more liberal policy with regards to tariffs, <coughs> it's still the case that there will be additional costs 
competitive pressures on firms and there will be difficulties. Um, the results also high, highlight the fact that, it, that the policy uh, it means that, that, it, that with zero as the main tariff line, even though there are exceptions in certain goods which are protected, the scope for using those tariff lines for any future negotiation in any trade are very, very limited. <clears throat> One does wonder why we go on and on about the question about how goods are going to be so important, uh, or tariffs and, uh, in relation to goods are going to be so important in any future negotiations, when it's quite clear that, that when all tariffs are at zero or close to it, you have no room for negotiation as far as goods are concerned. And as always has been the case in the UK's economy, the issue is about non tariff regulations in services about which the government again still is very quiet. No doubt this is an, an agenda item that might be re recommended to the chair of the committee to uh, something that they might want to look at as their next uh, workload. But uh, dealing with that uh, I think I can move on to mitigations. I think there's only one issue I wanted to ask the Noble Lord the Minister to respond on uh, which was to um, in, in paragraph 120 is to make sure that he, there, there is some sense about what the government plan will be about ensuring fair and equal treatment of all imported goods coming in on, on most fervent nation terms. Uh, if he is able to respond on that, that would be helpful. And on the third and final part of the issue of the report, the broader discussion about the facilities customs arrangement, uh, two points I think need to look down to it. The, 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 the response by ministers to the committee or when they were giving evidence to the committee and the information from the government was largely predicated on the role that was to be played by authorised economic operators. And that scheme is not yet fully, I think, developed. So I'd be grateful if the Noble Lord the Minister could give us a bit more update on where that's got to and in particular whether there's going to be any chance uh, that special arrangements will be made for SMEs who it is uh, argued in the report will have difficulty accessing that. Clearly, if there is going to be successful in the scheme, and it may well be the way forward, AEO schemes will need a lot more support from government. Where is that going to come from? And secondly, in paragraph 189, the very important question about the rules of origin, which get, doesn't get as much discussion as it perhaps does need, I think, in the customs debate, uh, there is in that recommendation in paragraph 189 a suggestion that the government should elaborate on the intended definitions for sufficient transformation of intermediate goods Again, I hope the Lord, Lord Minister could help us on that. My Lords, um, it's quite clear from the debate today that, at least for those who participated, that the majority view in this debate, possibly in the House, is that we should be staying in the EU, uh, and uh, I, th I don't dissemble from that. This is not an option that this House is going to be able to exercise much um, influence on, given that the responsibility must lie with the uh, elected House. But, for instance, the points made by uh, Lord Horam and others uh, that, that even if we are leaving the, the, the EU, we should stay in a, in a customs union because of the need for, to maintain frictionless trade, because of the, the way it solves the Irish problem, because of rules of origin difficulties, and because, as he put it, we do actually benefit from the ability to secure deals with other, other nations based on the fact that of a, of, a, of a market of over 500 million people compared to that of our own. These are all crucial points for that. And I, and I end with one thought, and I wonder whether the Lord the Minister could be invited to respond to. As was just said, I think, by the Noble Lord Dykes and others, the, the, the ambitions of the government in its deal is to have a free trade agreement with the EU, which is sans parallel. It is the best deal and the, and the most in, in, inclusive and intensive deal, <coughs> so much so that it would appear in many ways that it would, in fact, be able to be judged by the WTO to be a customs union. If that's the case, why is it not possible for the government simply to accept that that is where we need to be on that? A customs union and the ability to be part of the single market is what industry wants, is what the trade unions have, have argued for. And just about everyone in the country, I think, now has got the case very clearly in their mind that that's what we want. There is really little, very little point in trying to argue whether or not there's a difference between a fully-fledged FTO plus an engagement with the single market or staying in the EU. But if we are moving out, surely that must be the way forward. Perhaps the Noble Lord the Minister could respond. My Lord, uh, um, can I uh, begin, hopefully, with, uh, with one or two points on which we can all agree? Uh, certainly, the Noble Lord, Lord Stevenson uh, mentioned about uh, the work of the uh, committees in your Lordship's House and uh, how outstanding their work is and how uh, thorough uh, 
uh, they are. Now, nowhere more is that the case than in the European Union Committee and its six subcommittees and, of course, the External Affairs Committee, whose report uh, we're discussing here today, chaired by uh, Baroness Verma. They do do an incredible uh, uh, amount of, uh, uh, of work. And uh, I would really commend uh, people who uh, haven't had an opportunity to perhaps study the full report is to look at Appendix 2 and to actually go through the list of people who actually gave oral evidence uh, and the quality and range of the people for whom they took evidence. And I know that that has contributed significantly to the strength uh, of the report, uh, if not also in the difficulty uh, of the government in being able to respond, a, a theme to which I will uh, uh, return uh, very uh, shortly. But I do think that uh, it has been good to have uh, this debate, and in fact it's been a very, uh, um, although narrowly focused, it's, it's really in a very systematic way managed to touch on all of the key points which needed to be raised. Uh, Baroness Verma began uh, the the uh, uh, debate uh, with a, 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 an excellent speech in, in which she uh, set out the terms and particularly focused on uh, tariff policy. Lord Horham uh, uh, spoke about the challenges uh, of uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, Baroness Sooty about the implications and the risks of no deal. Lord Treesman of the impact on business. Lord Dykes about standards. Baroness Randerson about technology at the, the border. Lord Billamoria about uh, the importance of supply chains. Uh, Lord Kerr about the common customs uh, uh, policy. And Lord Stevenson about the facilitated customs uh, arrangement. Uh, what I will do in terms of structuring my response to such a debate uh, is to perhaps, uh, rather than uh, using the the set of response which I uh, uh, have, uh, basically zero in on a, a short update as to where uh, uh, Her Majesty's Government is at the present uh, time in terms of a statement of policy, uh, and, and then simply respond to as many of the uh, responses as to the questions which have been made as possible. Um, but I also give notice now that I will, uh, I think that it would be good uh, for the committee uh, and also for the House to have a written response. Uh, to uh, such a, a high quality debate uh, and uh, uh, I will ensure that that uh, happens in a very uh, timely uh, way. Uh, I'd like to start by stating that the government always seeks to provide the committee with the latest and most comprehensive information as possible. The ongoing negotiations with the EU and the recent developments within Parliament can sometimes make providing uh, the most up-to-date uh, information difficult. Uh, my colleagues in the Department for Exiting the uh, European Union regret the lengthy delay in responding to this report, uh, but I can assure noble lords that a response uh, will be sent to the committee as quickly as possible. Uh, before discussing uh, the detail of this report, I would like to touch briefly on the broader context for this debate. The government's clear preference is to leave the EU with a deal, and we remain committed to doing so. The government was disappointed at the result of last week's vote on the withdrawal agreement. Nevertheless, the government's priority is to press the case for the orderly Brexit uh, that delivers on the result of the referendum. In addition, uh, whilst a no-deal scenario mentioned several times in the report is not the government's preferred outcome, pre preparations are continuing for such an outcome. Indeed, in relation to the report, leaving the EU without a negotiated deal would result in customs controls at the UK borders and tariffs on our exports to the EU. And this is why the government has been focused on putting a deal in place. Uh, turning to the, uh, to, to the questions which were uh, raised, first of all, just a little bit of further uh, explanation on the delay uh, in responding. Of course, the uh, report, uh, as been said, uh, was uh, published uh, uh, in September. It, uh, they were therefore, in the normal routine, uh, fall due for response sometime in December. Uh, 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 your Lordships will recall that uh, in December was a pretty fast-moving time uh, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, discussions which were uh, uh, taking place. Uh, and it wasn't possible to get clearance for uh, the release of the response at that time between the different uh, departments. Uh, we then thought that might ease up in uh, January, I'm afraid it hasn't, and it's a, it's a, a story of that nature. But uh, I, I would really uh, urge, this is not normal, I've responded uh, in your Lordship's House to a, 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 a number of debates from uh, committees, this is not uh, normal government practice. We do take this very seriously, it is merely a reflection 
uh, of the timing, I, and I will convey again my apologies to, uh, particularly to Baroness Verma, uh, uh, Lord Horne and Treesman, uh, and Baroness Sooty, who, who are members of the committee, and to all members of the committee uh, for that. Uh, Baroness Verma asked about uh, the impact assessment on uh, tariffs. The impact uh, is summarised in the Tax Information and Impact Note published alongside the temporary tariff. Tariffs are a tax and therefore uh, a um, taxation, information and imp uh, taxation Information and Impact Note is, we believe, the most appropriate uh, document uh, for uh, communicating uh, tax changes. Baroness Sooty and others uh, asked about the implications of uh, roll-on, roll-off uh, ports, and, and <coughs> although it was mentioned in the context of Dover, and I know that the committee visited Dover, uh, I take on board the point raised by Lord Wrigley in an in intervention about the importance of Holyhead. Uh, the government recognises roll-on, roll-off uh, locations depend on the fast flow of traffic, uh, which could be significantly affected if customs controls and regulatory checks were reintroduced for uh, inter-EU trade. Maintaining frictionless trade is therefore a priority uh, for the government. Uh, in a no-deal scenario, the government has been clear that it will prioritise trade flow at the border, but not at the expense of security. HMRC has continued to carry out targeted checks on goods entering into the country as we do now. In the eventuality of a no-deal scenario, the government's uh, day one roll-on, roll-off model aims to move customs formalities away from the border, easing the pressure at the, reports at, at the ports at, uh, and at Eurotunnel and helping to avoid uh, delays. Uh, we have published roll-on, roll-off bridging guidance, last updated in March, uh, to support businesses to understand fully how to comply with the new model and we will be continuing to update business uh, uh, on these uh, matters. Baroness Verma uh, asked about uh, the facilitated customs agreement. Is it still the preferred uh, model uh, outcome? Uh, the political declaration uh, on the framework for the future relationship uh, between the UK uh, agreed with the EU set out a plan uh, for a free trade area for goods, including no tariffs or quotas, with ambitious customs arrangement. The government recognises uh, the need to discuss the future customs model uh, in detail with the EU in the next phase uh, of discussions. Uh, uh, in line with the commitments set out in the political declaration, the government is aware uh, there is currently a live debate uh, in-house, of course, uh, over the future relationship, and we will have... Uh, uh, we will uh, contribute to this uh, debate uh, which is ongoing. Uh, Baroness Verma and Baroness Randerson uh, uh, talked about uh, the uh, uh, need for technology and questioned whether the technology was currently available. The government will continue to consider the potential application of technological uh, solutions to streamline the customs processes. Uh, there are a range of technologies that could help facilitate trade over the Northern Ireland, Ireland border, f for example, by streamlining any requirements that may emerge from trades after the UK leaves the EU. Hmm. On the Irish border, as one living near it, I realise there are two sides to the border. Sometimes I get the impression in London that people don't realise there are two sides to the Irish border. There's the United Kingdom side, and can the Minister confirm that Her Majesty's Government have de decided that there will not be any infrastructure on the United Kingdom side of the Irish border? But then on the Irish side, the matter is one for the European Union Commission. Has the European Union Commission yet confirmed that it will have no infrastructure on the Irish side of the border? Well, the, the, the noble lord will be aware that uh, this is a fast-moving situation. There have been some statements uh, by the Taoiseach uh, in relation to, to the Republic of Ireland. Uh, what the Good Friday Agreement and the Belfast Agreement states, of course, is that there will be no hard border uh, you're on the island of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, there are uh, some uh, differences, which I know is not the question that the noble lord was asking. He was asking about the differences, uh, particularly on relation to tariffs, uh, which, uh, how they might be uh, collected. 
between uh, uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the rest of the United uh, Kingdom. We've made some statements on that. Perhaps if I could cover that point, uh, given it's such a delicate matter uh, in my written response uh, at the end of this debate. But the government uh, continues to be committed to developing alternative relations to replace the backstop, and we have agreed specific negotiating track with the EU, which forms part of the next phase of negotiations. Um, <clears throat> Lord Dykes uh, um, uh, asked uh, about uh, the European uh, about the government's estimate that 96% of UK goods will be able to pay the correct tariff up front, uh, whether it's been challenged. Uh, the government published further detail on this calculation on the 21st of December 2018 in response to the UK Statistical Authority's request for more detail. The publication set out that up to 96% of UK goods trade would be likely to be able to pay the correct uh, or no tariff up front under the FCA, and these goods would be either trade, imports, exports with the EU or exports uh, to non-EU countries. Uh, Lord Stevenson asked about, uh, we, we uh, discussed on a previous occasion, uh, I think in one of the regulations uh, uh, that, that came up on the EORI re regulations, uh, registrations, at that point it was 52,000. I can report uh, that uh, as of the weekend in the 22nd of March, it had risen to 67,000. Uh, so we are uh, uh, making uh, some progress. Uh, my Lords, this has been uh, uh, a, uh, an, an excellent debate and hopefully responding to a, a very thorough uh, report uh, with some 31 uh, recommendations. Uh, can I again reiterate to the committee and to those members uh, who have been party to its production that uh, our delay in response uh, is through hopefully uh, what are understandable challenges uh, at the present time, uh, but in no way takes away from how valued uh, this is. And in final uh, comment, could I just respond uh, briefly to two comments which uh, uh, Lord Treesman and uh, Baroness Suti uh, made? And uh, Baroness Suti, I think, referred uh, to the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the debate uh, which we were having on this uh, topic at this uh, time was almost a, a kind of fundamentalist uh, uh, debate which was happening with no ground being given uh, and uh, somehow uh, an absence of uh, facts. And uh, Lord Treesman, I think, was fair-minded in recognising that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, none of us should be able to say that we've uh, distinguished ourselves uh, in, that, uh, in this uh, circumstance and in this very difficult situation in which the nation uh, finds uh, itself. Uh, but uh, I do, I sure, speak for the whole House in saying that uh, uh, um, your past performance is no, doesn't necessarily need to guarantee what future performance uh, is going to be. In fact, I remember that my uh, father often used to say to me as I left the house, he used to say, remember, this is the first day of the rest of your life. Uh, uh, treat it as such. And I think this is an opportunity for us to look forward, to do something different. I think that uh, this debate on Brexit has descended into a kind of bitter courtroom divorce battle in which uh, the parents' hatred for each other has meant that they've actually forgotten their shared love and responsibility for their children. Uh, but uh, we do hope uh, that now is the time uh, to seek selfless uh, solutions that will put the well-being of all the people of this great country uh, at the centre of its deliberations. We hope that that starts today and continues tomorrow. I thank the Noble Baroness for her debate. My Lords, um, I'm extremely grateful to my noble friend, the Minister, for his, as usual, very polite and very considered responses. I think um, the debate has been an excellent one to just highlight, once again, the complexities that are facing us as a nation, um, and that it is, as the, my noble friend, the Minister, said, it is time for us to reflect in a much more considered manner on how we approach this debate. Um, my, my own um, thoughts very quickly are that um, from my, from, um, my members, com colleagues on the committee, um, Lord Treesman, Baron Suti and Lord Horan, they all said, and it's, it is absolutely essential, that we do look at customs and trade. Um, they are essential to our economy. Um, you know, they are critical that they are protected properly, especially our small and medium-sized businesses, especially the supply chains. And as Lord Horan said... Inward investment is the jewel in the crown for the UK, and that's why it is so, so critical 
that every single member who has spoken today has spoken of the importance of making sure that whatever facilities we have, and we do not have the technology as, as we stand today, and that we are marching faster and faster going to leave Europe without all of the processes in place and no, none of the protections that small and medium-sized businesses are asking for. And I do urge my noble friend, the Minister, to take back to, to, his, to his department and, and to his colleagues across government that if this debate is to become one which is going to bring people together, because we are an incredibly deni divided nation as we currently stand, it has got to take the tone of looking at what committees' reports are saying they are considered, they take time, evidence is given, and as my noble friend and the Minister said, the evidence sessions he saw and the long recommendations that he has witnessed means that you know, we, we do ask government to really, really look long and hard and then, then respond in a timely manner. I know my noble friend the Minister would have read our report page to page, word for word. I would hope that he recommends it to colleagues across government because it will be helpful to them. But on that note, my Lords, I, I beg to move. Lords, the question is that this motion be agreed to. As many as have an opinion will say content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Lord Howell of Guildford. Uh, my Lords, my Lords, I beg to move the motion standing in my name on the order paper. <coughs> my Lords, um, in this debate we're dealing with a short report. More of them might be said a list of observations and questions on the deeply troubling issue of the continuing conflict in Yemen and its hideous humanitarian consequences. Uh, these are on a scale unmatched in modern times, with 60,000 civilians or more killed directly by the fighting over the four years or so, and, a thousand, and thousands more dying of starvation and rampant cholera and other diseases. In the words of the uh, United Na various United Nations agencies, it is, quotes, the, worst, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Uh, with up to 22 million people facing severe food and water shortage, vast displacement of people, and many constant tragedies. Uh, my Lords, the much deeper issues of British and indeed Western involvement in the whole ongoing turmoil of the Middle East region are something which your committee addressed in an earlier report, as indeed we addressed the question of whether there was still an area in the Western, still this area, is in the Western sphere of influence at all, or is increasingly turning eastwards towards the rising power and dominance of the Asian nations and the Asian networks, which the 21st century have propelled into dominance. Here we simply focus on the specific matters of the unparalleled horrors and suffering in your men and aspects of the comp complex struggle there and the ways it is being conducted and the British role. My Lords, this is a continuing conflict in which all sides are acting with extreme ferocity. The uh, Houthis, that is the rebel group who sprang from the, the uh, priest and cleric uh, Houthi 10, 15, 15 years ago, the Houthis control their areas of the country with savagery and neighbouring Saudi Arabia has a right to defend itself against direct attacks which it's received with missiles which have been uh, validated as being of Iranian origin. No one wants hostile and aggressive powers right on their neighbouring borders and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates fears must be fully understood and I think we do understand them. My Lords, despite the flood of military equipment and the backup of technical trait support and training being poured into the area, no side is winning and a stalemate of horror persists um, as the situation dissolves into a fragmentation of local wars and blockades. My Lords, the British contribution in addressing the suffering, in line with our international duty 
must be commended, and we do so in the report. The UK total to date, in terms of aid, is over the four years, as up to £511 million. Pounds, and that is not a small sum by any standards. There are, it is true, problems about our food aid getting through into the right hands, rather than being diverted or just blocked at the ports. But the overall commitment to the British Government is undoubtedly very strong and evident. The Foreign Secretary himself has visited Yemen, and our commitment to alleviate some of the suffering is clear. But, my Lords, when it comes to British involvement with the parties to the war, which is causing all the suffering in the first place, then by virtue of Britain's colossal arms exports to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, the situation is much less clear. My Lords, our short report is not saying that British arms shipments should be immediately suspended, as some of the more sloppy media reporting suggested, although some other countries have indeed imposed a de facto embargo. That's Norway, certainly, and Germany for at least six months ahead. What we are saying is not only that the future licensing of arms exports should be kept under intensely tight review, but that this process and pressure should be used to keep pushing the combatants harder into ending armed conflict and returning to politics and negotiation under the Stockholm process. My Lords, our Government claims that its overall position is and I quote from ministerial witnesses, quotes narrowly on the right side of international humanitarian law, apparently accepting, by implication, uh, the, ex- that our weapons, including combat aircraft and munitions, are not being used for persistent and large-scale airstrikes and civilian casualties. So the question has to be, how good is that evidence? Is the Saudi review process from which this, these propositions come good enough? How are the investigations of the horrific civilian casualties collected and assessed and made available? There is a need to know, my lords, more precisely, how approval decisions on specific arms exports are matched against the evidence received. Could the minister tell us when he winds up, how does the licensing approval system actually work? in situations such as this one. And it would also be good to learn more accurately exactly where British weapons end up and in whose hands they are in this many-sided struggle. For instance, are British arms actually going to various Yemeni militias, as well as to the Saudi government and the UAE government, possibly through the UAE, or even to jihadi groups, of which several are operating in Yemen, notably al-Qaeda. There have also been newspaper reports of British Special Boat Service units operating in northern Yemen. I'm not going to ask about these, and the government is not going to answer. But can we be assured once again that we are not being sucked into becoming a direct party to this hideous conflict? As of now, my lords, without greater clarity on these issues, and in the light of worrying reports of the use of British arms in the indiscriminate airstrikes, we suggest that the narrow balance leaves British policy, however unintentionally, on the wrong side, narrowly, of international humanitarian law in an appalling situation. We would like to be assured that every effort is being used to turn war and terror into peace. We would like to see our efforts combined with others internationally to help rebuild a destroyed nation and restore a hideously wounded nation and people. Uh, The the UN, where the UK has has the role as a so-called pen holder, uh, which I think is a sort of rapporteur, but I may be corrected on that, Um, there it would be good to have confirmation that this role is being used vigorously to put UN authority firmly behind and escape from the bloody status quo stalemate. We fully support the excellent work of Martin Griffiths, Griffiths, the UN Special Envoy, but alas, it is not nearly enough to bring the peace and end to suffering that is now vitally necessary. Above all, my Lords, I hope we can be given clear assurance that as well as doing our utmost to alleviate the suffering, British policy is doing nothing to prolong or intensify the conflict, 
and that such influence as we have with both the Saudi Arabians and the UAE is being used to counsel, care and constraint and restraint in avoiding civilian casualties while of course fully recognizing the, the deep concerns of those two countries and the need for stability and government legitimacy in their neighborhood. I look forward, my lords, to the Minister's comments on all these questions and the tragic issues lying behind them with great interest. The question is that this motion be agreed to. My lords, can I thank the noble Lord Lord Howell of Guildford and the members of the committee for this report and in particular for setting out so very clearly the complexities of the situation in Yemen. I support all of the recommendations, but particularly with respect to the need for the UK government to be more robust and vocal in condemning violations of international humanitarian law. We have seen over time worrying erosions of long-held humanitarian principles that, for example, medical facilities, educational facilities, the denial of access to humanitarian aid workers and the targeting of humanitarian aid workers should not happen. There are significant breaches of these principles. There is also the importance of the UK government redoubling its diplomatic uh, efforts. That is why I was so pleased to see the Special Envoy get the parties around the table in December in Stockholm. The consultations in Stockholm mark the resumption of the political process. It has been two and a half years without any peace talks. Two and a half years during which parties never sat together. The agreement reached in Stockholm proved what can be achieved through dialogue, mediation and diplomacy. It showed that something was beginning to happen on Yemen. The most important element of Stockholm is the agreement on Hodeida. It prevented a battle on Hodeida that would have had both a political and humanitarian cost in terms of famine. The parties agreed on a government-wide ceasefire and the mutual military redeployment of forces from Hodeida port and city. If implemented, this would be the first military withdrawal since the war started. It would also give permanent access to the UN to the Red Sea Mills, where metric tons of food sit. Everyone agrees that there is no military solution. But the threat of famine remains very, very real. My Lords, I was at the UN and watched with real horror as the world allowed the crisis to unfold in Syria. The people seemed to come last. I hope that that will not happen again here in Yemen. I was asked so many times when I was at the United Nations and visited those who had to flee their homes, who were targeted by parties to conflict, why the world had abandoned them. We have to make sure that this does not happen to the people of Yemen. Since the Stockholm Agreement, the ceasefire is broadly holding. When compared with the 12 weeks preceding the Stockholm Agreement, the post-agreement period has seen a 50% reduction in civilian ca casualties, in contrast to the rest of the country, where civilian casualties have increased. However, military deployments haven't happened yet, and implementation of the Hodeida Agreement has been slow. The United Nations is still shuttling between the parties as they have yet to agree on an operational plan to make the redeployments a reality. And there is deep mistrust between the parties which makes implementation slow. Hardliners in each camp have also taken advantage of the implementation phase to prevent progress. It's tedious work, it needs a lot of convincing, patience is needed. I've seen this happen time and time again. But outside pressure is also essential. In his report to the Security Council in February this year, 
The Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock, said this, and the Noble Lord has already referred to some of these figures. About 80% of the population, that's 24 million people, need humanitarian assistance and protection. Some 20 million need help securing food, including nearly 10 million who are just a step away from famine. 10 million people. Almost 20 million people lack access to adequate health care, and nearly 18 million don't have enough clean water or access to adequate sanitation. More than 3 million people, including 2 million children, my lords, are acutely malnourished, and 3.3 million remain displaced from their homes. My lords, he could not have painted a bleaker picture, because behind every single one of those statistics, there is a child, there is a woman, there is a man. So we have to find a way to move this forward. The parties don't want the UN to hold the next round of political consultations without any, as they call it, tangible progress on Hodeida. The implementation of the Hodeida Agreement is a test to assess whether the parties can be trusted to deliver on their commitments. It's a demonstration of will. If the Special Envoy and the parties manage to implement what was agreed in Stockholm, we may be on the path to a comprehensive political sol solution in Yemen. Because it is doable, the issue on Yemen is not necessarily the solution, but the way to actually get to that solution. And there's a wealth of knowledge about the possible political solution. The parties spent three months in Kuwait negotiating in 2016. So the question is, is there the political will? I hope so, because the alternative is much worse. War, famine and terrorism flourishing. The Security Council is united on Yemen. The role that diplomacy played has been very positive. It has complemented the Special Envoy's efforts and the fact that the Council is united has meant that the United Nations has been able to use its diplomacy efficiently. So I have three questions, if I may, for the Minister. The first is in relation to the humanitarian situation and the financial resources which were agreed at the conference in Geneva. Urgent disbursement is required. I ask the Minister when DFID and the United Kingdom will disperse their contribution. Secondly, the role of women in the peace process. I was horrified to see that there were no women on the delegations in Stockholm. How will the UK government use its influence to encourage the parties to include women in those discussions? And finally, it's clear that we need the United Kingdom to support the efforts of the Special Envoy. How can the UK use its influence with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE to prioritise progress towards a political settlement and also its influence with Oman, who have some influence over the Houthis? Yeah. I'm delighted to follow Baroness Amos, who speaks with enormous authority and experience on this issue, having served with such distinction uh, at the United Nations and in tackling humanitarian issues. And I too welcome very warmly the report of the Select Committee and the excellent introduction from Lord Howe. It is certainly very refreshing to be talking about an issue which is outside the European Union, looking more outwards, which is what this country needs to do again. And I hope that in due course we will follow this particular Select Committee report with other ones about our role in the rest of the world, and the sooner uh, the better. Um, my, my Lords, this four and a half months ago, I put down a question for a short debate, and in that time since, we've had the Stockholm Agreement, as Baroness Amos referred to it, we've had the efforts of the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, in his tour of the Gulf countries, 
and I commend the efforts of, of, of Her Majesty's Government. We have the valiant efforts of Mr. Griffiths uh, and others. But I think we have to recognize the condition of the Yemen before we decide how to move forward. It is a failed state. I've described it before as a kind of Dante's Inferno for the people who live there. It does not at the moment have the makings of a nation state. And I've watched this, I have to confess, for over 60 years, since I first went out as a young student in the late 1950s when my father was governor of Aden. And at that time, there was in the north the Imam ruling North Yemen and the British with the colony and with the eastern and western uh, protectors of, uh, of Aden. Since then, and after the unhappy departure of the British, it was a very unhappy situation indeed that we left, after we left, um, we've had civil conflict of major proportions between North and South, and the unification between the North and South under President Saleh was absolutely disastrous and has led to warring factions of one kind or another from the separatist tribal south to Aden, Hadramut, Taiz, the Houthis and so on. A fragmented country with desperate humanitarian challenges. The report and Lord Howe referred very fully to the Stockholm Agreement. And I agree with the recommendations in the report of the Select Committee, although I would ask for more than just a review of export licensing. I think we're facing an extremely serious challenge there, and I think there, where there are issues that uh, export licensing may conflict, even may conflict with humanitarian law, we should take action and suspend those licenses. My Lords, there are no military solution whatsoever uh, to the problem in the Yemen, as Baroness Amos said. But I commend the role of the British government, and this is the kind of role that we should be playing in different parts of the world. Our humanitarian contribution of over 500 million in four years has been outstanding. But I want to say a word only about diplomacy, the role of diplomacy by the United Kingdom. Of course, the precondition for any progress at all is the fulfilment of the various first stages from Stockholm and thereafter a ceasefire. But the people of Yemen want hope and they need to link that with what are the prospects in the longer term. And so I think even though the immediate situation is very grave, we need to think too about the longer term strategy. And we have to start by recognising the gravity of the fragmentation of that country and how the various groups in that country are going to find a way of living with each other. What form of governance is going to emerge? Most recently I met a man called Mr Zubai Idi, who is president of the Southern Transitional Council, which is strongly supported by the UAE. And he has said that he is looking forward to inclusive process, an inclusive political process because the South has been marginalised for so long. So the groups have to find a way of living and working together with the help, obviously, and encouragement of outside powers. Now, my Lords, the points I want to stress are the, regional, the role of regional nations is critical. Of course, Europe is there to back up, but the front row of the scrum is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Our job is to back up where we can and engage with Kuwait and Oman as well so that there is a, a, a very strong international effort behind finding a way for the longer term. To my mind, a key is the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And it is vital that the international community do whatever they can to press those two nations to find a way of living together. The rivalry is doing an immense amount to undermine stability in the Middle East and certainly in the Yemen. Then there is the question of what is the role in the longer term of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. 
in their coalition. Because what it looks like is that Saudi Arabia's interests are more to see stability in the north of the Yemen, whereas the UAE are already showing more than an interest in the south. And the question is, how much are we engaging and other international community with those two nations about the kind of role they can play which will help to stabilise that region and not exactly colonise it. My Lords, the last thing I want to raise is the lessons from the wider region. The strategic importance of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden and the Straits of Bab el Mando are obvious to the international community. But both sides of the seas are very unstable. In the Horn you have Eritrea and Somalia and the work of Al-Shabaab. And then, of course, by contrast, you have the Yemen on the other side. It is worth reminding ourselves that we have played a role, a positive role, in trying to work with other naval forces, the Naval Task Force, to reduce piracy in those seas. And that has been successful. We've also played an important role in helping to build up Somali land as a more stable part of Somalia. Now, there could be lessons to be learned here in, for example, the port of Aden. There could be areas in which we could work to help build up greater stability. I hope the Minister will reassure me that the government is thinking seriously about longer-term strategy as well as the immediate. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, I'm delighted to follow the Noble Lord, Lord Luce, and the Noble Lady Baroness Amos, who bring such expertise both of the region and of the UN. I have the pleasure of serving on Your Lordship's International Relations Committee, and as the Noble Lord, Lord Howell, is Chairman, he has produced, or he has already introduced the report very effectively. I'd like to thank him for chairing the short report. As a committee, we're still a relatively new committee. We've had some long reports, but we've also tried to have a few shorter reports to bring issues of urgent importance to your Lordship's House. And on this report, it was printed only in mid-February. So it is a great opportunity to be able to debate it today. And I'm grateful to the usual channels for allowing the debate to come forward in such a timely fashion. Because, as the noble Lord Lord Luce intimated, there is a danger at the moment that we spend so much time in the United Kingdom focusing on our narrow future in terms of our relationship with the European Union that we don't have time to think about the wider world. And while we focus on whether or not we have a relationship with the European Union that is about a customs union, a free trade area, or anything else, there are millions of people facing starvation in Yemen. There is a man-made catastrophe. 24 million people are in need of aid, three quarters of the whole population. 24 million people. The noble lady Baroness Amos has indicated just how many individuals are facing starvation and who are facing also medical need. As she's already po also pointed out, each one of those statistics is a human life. The situation in Yemen is one of grave con concern, but one that isn't sufficiently on the front pages of our newspapers. In the years since the crisis began, five years ago, GDP per capita has gone down 61%. Full fuel and food prices have gone up 98% and 110% respectively. They are dramatic figures, figures that we need to think about, because each time there is a further day of this conflict, it means more children dying, not just as civilian casualties, but they are there, but also through starvation. Starvation that shouldn't be happening and need not be happening. There is food in the ports, but is it getting to the people concerned? There are clearly issues about how far food is being able to get through. And I would like to ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, what reassurance he can give us that food, British aid, is getting through. The evidence we were given is that 
of food is getting through. And yet other suggestions from Safer World and other organisations indicate that perhaps not that much aid is getting through. So what is happening on the ground? Can the Minister reassure us? But, my Lords, we've already heard that Her Majesty's Government has made significant humanitarian aid available to Yemen, and that is true. But we're looking at figures of £170 million in aid alongside arms exports to Saudi Arabia in the same amount of time of £4.7 billion. My Lords, surely there is something going wrong when the countries that are involved in the conflict, whether as part of the coalition or supporting the coalition, are engaged in serious arms exports and arms trading, while at the same time giving humanitarian aid, but at a much lower level. The United Kingdom is the fifth largest donor of humanitarian aid to Yemen at present, after the, U the United States, the UAE, and, the, and, and, the, and Saudi Arabia. My Lords, if the war stopped, we could begin to focus on ensuring that the humanitarian situation isn't just mitigated, but is resolved. My Lords, as the noble Lord, Lord Luce, suggested, perhaps we need to be thinking about more than simply reviewing our arms exports licences to Saudi. Is the Minister satisfied that the United Kingdom is currently on just the right side of humanitarian international law, as the former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson believed, or may we have tripped over to the wrong side? My Lords, this was a very short inquiry. It consisted of one evidence session, but that was a very rich evidence session because the key evidence giver was the former Minister of State, Alistair Burt. He brought a great deal of wisdom and expertise, and we are most grateful to him for that evidence, and he will be greatly missed as a minister. My Lords, the Right Honourable um, former minister reminded the committee that Her Majesty's Government's position is one that believes that we can't get to, a result, a, to resolve the situation in Yemen through military means nor through external action. It needs to be resolved by the Yemenis themselves. My Lords, our conclusions included one that suggested that Her Majesty's Government needed to be doing more to resolve the situation rather than simply trying to mitigate the crisis. What is Her Majesty's Government proposing to do that will enable us to go beyond the conflict, that will enable the Yemenis to take control of their own future? The visit of the Foreign Secretary to Yemen and the surrounding region is important. How far is he going to be able to take a lead to working beyond the Stockholm process to ensuring that we're not facing another five years of conflict in the Yemen and that we are going to be able to resolve the issues and work together with the international community to overcome the crisis rather than simply coming back in a year's time, for example, and bemoaning the difficulties which we, the international community has been unable to resolve. My Lords, I thank my noble friend, Lord Howe, for setting out so clearly the main points which underpin our report and our recommendations. And it is a, a, such a pleasure to be able to serve on the committee under his chairmanship. Uh, and it's also, as the noble lady has said, a timely debate. It comes just after the, uh, a week after the Foreign Office and DFID uh, set out their joint statement on the fourth anniversary of the intervention by the Saudi-led coalition in the Yemen conflict. I shall focus today on the impact of the war on women and girls who have been disproportionately affected by the conflict and the humanitarian crisis and the role that they could play in the peace process. And, and I welcome the remarks earlier by Baroness Amos on the matter of the peace process. Uh, my Lords, the International Committee of the Red Cross says that 80% of Yemen's population rely on aid to survive. Yemen's entire economic system has collapsed this can't be substituted by humanitarian organisations. Well, of course, they're right in that. 
But humanitarian assistance is vital today for the very survival of Yemenis. I congratulate the government for their contributions to humanitarian aid in Yemen. Can my noble friend the Minister update the House today on the result of the recent pledging conference in Geneva? What have other European Union countries pledged? Have they matched the UK's good example? I'm grateful to the International Rescue Committee for their written briefing on the humanitarian concerns and to Kieran Donnelly, the IRC's Vice President for International Programmes, for his presentation to the Women, Peace and Security and Yemen APPG last month, where we had a joint meeting. And I was pleased, too, that the noble Lord, Lord Hannay, was able to attend and gave us a presentation there on the committee's short report. Uh, my Lords, whilst all Yemenis are affected by the war, clearly they are, women and girls are bearing the burden. This is particularly evident in the context of the country's malnutrition crisis, to which other noble lords referred. Two million children, over one million pregnant women and new mothers are acutely malnourished. The war has also exacerbated pre-existing inequalities and vulnerabilities for women and girls. Incidents of gender-based violence have increased by over 63% since before the conflict started. The rate of early and forced marriage of girls has risen dramatically, tripling since 2015. The breakdown of public services is having a major impact on women's ability to gain access to health care. Only 35% of maternal and newborn health services are fully functional today. Health services that are available are simply not equipped, staffed or trained to deal with the needs of women and girls affected by violence. So does my noble friend the Minister agree that it is important for the UK and other humanitarian actors to increase the priority given to the needs of women and girls, with specific attention to preventing and responding to gender-based violence and to ensuring better access to maternal health care? And so what action does the Government intend to take? For example, my Lords, Will it increase dedicated funding to end violence against women and girls? Will it press for the UNFPA's Yemen humanitarian response plans to be fully funded? And will the UK encourage the UN to appoint a gender-based violence advisor to be based in Yemen to be responsible for ensuring that a gender perspective is applied to assessments and that UN coordination on gender-based violence is improved across the work of UNICEF and UNHCR. As our report makes clear, we commend the Government for its ongoing humanitarian contribution and the work of DFID and British volunteers who risk their lives every day to deliver assistance. But we can do more to help the resolve the crisis. We could, for example, put our weight behind the UN peace process in new and imaginative ways. I would be grateful if my noble friend the Minister could respond to our Committee's recommendation at Power 69 of our report that it should consider appointing a special representative based in London to speak to all the parties concerned, both internal and external, to reinforce the efforts of the Special Envoy. This could provide an impetus to work on including women in the peace process more effectively. I do welcome the fact that the UK has supported the Yemeni Women Pact for Peace and Security to increase women's leadership and inclusion in the official peace process. And the group now does have official status as a consultative body for the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy. But, my Lords, I suspect that they won't sit down round the table to negotiate peace until and unless there is a change in attitude amongst all the parties to the conflict. A UK special representative could be an influence for good in shifting the dial. As long as the voices of Yemeni women are relegated to the periphery, it's unlikely that any peace process will have a lasting effect. To create lasting peace, we do need women's voices. From conflict prevention and conflict resolution to reconciliation and economic recovery post-conflict, women's meaningful participation in peace processes increases by 35% the likelihood that an agreement 
will last for more than five, 15 years. Meaningful participation requires that women are at the table when negotiations take place. Women's interests and lived experiences are fully reflected in peace processes, and the women are equally considered in recovery efforts in the aftermath of conflict. As my neighbour friend, the Minister, said last month in New York when he attended a Women for Women international meeting at the Commission on the Status for Women, and I quote him verbatim, we don't just want women involved. They have to be involved in conflict resolution. Let us deliver on this noble objective. My Lords, he was right. How are we going to do that? Yeah. My Lords, uh, I follow a number of other members of the committee uh, in thanking uh, our Chair, the Noble Lord, Lord Howell of Guildford, for his uh, very crisp and clear introduction of our report. Um, and uh, I very much echo much of what the Noble Lady, Lady Anley, has said, and I am delighted also to be following uh, Baroness Amos, whose work at the United Nations was something we should all be grateful for, and uh, she deserved much credit for it. Now, my Lords, today's debate is long overdue, but it is welcome nevertheless. It is particularly welcome that the Government has in fact scheduled this debate ahead of the two-month limit for the submission of its response to our report, and I think that makes the Minister's uh, wind-up reply today all the more important, uh, and no doubt that will be followed by the Government's uh, formal response to the recommendations we made. It's overdue, my Lords, because in this country, as elsewhere, the situation in Yemen has tended to be marginalised and overlooked, but despite the copious evidence of appalling loss of life and suffering uh, in the civil war which continues there. It has been uh, so easy to think of Yemen as a faraway country of which we know little. But that is a mistake. Uh, this is a conflict in which Britain has been playing a role, admittedly an indirect role and not that of a combatant. So first I would like to begin by unstintingly praising the work of DFID and of the British-based NGOs in mitigating the humanitarian catastrophe uh, brought about by the war. Uh, the, um, uh, the, this impressive sums that we are devoting uh, to this um, mitigation need to be sustained, and I imagine that the Minister will say something about that. But mitigation is frankly no longer enough, if it ever was. What is needed now is a major concerted international effort uh, uh, to, to bring this war to an end, uh, because this war is one which is not going to be ended on the battlefield. It needs, it desperately needs, a political solution. Now, in that international effort, um, there is uh, Britain's position as a permanent member of the Security Council uh, is uh, an important uh, aspect, uh, particularly as we uh, have what is known as we are the penholder for Yemen uh, in New York. Now, being the penholder is not so much a matter of pride, it is a responsibility. And I do have to say that holding the pen is not much use if the hand that holds the, he holds the pen is paralysed. And through much of 2018, that was indeed the situation. And the Security Council didn't do much to deal with this situation that was deteriorating all the time and the suffering which was so great. So uh, I agree, I accept that with the adoption of two resolutions at the United Nations uh, on the basis of the Stockholm talks, uh, that is no longer so, but it really must not become so again. We mustn't fall into a state of palsy again. With the first fragile and tentative steps towards a peace process at Stockholm, not progressing very far or very fast, not registering much progress, the Security Council's intervention may well be needed again. And it would be good to hear from the Noble Lord, the Minister, uh, something about 
the role of the Security Council in the period that now lies ahead of us. And then we do need to consider how best we can back up the praiseworthy efforts of Martin Griffiths, the UN Special Envoy. In that respect, our report suggested, and Noble Lady Baroness Ainley of St. John's uh, mentioned that, and I will mention it too, uh, that we should contemplate, the government should contemplate, the appointment of a special representative who could be in continuous contact with all the parties to the conflict, both internal and external, which our ambassador to uh, the Hadi government in Riyadh clearly cannot be. Perhaps the noble lord, the minister, can give us a response to that suggestion. On the ground, the UN is playing a modest verification and monitoring role and function in and around Hodeida, which is so crucial for access to the rest of the country for humanitarian supplies. Uh, it would uh, be helpful, I'm sure, if the government could make clear in this debate that it would be willing to provide equipment and expertise additional to that we are already providing for that mission, not just in Hodeida, but elsewhere in the country if, as is to be hoped, the ceasefire can be extended more widely. Now, in this debate, as in our report, the issue of arms supplies to those involved in the conflict, particularly to Saudi Arabia and to the United Arab Emirates, cannot be ducked. There is just too much evidence that material uh, we have supplied has been used in what amount to breaches in international humanitarian law and thus to a contradiction between our obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty and the, the commerce that we are conducting. Our committee was not, and I have to say this, and I know the noble Lord, Lord Howell said this too, our committee was not a court of law, and we had no access to confidential material. But it did seem to us uh, that a line has been crossed and that the government's assertion to the contrary lack credibility. That, after all, seems to be the view of the German government, which has suspended its arms supplies to Saudi Arabia, and of both houses of the US Congress. Well, that's quite a, com a, 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 a combination. What we have suggested is that the government should make it clear, in private and without grandstanding, to all the external players that if they do not give their backing in deeds as well as words to the peace process that began at Stockholm, and if uh, for aerial bombardment or the blocking of humanitarian supplies, food and medicine, most importantly, were to resume, then there would be negative consequences for our uh, bilateral relations with them, and that would include some suspension of the supply of arms. I hope very much the Noble Lord, the Minister, will say when he winds up uh, that the Government shares that view and will act accordingly. That would be a real boost to the prospects for peace. Now, I would like to end simply, as some others have done, with a tribute to the Minister of State, the Right Honourable Alistair Burt, whose timeless, tireless efforts and whose evidence to us was so invaluable. His best legacy would be if the government were to give a real strong helping hand to the effort to resolve the conflict in Yemen and to give to it the same priority that he always gave to it. My Lords, I too am a member of the International Relations Committee and am grateful that we have been given the opportunity to debate this report so soon after its publication given the urgency and extreme seriousness of the situation in Yemen. I will focus on just two issues, and as the first of these is the position of women, I've just deleted several parts of my speech so as not to repeat the words that uh, the noble lady Baroness Ainley has just uh, said, uh, with which I wholeheartedly agree. We know from various sources that women and children are not surprisingly bearing the brunt of the violence and its consequences, including starvation and the lack of health care. For example, the International Rescue Committee reports that over a million women who are pregnant or breastfeeding 
are currently acutely malnourished, and the UN has warned that the maternal death rate is likely to be double what it was in 2015. Against this appalling background, the Committee's report was able to record some impressive aid programmes being delivered by DFID, and it goes without saying <clears throat> that these are more than welcome. For example, last September, Her Majesty's Government announced that almost £100 million would fund a nutrition programme treating 70,000 children with acute malnutrition and providing antenatal care to 800,000 women. But, my Lords, <clears throat> I do not want to focus on women solely in relation to their suffering in the conflict. I also wish to stress how important it is that women form an integral part of the peace process to resolve that conflict, an issue also raised by the noble Lady Baroness Amos and the noble Lady Baroness Ainley. <clears throat> in, a <clears throat> excuse me, in a recent written question, I asked what action Her Majesty's Government has taken or plans to take to ensure that the provisions of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on the involvement of women in peace negotiations and post-conflict reconstruction are being fully complied with in the Stockholm Agreement process aimed at ending the war in Yemen. The Noble Lord, the Minister, provided an encouraging answer, saying that the UK has indeed lobbied the parties in the conflict to include more women in formal peace talks and explained why, although in the light of the observations of the noble Lady Baroness Amos, we should perhaps be talking not about more women but about any women at all. In addition, he pointed out that through the Conflict Stability and Security Fund, the UK helps to support the Yemeni Women Pact and I thank the Minister for this information and would ask him if he can update the House on any progress being made by Tawafak, the, the Yemeni Women Pact, especially in the light of the championing of its work by the UN Humanitarian Coordinator for Yemen. Looking at other ways of increasing, or perhaps I should say achieving, the participation of women in the peace talks, I would draw the Minister's attention to the meeting a few weeks ago which members of the International Relations Committee held with the President and other members of the Southern Transitional Council of Yemen. He will know that the STC is currently excluded from the Stockholm process, and I do appreciate that there are dilemmas to be addressed. But at the same time, it was clear that the STC does have an inclusive attitude towards women, and at its 2017 Assembly agreed explicit policy on women's rights so I wonder if the Minister could say what the Government's view currently is on including the participation of the STC in official peace talks with specific reference to the inclusion of women. The second issue I want to raise, like most other noble lords in this debate, is the question of arms sales to, by the UK to Saudi Arabia. As others have said, we concluded in our report that we disagreed with the government's view that the UK was narrowly on the right side of international humanitarian law, to quote the former Foreign Secretary. And we concluded that the UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia are highly likely to be the cause of significant civilian casualties in Yemen. Since the report was published, Further doubt still has been directed at Her Majesty's Government in this regard. The international NGO Safer World has argued that the UK's assistance to Saudi Arabia in targeting strikes is potentially leading to more, not fewer, casualties, and that the UK is guilty of a lack of transparency on how decisions on arms licences are made. Putting the UK out of line compared with several other European countries which, as we've also heard, now have a de facto embargo on arms sales to Saudi. So I would like to ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, first, if he still stands by the Government's position that it is on the right side of international humanitarian law in this case, and secondly, and echoing the question put by the Noble Lord, Lord Howell, whether he will clarify how political approval for arms licences is reached. I look forward to the Minister's reply to my question and those of other noble Lords. Uh, my Lords, uh, I'm afraid I was unwell in the week when the Committee had its hearing on the Yemen problem. 
but the report which we're debating today uh, demonstrates extremely well the continued horrific situation that there is in that part of the world and I congratulate the government on bringing forward this debate uh, so quickly. So many noble lords have already uh, referred to the detail of the horrific situation which confronts us and I will not enlarge on it. The widespread hunger and food shortages, the growing threats of disease, cholera, typhoid and other maladies associated with the deprivations of this nature, the shortage of medicine and of course the civilian deaths as a result of military action. A number of uh, noble lords have talked about the Stockholm Agreement. It does seem to be inadequate in meeting the crisis. Of course, we always have known that the Stockholm Agreement was only the first step in the process of achieving a peace. But in spite of it, the port of Hodida, uh, contrary to all the intentions of the Stockholm negotiations, still continues to be blocked as a conduit of food aid and other humanitarian assistance to the stricken 24 million people who are comprise the 80% of the population. And it, so I, I hope that in spite of some pious hopes that we can see a little more evidence that there will be significant troop redeployments around the city of Haidada by the Houthi uh, leadership uh, to ensure the full deliveries of essential food and medicines to the beleaguered mil millions. The Foreign Secretary referred a short time ago to the 50,000 tonnes of grain which sits in stores in Hadida, which remain there as the millions starve. And following on what the noble lady, Lady Smith, said in her speech, I hope that the Minister, when he replies, will update us with the, the latest figures of relief supplies, especially food, entering the ports of Yemen, but in Hodida in particular, which is much the most important, as well as the movement of those items from the docks and the stores to where it is urgently needed. We, uh, an update of that sort would be most welcome. My Lords, we've heard continually that there is no military solution and we know what a divided country uh, the Yemen is. But as a background to this, I hope noble lords will remember that at the heart of the Yemen crisis lies the century-old rivalry between the Muslim factions of Sunni and Shia. Uh, I was in Riyadh not too long ago where we met uh, virtually all the key leaders, including the king. Uh, we didn't in fact meet the crown prince as he had other distractions with the president of China in town at the same time, so that was understandable. But I was struck that almost wherever we went in Riyadh, we were regaled by being told how dreadful and evil were the Iranians and the malevolence of those in Tehran. Surprisingly, only once during our visit were we retold the familiar view of their attitude to Israel. Uh, indeed, uh, since that visit, there have been stories uh, about uh, very high-level visits by Saudis to Israel and suggestions that a visit could have been done by the Crown Prince himself. And so, my Lords, it is this Saudi-Iranian rivalry which lies behind so many of the problems which confront that country. Uh, the uh, frequent 
Houthi missile attacks on Saudi territory uh, around Riyadh uh, uh, as well as other places must alarm us all. The situation could surely escalate, leading to a much wider conflict between the rival Islamic Middle Eastern states themselves. Hence, the UK government must do everything in its power and in the United Nations to give full effect, first of all, to the Stockholm Agreement and move on then to a wider settlement of this dreadful situation. Whilst I'm not opposed to a selling armaments to the Saudis, I am alarmed at the committee's conclusion that they are, as it's been quoted, narrowly on the wrong side of the law. The government needs to review this situation urgently and to take steps to ensure that this accusation cannot be made and maintained. Especially, I ask the Minister, in his summing up uh, this afternoon, to tell us what is the situation about our arms sales to the, uh, both uh, to Saudi and to the United Arab Emirates, who are also actively engaged with the Saudis in Yemen? And are they satisfied that the UAE sales in particular are within the law? And I, I end, my lords, by saying that the Saudi regime have continually told us that UK arms sales are compliant with the rules of international law. Uh, and uh, the chairman of the committee, my noble friend Lord Howell, did refer, uh, I think, obliquely uh, to the problematic veracity of some of the things the Saudis say. And I hope the minister will tell us that whatever assurances we are given by the Saudis, that they will be thoroughly examined for their veracity. We've had recent cases over the death of Mr Khashoggi, which lead us to the conclusion that they don't always mean what they say. My Lords, uh, I'm sure I'm speaking for very many in expressing deep appreciation for this report uh, by the Select Committee. Uh, this particular Select Committee is setting a very high standard for hard-hitting effective reports repeatedly introduced uh, by so well and constructively uh, by the Liberal Lord, Lord Hull. I'm also greatly cheered to be sitting in front of uh, my noble friend, Lady Amos, who has really proved herself, more than proved herself, by being there at the UN carrying so many responsibilities so heavily, and if I may say so, positively and cheerfully. And I think it's therefore very important to listen to what she has to say. She emphasized the importance of will in this situation, as indeed of others. And that, of course, is crucial. Without will, nothing effective will happen. And it's therefore always a matter, of course, of negotiations and policies, but these must be there as a means to fulfill the will which is paramount. My Lord, she also uh, refer, 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 referred to the special envoy, as indeed again have others. He's done an unstintingly heavy job with great credit to how he's performed it. There are some comments that the trouble with the uh, settlement and the uh, agreement was that it was too general and not didn't include enough specifics to pin it down. But if you've not had people around the table at all for years, you have to get something going. And I'm not at all sure that I would want to join in any way in criticizing the approach which he took. But I think it does incumbent on the rest of us to face the reality 
that it is particularly disappointing that in recent months the situation has deteriorated as it has. I was just reading a, a report from the International Rescue Committee in which they were pointing out that uh, it's not only in Haneda but in other uh, governments governance has also seen persistent clashes and airstrikes with heavy civilian tolls, reflecting a trend throughout the war of damage to civilian infrastructure, and they point out that a hospital supported by Save the Children in the northwest of Yemen was repeatedly hit, reportedly hit by an airstrike on the 26th of March, killing seven people including four children. Figures from the Yemen Data Project suggest SLC airstrikes have killed 8,338 civilians, 1,283 of them children, over the past four years, and injured 9,391 others. My Lord's it's also striking, and the IRC referred to this to serve others, the heavy toll and the Im impact on women. Uh, women in pregnancy and lactating have paid heavy punishment for what has been happening. And that is something we should take very seriously indeed. My Lord's there's also been reference to the importance of women in negotiations. And I can share what is clearly the frustration of my noble friend, Lady Amos, that no women have been involved. There's no way we can build peace without the full involvement of women. And that is something that needs acute attention. But my Lord's there also has been a considerable amount of uh, mention of the arms issue. I'm glad that the committee grappled with this so firmly. The, the remarks by government about remaining on the right side of the law are very defensive and unconvincing statements. We need to have a much more fulsome and honest debate about uh, I uh, am one of those who believes that it's one thing having arms trade treaties and indeed the European uh, rules on the export of arms, a very important element backing up the arms trade treaty. But it's not just treaties, it's rather like the point about will. Are these minimal approaches? Is it a matter of governments being able to say that we are within the letter of the law? Or are they positive dynamic proposals which are ensuring that our arms are not contributing to the ongoing suffering and conflict? I am quite convinced that this is a deep cultural economic issue in Britain which we've never faced under successive government. And I plead guilty because I've been a minister at defense, I've been a minister at the Foreign Office. But we've got to be honest with ourselves. Arms are highly lethal, dangerous exports. In the volatility and instability of the world, of which Yemen is an acute example, they are particularly dangerous. We can never be absolutely sure about end use. This is one of the crucial issues that one has to pursue, whatever the good intention. But my lords, until we get a situation in this country in which we're saying that arms may be necessary, may be essential in certain situations, but arms are only to be for use by our own services or by those in alliances with 
which we're a member, for action which we very specifically support, and that they are only ever used for specific positive purposes about which we are convinced. When arms start reaching beyond that, we are inviting deep humanitarian trouble. And I think it's good that the report the, and the NGOs and indeed many others have drawn our attention to this. And indeed, I do want to place on record my admiration for the work of DFID as a humanitarian agency working to so much good effect but so much of that being threatened and undermined by the arms issue. My Lords, in the aftermath of Antonio Guterres's assertion that Yemen is the world's worst humanitarian crisis, the International Affairs Committee have provided the House with a succinct, brave and timely report. Yemen's victims are disfigured by grinding poverty caught in a cycle of declining GDP, the collapsing Yemeni rial, accelerating food and fuel prices, and as the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs described in a recent report, it has, and I quote, a higher percentage of people facing death, hunger and disease than in any other country. They say 80% of the entire population requires some form of humanitarian assistance and protection, that 20 million Yemenis need help securing food and a staggering 14 million people are in acute humanitarian need. They say that 10 million people are one step away from famine and starvation, that 7,400,000 people, nearly a quarter of the entire population, are malnourished and many acutely so that 2 million malnourished children under 5 and 1.1 million pregnant and lactating women require urgent treatment to survive, that conditions are worsening at a nearly unprecedented rate. My Lords, and in what is an increasingly a breeding ground for next wave ISIS recruiting sergeants, it's reported that in western Yemen, Hidden landmines have taken the lives of 267 civilians, also claiming the lives of five charity workers who were demining the area, while aid agencies estimate a 63% increase in gender-based violence. 1.3 million suspected cases of cholera have been reported, the worst outbreak in modern history, with coalition airstrikes destroying water treatment facilities, crippling access to clean water. In addition, my lords, in a criminal war crime warranting prosecution, five medical facilities run by Médecins Sans Frontières have been bombed since 2015. Despite the three-month-old truce in Hodeida, according to UNICEF, and I quote, at least one child dies every 10 minutes in Yemen from malnutrition and preventable diseases. In December, UNICEF reported that over 6,700 children were verified killed or severely injured. Nearly 1.5 million children have been displaced, many of them living a life that is a mere shadow of what childhood should be. In Yemen today, they say 7 million children go to sleep hungry every night. Every single day, 400,000 children face life-threatening, severe acute malnutrition and could die any minute. More than 2 million children are out of school. Those who are in school often have to settle for poor quality education in overcrowded classrooms. My Lords, as the conflict and the humanitarian crisis rages on, the estimated cost, as we've heard during this debate, has reached staggering sums of billions of dollars. In evidence to the committee, the then Minister Alistair Burt, an old friend of mine, he described Iran's and Saudi Arabia's huge existential fears for their states, but also that Opponents of the Saudi-led coalition had used a very easy narrative and had misunderstood the nature of this conflict. He insisted that the UK was, quotes, not a party to the military conflict as part of the coalition. But, my lords, this is a very elastic definition. Last week, as we heard, national newspapers reported, I quote, members of a special boat service were shot while fighting in the Sada area in the north of the country. How is that not taking part in the military conflict. But it's far worse than that, my lords. 
Over four years, the Coalition has carried out over 19,000 airstrikes, one every 106 minutes. In 2019, the UN Panel of Experts on Yemen said precautionary measures to protect civilians are largely inadequate and ineffective. The UK has provided training in targeting and weapons, liaison officers at Saudi headquarters, resupplied Saudi air capability, provided technical maintenance and spare parts. We have licensed £4.7 billion of arms exports to Saudi, along with a further £860 million of arms to its coalition partners. As only second to the United States in selling arms to Saudi Arabia, we have stoked the fires of this conflict, selling arms to a country which has exported terror and ideology. We have acted as quartermaster to this conflict and then salve our consciences by boasting about how much aid we have given to the suffering people of Yemen. My Lords, although Ministers have played a constructive role in promoting United Nations Security Council Resolution 2451 and encouraging the work of the Admirable Martin Griffiths, the Special Envoy uh, of the United Nations Security uh, Secretary General, in brokering the Stockholm Agreement, our own credibility in this process is damaged when, as the report says, in its licensing of arms sales to Saudi Arabia, the government is narrowly on the wrong side of international law, given the volume and type of arms being exported to the Saudi-led coalition. And they go on to say that these sales are highly likely to be the cause of significant casualties in Yemen. When he comes to reply, I hope the noble lord, the minister, will respond to the call of the 25 Yemeni and global NGOs who have called on Germany to extend its moratorium on arms sales to Saudi Arabia and tell us if he is comfortable that we have not done the same. The UK's response and that of France, who both produce arms that require parts and components of German origin, has been for the UK to actively lobby Germany to lift its moratorium. My Lords, this demonstrates again how we're stepping over the line and risks weakening international sta standards for arms control. And indeed, it may violate our obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty, including, I quote, respecting and ensuring respect for international humanitarian law and for preventing human suffering. I might add, as we heard from the noble Lord, Lord Hanney, that the US Congress has also voted to suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen, although the White House has signalled that, if necessary, it will veto this. Knowing of the attacks on civilians and the atrocities in Yemen and still providing the weapons to Saudi Arabia makes Her Majesty's Government complicit in these atrocities. And recall, my Lords, both Yemen and Saudi Arabia are accused of having committed war crimes. Hence, Her Majesty's Government could fall within the ambit of complicity. Contrary to Yemen and Saudi Arabia, Her Majesty's Government is subject to the International Criminal Court and ministers should urgently seek the advice of government law officers on this matter. If it seriously wants to see an end to the carnage and the suffering in the Yemen, the government should immediately end its complicity in this disgraceful business and make it clear that this appalling campaign of killing is not to be conducted in our name. My Lord, the noble Lord, Lord uh, Alton has vividly set out the case that enough is enough. The horrendous number of deaths and casualties, the displaced and no access to drinking water is an absolute catastrophe, my Lords. And as the Minister so rightly once said at the dispatch box, one death is one death too many. My Lords, the Saudi-led coalition's goals remain elusive, and while conditions on the ground deteriorate with the humanitarian situation worsening, disease spreading, the Hutus are more entrenched with Iranian influence growing. Good faith negotiations on long-term political and security arrangements with the support from Secretary Pompeo for UN-sponsored talks is welcome. But it is concerning that the December confidence-building measures contained in the Stockholm Agreement of a ceasefire in the uh, port city of Hodeida, an end to the uh, siege of Taiz and prisoner exchanges faltered. Some suggest that more consideration of the detail moving forward uh, in, a, in a more detailed roadmap uh, might have been uh, usefully addressed to assist uh, the Stockholm process advancing. UN Special Envoy Griffiths has cultivated, however, a relationship of trust with the Houthis, which is a major asset. My Lords, it will require Herculean Houdini abilities for the United States expressing itself as being an ally to Saudi Arabia and, in parallel, managing Iran simultaneously when the administration's agenda is to instigate regime change in Tehran. 
Also, the United Kingdom's reputation is tarnished by association through the continuing of supply of arms to Saudi Arabia, defying comprehension. More particularly than ever, our future policy should be to now play our cards as an honest broker. Reputational damage is enhanced when we do not take account of Germany, Spain and Denmark, supported by the European Parliament, to encourage to suspend the supply of arms to Saudi Arabia. Is it that the US is requesting us to continue with the supply of arms? Did I understand correctly that Foreign Secretary Hunt uh, requested Germany uh, to continue the supply of uh, uh, weaponry spare parts? If that was the case, by what reasoning uh, was this uh, request made? The Minister uh, should offer a robust explanation as to why the United Kingdom continues uh, with this practice. It would appear that there is to be focus on the UK-Saudi relationship placed in the spotlight, with BBC dispatches airing its programme uh, this evening. My Lords, to state that Saudi's continuing bombardments is an image disaster for Saudi Arabia would be an understatement. I suspect that Saudi Arabia, however, will only stop the airstrikes when the United States indicate the continuation will adversely affect the relationship between the two countries. Then there is the question of Iran. If it is believed that Iran is part of the solution to the misery, and it believes it can contribute, then engagement with that, con with that country is mandatory. However, if you think Iran is part of the problem, a solution must be arrived at. Uh, my Lords, I'm uh, pleased to observe that the Iranian political attaché has taken uh, interest in our proceedings uh, by attending uh, this debate. My Lords, the Houthis, with their military takeover in 2014, are in the influence of Iran, but the report of the International Relations Committee concludes only that, and I quote, it is known that there is some relationship between the Houthis and Iran. There was, end of quote, there was, and I quote again, a matter of academic difference as to the degree of that control, but it is our assessment that the Houthis are very independent-minded, end of quote. Uh, and uh, so it went on. Iran is often finger-pointed to being the origin of supply of missiles, so the report noting that when the Houthis capture Sana'a, uh, they, they assume control of Yemen's stock of missiles, which included weaponry from the former Soviet Union and North Korea. How certain is the minister that reports of missile attacks on Riyadh emanate from Iranian supplies? My Lords, I applaud Foreign Secretary Hunt's past visit to Tehran and talks conducted in Muscat. The committee's report drew attention to Iran being in the sphere of influence but did not refer to E4 meetings with Iran about Yemen. It is important to Iran that it does not consider itself neglected. The UK has more experience than most in the affairs of the Middle East and we should not compromise our continuing ability to engage, both now and in the future, between the two regional powers. Will the, UK, will the UK be providing a draft of a statement and with, with the, with, will the UK be uh, providing a draft of a statement at an upcoming meeting, meeting in Jordan and would the minister confirm that he anticipates this being couched in balanced and neutral terms Mr Griffiths to whom participants and observers pay tribute is not yet I believe has not yet I believe visited Tehran and he might wish to consider doing so particularly as uh, Iranian influence in Yemen is growing significantly. It does become more critical as Shiites in other countries are, are embracing the Hutu cause as part of what they see as a larger struggle against Sunni predominance. All that said, my lords, the report rightly points to that it is for Yemenis to determine their political future. Peace must be restored, uh, but not imposed. On a more personal note, my lords, I remember well my visits to Yemen over the years, a beautiful country reminiscent to me of Arabia of old. This whole, uh, this whole affair is tragic and another example where the innocent suffers with diplomacy uh, faltering. An outcome which would not be in the interests of the West but as seen, uh, seen elsewhere in the region, additional external players will weigh in. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, following the, the very powerful contributions from the, the noble Viscount and Lord Alton on the humanitarian uh, situation and uh, their personal reflections, and, and uh, that of uh, the noble Lord Lord Luce on the geopolitical situation, and in addition, 
for the, the noble ladies, uh, Baroness Amos and Baroness Ainley, on highlighting the failings of a process which is actively excluding the majority of people, women, uh, which I'll touch on later on in my contributions. And of course, with the contribution from Lord Judd, I, I have felt that there are limited areas where I can make an original contribution to this debate because it has been so powerful, even if it's been brief. Uh, I have the, the pleasure, as others, of serving on, on the committee uh, so ably chaired by the noble Lord, Lord Howell. Um, and I, well, I can concur with all of the, my colleagues on the committee for their contributions today. Uh, my Lords, I would uh, direct the House to my uh, entry in the Register of Interests. And I returned yesterday afternoon from a, a two-country visit to the Middle East. And it was remarked to me then, and as others have uh, remarked in this debate, that we have lost with his resignation uh, a minister in government who is widely respected not only just in this House, but in many respects, more importantly, in the region. And uh, a week from his uh, resignation, it is, um, it is depressing to me to see that there is no minister to replace him for minister for the Middle East in the British government. Uh, it is uh, not really acceptable that the Middle East is now covered by a minister extending the scope of Africa and a minister extending the scope of Asia. Uh, I hope that the, the, the minister in response can give a positive response that the Prime Minister will appoint, as a matter of urgency, a minister for the Middle East. Uh, let me, I want to address the first element, which many noble lords have, have commented on, with regards to our arms. Uh, and our defence relationship with both Saudi and the UAE. Uh, any reader of the, the FCO website on gov.uk will see two articles. The first, which is the headline, Britain has been shaping the world for centuries, that won't change with Brexit, and the, immediately followed by, the Yemen crisis won't be solved by UK arms exports halt. Uh, not just the jarring visual element of looking at the British Foreign Office website, but when reading the articles, the Foreign Secretary, who I, who I commend for visiting the region and, and taking a, a strong personal interest for this and supporting the uh, Michael Aaron, our ambassador uh, for Yemen, based in Amman, um, and his excellent team who are doing very hard work, but the, the article by the Foreign Secretary said that the strategic relationship, and we means by that our arms and defence relationship, allows us the opportunity to influence their leaders, meaning Saudi Arabia and UAE. In his article, he said that if we stopped this relationship, then our position would be morally bankrupt and we would be bystanders. And, he, mean, and he, he gives the impression, in fact he states it, that Stockholm wouldn't have happened and we wouldn't have had the peace process. Now, I think that that's a very regrettable article that the Foreign Secretary has put, and it, it slightly undermines some of the humanitarian work that the, the UK is providing that area. And it does jar with, as we heard from Lord Haney, of the position of Germany and the United States Congress. And most objective people will consider that if countries buy over £5 billion of work from us, who is it that is providing the influence? Is it the seller or is it the buyer? And given the fact that there is questions as to the use, not just of the armament that we sell, but also the down-the-line impact, as Lord Alton had said, uh, of the training uh, and of the weapons and targeting training and the deeply ingrained relationship that we have, I think it is right for the committee, if not to say it explicitly, but certainly in my view, to ask for a serious and urgent reconsideration of our defence relationship given this conflict. My Lords, I also declare an interest that I'm, I chair the, the UK Board of Search for Common Ground, and it has worked in Yemen since 2010, with consistent and active programming throughout the conflict cycles, not only the last four years, but the last nine years. And Search has active <coughs> projects running across the seven different governorates in both north and south, covering stabilisation, countering a culture of violence, conflict sensitivity among the humanitarian sector, and trying to support the national peace process. And in addition to the UK government, the work there has been supported by diverse UN agencies, USAID, the Foreign Ministry of the Netherlands and France, among others, showing that it is an international uh, area where there is consistency. But it is also an international shame that this crisis is ha that can still exist in the 21st century. I do commend the, the UK, though, for its uh, government support and its humanitarian 
uh, delivery. And I would like to see the government moving, when it comes to its humanitarian support, moving beyond the do-no-harm approach to the humanitarian assistance and moving much more now into the development sphere. I've seen with the very many visits I made to northern Iraq uh, during the time when Mosul was occupied by ISIS that in insufficient consideration of good governance post-peace process work uh, means that those that have been most affected it will not be involved in the long-term reconstruction and rehabilitation of the communities. The other noble lords have mentioned the three-phase process of the UN uh, envoy. The phase one of the redeployment of forces, uh, forces for Hedida. Secondly, a prisoner exchange, which is complex because I understand that there are high-value prisoners from the Saudi side and prisoner exchange, as we know from the situation in Northern Ireland over many years, is a highly charged and problematic issue. But perhaps we have, some, we have some good lessons to offer when it comes to the second area on prisoner exchange. Uh, and the third of looking for a joint committee for TAIS, and which will hopefully meet soon to agree a peaceful way forward. But as the noble lady Baroness Amos and others have indicated, the confidence process, looking at incremental, incremental stages, if that does not create a degree of momentum, which can be buffeted from the wider political considerations of other partners, including Saudi Arabia and Iran, then it is hard to consider what would actually be progress. So it would be helpful if the Minister is able to, to say what are the areas of progress the Government would, would consider to be sufficiently robust to re reassure both sides that there can be move, movement to the next stage of the peace process. Uh, I think that it is worth putting on record the uh, good offices of the Omani and the Jordanian government. Uh, uh, but I also wish to return to the point that Baroness Enerly uh, and others have mentioned so powerfully. Uh, we have seen the negative impact, both in Iraq and in Libya, of processes uh, over recent years excluding women from the process. This is not an academic uh, element, nor is something where further research is needed. We know for a fact that the majority group have been excluded, and we know for a fact that those priest processes will be less robust because of that. It, even over the last week uh, in Amman, an event took place with no women participating, uh, contrary to the UN principles, as Baroness Cousins had indicated. And it may well be time that we do, from the UK, say to the United Nations, that an empty chair approach may be necessary until women are actively part of the process. Uh, as Mark Lowcock had indicated, uh, 24 million people need assistance. The, the population the size of London will be hungry tonight in that part of the region. And we consider that most of those victims will be women. Uh, it is simply not acceptable anymore in how we go about our diplomacy uh, and peace-building work, that women are considered to be a group that deserve to be consulted, but not to be participating. And I hope the Minister is able to say that our approach, uh, uh, looking for an opportunity before Ramadan, can start to see some urgency in the participation of women in this peace process. My Lords, I too would like to thank all members of the committee uh, for this excellent report and also to the noble Lord Lord Howe for his powerful introduction. And of course, since UN Resolution 2216, the UK alongside the US, France and others have consistently supported the war aims of the Saudi-led coalition and has continued to authorise the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia and its partners for use in the conflict. And as my noble friend, Lord Judge, uh, referred to the independent uh, Yemen data project. It is important to note what they uh, have analysed. 18,000 airstrikes on Yemen since the start of the conflict in April 2018 and found that roughly a third of uh, hit civilian targets, a third hit military targets, and a third hit targets of unknown designation. And a UN expert panel report released last September said that all sides of the, in the conflict may have committed uh, breaches of human, international humanitarian law. 
And as we've heard so powerfully in the debate, as a result of the conflict and the Saudi blockade, Yemen has been sinking deeper into a humanitarian crisis. And your Lordship's committee rightly concluded that the situation is unconscionable. My Lords, this side has called, long called for the uh, UK arms sales to Riyadh to be suspended uh, because of the evident evidence of breaches in international humanitarian law in the conflict. And the government argues that it is on the right side of IHL because the Saudi-led coalition's processes for investigating possible errors. And as the noble Lord, Lord Orton, reminded us, your Lordship's committee said the government is narrowly on the wrong side of the law. And of course, as we've heard from the Lord, Lord Howe, uh, in its conclusions, the likely uh, uh, it said its conclusions on the likelihood uh, of civilian casualties was based on the, the volume and type of arms being sold by the UK to Saudi Arabia. And of course, as we've heard, the UK has licensed 4.7 billion worth of arms to Saudi Arabia and 860 million to its coalition partners since the conflict. Uh, in Yemen commenced. And of course, we are the second largest exporter of arms to Saudi Arabia after the US. And of course, as we've heard, we're the fifth largest donor of humanitarian aid. This year, we've committed an additional £200 million worth of aid, bringing our total commitment to over £770 million since the conflict began. My Lords, it's this contradiction, as the noble Lord Lord Howe said, which the government must address as a matter of urgency. And I hope the noble Lord the Minister will respond specifically to noble Lord, uh, the noble Lord Lord Howe's question on this. Now, last Tuesday, uh, my right honourable friend Emily Thornbury, uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary, asked an urgent question in the other place following press reports at the weekend that members of uh, British Special Forces have been engaged in gun battles with the Houthi rebels in Yemen while providing support to coalition forces. Now, one disturbing thing about that uh, uh, report or allegation in the Mail on Sunday in particular was that our forces were providing support to locally recruited Saudi-funded militia and that many of the fighters, up to 40%, it was alleged, are children as young as 13 years old. Now, my lords, if these allegations were true, it would confirm that our forces are not just uh, a party to this conflict, but also witnesses to war crimes. Now, in response, Mark Field in the other place said he was keen to get to the bottom of these allegations, and in a subsequent letter uh, to Emily Thornbury on Friday, he wrote that we, the UK, have an ongoing defence engagement relationship with Saudi Arabia, which includes training courses, <laughs> advice and guidance. However, we are not a member of the uh, Saudi-led coalition and we do not have any role in coalition policy. He went on to say, we are committed to supporting the legitimate security needs of Saudi Arabia including defending itself against ballistic missiles fired by Houthis into civilian areas and guarding against the danger of regional escalation. To this end, UK personnel are involved in providing information, advice and assistance to Saudi Arabia on mitigating the threat from Houthi missiles, as well as assisting them in other areas, including on measures to support compliance with international humanitarian law. On child soldiers, he said the UK's position is categorical. And he went on to say, we raise all allegations of human rights abuses or violations of international humanitarian law, including the use of child soldiers, with all parties to the conflict in Yemen. We've been clear that all parties must comply with international humanitarian law. Well, can I ask the noble lord, and this was raised 
uh, in the committee, can I ask um, whether he or the government have been given evidence of breaches of international humanitarian law uh, by the Saudi co coalition from British sources? If we have been, how does he think we can meet our international treaty obligations? Surely we must act on such evidence. And the failure to do so, as we've heard in this debate, is something that we should all condemn. Now, as my noble friend Baroness Amos highlighted, and I too pay tribute to her work at the United Nations uh, on the humanitarian front, but she highlighted that we are all concerned at the fragility of the agreement reached in Stockholm. And certainly on this side, we welcome the steps that the government has made to the United Nations to bolster the team in Hodeida, uh, charged with overseeing that agreement. But can the noble lord, the minister, tell us what difference he expects that increased force to have on the ground? Are we shoring up uh, the peace as we hope we are? But I would conclude with this comment. As the noble lord, Lord Hannay, said, peace won't be won on the battlefield. We all want the Stockholm Agreement to succeed. But if it does not, and as a result we are back to square one in terms of ending the war and the humanitarian crisis, can the noble lord, the minister, tell us if the government will consider bringing forward a new United Nations resolution that requires a nationwide ceasefire with robust penalties against all parties who breach it. My Lords, may I firstly thank all noble Lords who have participated in this debate, and particularly to my noble friend Lord Howell for tabling this debate on the conflict in Yemen and for his long-standing commitment to the subject not just as Chair of the International Relations Committee, but his engagement and involvement in the field of foreign affairs. Let me assure you that the Government welcomes the Committee's report and thanks them for their detailed examination of the issue. And I'm particularly grateful that we've been able to have this particular debate in advance of the formal response from the Government. And as ever, I'm grateful for the insight and expertise that Noble Lords have provided. Let me assure Noble Lords that achieving progress in Yemen is a top priority for the UK. That is why my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, visited Yemen earlier this month, and I'm sure many Noble Lords acknowledge his shuttle dis diplomacy in this regard, and why he also attended the Stockholm Peace Talks in December, and why we're using our unique position, as the Noble Lord, Lord Hane, uh, reminded us with his deep insight into the United Nations as penholder of the UN Security Council to find a way to ending this devastating conflict. And I, as the Minister for the United Nations, acknowledge that important role that we have. However, before I go into the report itself, may I firstly address uh, and respond to the concerns which were raised by the noble Lord Collins, in particular with regards to the recent media reports which have been raised about the involvement of UK military personnel in Yemen and the use of child soldiers in conflict. I hope Noble Lords will recognise that I can't comment in detail on specific deployments, but I would like to clarify that a small number of British personnel are working in a liaison capacity in Saudi headquarters. They are not, as has been suggested by some, based in so-called command centres. British personnel have no role, and I re repeat what was said by my right honourable friend in the other place, in setting coalition policy or executing airstrikes in Yemen. The noble Lord, Lord Collins also raised the issue of child soldiers. Let me reassure the noble Lord about the priority the government gives to this. He will recall, no doubt, as other noble lords will, that when it comes to within the context of the United Nations, the special representative, Virginia Gamba's office, is actually funded by Her Majesty's government, and I continue to work very closely with the special representative on this particular issue. On the question of recruitment and use of child soldiers, let me assure the noble lord, indeed all noble lords, that our position is very clear and unequivocal. It is plain and simply unacceptable. We condemn it 
and I assure the noble Lord we are committed to ending it in all circumstances. If we have reports to this effect, we will continue to raise it quite vigorously with all parties concerned. Unfortunately, regrettably and tragically, this is not the first time we have heard reports of child soldiers being used in the Yemen conflict. The UN group of eminent experts found that the Houthis had also forcibly recruited children, some as young as tragically only eight years old, in schools and hospitals, and used them in combat and to plant explosive devices. We raise our concerns about this with all parties, as I've said, to the conflict in Yemen, and our officials have also raised the use of child soldiers. In particular, I can state this as Minister for Human Rights on the key issue at the last Universal Periodic Review of Yemen. Turning now to the specific recommendations uh, within the report and the arms export issue, which was raised by several noble lords, including Lord, my noble friend Lord Howe, Lord Hannay, the noble Lord Lord Alton, the noble Lady Baroness Cousins, as well as my noble friend Lord Jopling. Let me assure all noble lords that on arms exports, the government on this particular point does not accept the report's assertion that our actions are, and I quote, narrowly on the wrong side of the law. Let me assure noble lords that the UK will not export items if there is a clear risk they may be used in serious violation of international humanitarian law. As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, let me assure my noble friend Lord Jopling amongst others that all export license applications for Saudi Arabia are assessed rigorously on a case-by-case -case basis, using much fuller information than available to others. In addition, in answer to my noble friend Lord Howe, we have provided training and advice to support Saudi compliance with international humanitarian law. We also regularly raise the importance of compliance on this aspect directly with the Saudi Arabian government and other members of the coalition. My noble friend asked for particular tests and factors that we apply, and in the interest of time, I will also write to him specifically on this, but just to give him insight, our assessment does look at the situation in the round, and it's a forward-looking test. We include how the attitudes to compliance with international human humanitarian law, how the key principles of international humanitarian law, such as military necessity, distinction, and proportionality, are implemented, and how incidents of concern are investigated, and importantly, how those responsible are held to account, how lessons are and lessons are learned from this. The noble, my noble friend, will also be a fit aware that the Saudis themselves, in response, have set up the Joint Incident Assessment Team uh, on the 29th of February 2016, and the Saudi Arabian government has also publicly stated that it investigates its reports of alleged violations using this vehicle and acts on lessons learned. To share with noble lords, to date, the assessment team has made over 100 statements from its investigations. And let me assure noble lords once again that the UK government continues to review all arms exports and takes our arms export control responsibilities very seriously, and we remain confident that our arms exports are consistent with our licensing obligations. But I do make it absolutely clear, particularly to the noble lord, Lord Hannay, that we continue to raise these issues regularly and will continue to review all applications alongside this uh, particular criteria. Turning to the issue of humanitarian aid, I'm grateful for all noble lords who have raised the important role DFID and Her Majesty's Government are playing in this regard. And I share totally the sentiment of noble lords that this is a tragedy beyond scope. Anyone who has visited or reviewed or been involved with this particular situation in Yemen, the crisis that we see in front of us, children being deprived of vital food and medicine, is heart-rendering. And therefore, I am proud of the role that the United Kingdom government is playing in this respect. And let me assure the noble lady, Baroness Smith, that this remains a top priority for Her Majesty's government and the Foreign Office and will remain at the forefront of our priorities on the world stage. Notwithstanding what is happening in Brexit, the Foreign Secretary's recent engagement, I myself have recently yet again returned from the United Nations on important issues of peacekeeping and particularly the role of women, which I will come on to only last week. But this remains, notwithstanding domestic issues, I assure you, um, my travel schedule is probably reflective of that, that this will continue to remain a high priority on the world stage. As if I could turn to specific questions the noble lady raised about reassurances that aid is reaching those in need, she is quite right 
the statistics that are quoted on Hodeida and Salif is about the aid which is being delivered. But I fully acknowledge that there is a real challenge in the distribution of the aid within country. And that is something that the noble Lord, Lord Collins asked about additional support. That is why that additional support is going in. The UK has a zero tolerance policy to diversion policy of UK aid funds and all of the UK's government partners and programs are subject to rigorous and regular due diligence. But I fully admit that this remains a major challenge for all governments, not just the United Kingdom, and we will continue to work with all parties to ensure that. I know this was also a concern expressed by my noble friend Lord Jopling about uh, how we are assuring, uh, ensuring rather, the distribution of aid. Uh, at the moment, we are working very stringently with both the UN and NGO partners in ensuring that we get full reports of any delays in accessing necessary permits and agreements to deliver vital assistance. And I will continue to inform the House on a regular basis of how this situation is, pending, uh, is uh, unfolding. At the UN Yemen's pledging conference in February, we committed an additional 200 million pounds of support for the next financial year. The, <clears throat> the noble lady Baroness Amos asked about the distribution of this. This is going to be, under, uh, in terms of distribution, will start very shortly, but this will build upon the aid which already has been distributed from our previous year's commitment. As noble lords have acknowledged, this takes our overall commitment for the UK to Yemen to over 770 million pounds since the conflict began in 2015 and our support will continue to focus on life-saving aid to millions in the country where a staggering 80% of the population are now in need of direct humanitarian assistance. I pay tribute to the work of the noble lady Baroness Amos in this regard. She has deep insight and expertise, and I will continue to look to her insight and expertise as we continue to provide support and assistance on this program. As my noble friend Baroness Amy has also mentioned, the conflict in Yemen has first, further exacerbated the vulnerabilities faced by women and girls. It is unacceptable that the number of incidents of gender-based violence, for example, have reportedly risen by more than a staggering 60% since the start of the conflict. The UK supports issues, uh, supports fully women and girls across Yemen through our funding to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Organization for Migration. But my noble friend is absolutely right. Women have to be involved at the table, not some corner room, not some room in some remote part of a uh, conference center or hotel. They have to be present. And as the noble lady Baroness Amos rightly pointed out, they have been absent. This was a key area of focus at the Commission on the Status of Women recently at the United Nations where I represented and led the delegation and we are continuing to implore both parties and through the good offices of the Special Envoy to ensure that women play their rightful role at the heart and centre of conflict resolution. It is not an option, it is a necessity and we will play our part to try and make that happen. Let me also assure you that we are working with the Special Envoy Martin Griffiths and in acknowledging his work in this respect to ensure that his priorities in support of the initiatives we have already set up, such as those already acknowledged by Noble Lords, Lord, such as the Yemeni Women's Pact for Peace and Security, continue to be strengthened. We are also extremely concerned about the recent increase in cholera cases when it comes to humanitarian aid, and we are working very closely with all levels of the UN response, which is currently being scaled up to the 38 most effective districts in Yemen. Last year, the UK contributed 25% of the costs of the first ever cholera vaccin vaccination campaigns in Yemen through our funding to the Global Vaccines Alliance. And we will continue to prioritize these particular schemes as we support humanitarian efforts across the country. The committee re report also recommended a further UK contribution to the UN, including support for the UN verification and inspection mechanism, or the UNVIM, I can confirm that we will provide a further £1.3 million to UNVIM this year to support the work in facilitating commercial imports into Hodeida and the Salif ports. This will ensure that weapons are not being smuggled in on commercial ships. We have also deployed UK experts to Djibouti, Djibouti whose presence has increased the number of ship, ship inspections to more than tenfold. This has helped to stabilize the level of vital imports going into the ports of Hodeida and Salif, 
and in February, for example, total commercial and humanitarian imports into Yemen met 114 percent of the country's monthly food needs. But I totally acknowledge that distribution is a vital part of that. It's not just getting it through the ports. It's actually ensuring these are distributed. Noble Lords, uh, including the Noble Lord, Lord Lewis, my noble friend Baroness Ainley, and <coughs> the noble Lord, my noble friend Lord Jopling, raised the important issue about the political process. And we note that the committee called on the government to redouble our diplomatic efforts to achieve peace. Let me assure noble lords, we continue to believe, as all noble lords have rightly pointed out, including the noble lord Hannay in particular, that a political settlement is the only way to address the worsening situation, humanitarian crisis, and indeed bring about long-term stability to Yemen. Important progress has been made in this regard. The December talks in Stockholm were a landmark point, the first time that parties have come together in over two years, and I think the coming together of those parties can't be underestimated. The ceasefire in Hodeida has largely held. Challenges still remain, but this has led to a significant reduction in military activity across the government. And let me assure, uh, Noble Lords, that we continue to engage with all parties. The Noble Lord, Lord Waverley, raised the issue of keeping dialogue open, not just with uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but also with other parties, including the Houthis, but also with Iran directly. And I would stress this point, that Her Majesty's Government continues to engage in relationships across the peace to ensure all parties to this conflict are engaged and play their part in bringing a resolution to this conflict. I also assure noble lords there has been sustained British diplomatic effort in support of the political process at both ministerial and senior official levels, including urging parties to refrain from provocative action in Hodeida and maintain the ceasefire. The noble lord, Lord Alton, rightly raised the issues that we are seeing unfolding in front of us in terms of the humanitarian crisis. But let me assure the noble lord that it is our diplomatic efforts are beginning to pay dividends. It is vulnerable, it is still very fragile, but I think we are encouraged by recent steps that have been taken, at least with the increase in humanitarian aid on the ground in Yemen itself. On visits to the region this year, my right honourable friends, the Foreign Secretary, and indeed the former Minister for the Middle East and North Africa, my good friend and former colleague in government, the Right Honourable Alistair Burt. And if I may, I join the tributes that have been made from across this House and elsewhere about the unstinting work, the focus and dedication uh, and real application and expert knowledge that my Right Honourable French has shown in his uh, discharging of his duties. He is a colleague, he is a friend, he will be sorely missed as someone who leads on several initiatives uh, within the Middle East. His expertise and insight were vital, and I hope in the near future, whatever prevails in the future, we will see my right honourable friend return to the government benches yeah. as well. Uh, let me assure noble lords, and in particular the noble lord Hane, whose insights I always welcome on the United Nations, we do continue to use our seat at the UN Security Council to uh, good effect. Indeed, the recent uh, proposals that we put forward following the Stockholm agreements in giving mandate to establish you in mission in support of Hodeida's agreement. Our work at the Security Council itself in terms of resolutions has galvanized international support and it was no small feat to get unanimity behind those particular resolutions. Let me assure noble lords that the government has also very carefully considered the committee's recommendation raised by my noble friend Baroness Amy, the noble lord Lord Hane and my noble friend Lord Hal about the committee's recommendation to appoint a London-based special representative on Yemen. I would suggest that at the current time, in light of my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary's personal efforts to advance peace in Yemen, it has currently been decided against making such an appointment. However, we will keep this situation under continual review. Uh, the noble lady Baroness Cousins asked about the government's position on southern inclusion. The issue of governance arrangements for southern Yemen is ultimately a question for the Yemeni people, but let me assure the noble lady that the UK's position on southern inclusion is clear. Their voice must be heard in order to ensure lasting peace in Yemen, and the UN Special Envoy has publicly acknowledged this important role, and he has advised in his office to help support the work to include all southern groups, including, as she right rightly noted, the SDC. My Lords, I would conclude by saying that I am extremely grateful to all noble lords for their contribution. The noble Lord Judd 
portrayed his perspectives. He's someone who I know believes strongly in the attributes of the United Nations, and I've listened very carefully to his words. The uh, sentiments that have been raised over issues of arms sales, I assure noble lords we take this very seriously. And therefore, I do believe very strongly that the committee's report is both timely but also very important. And we will certainly take note of the contributions during the course of this debate to ensure they are also reflected in the formal government response. But I do wish to say this as a final point, that I assure noble lords that the UK is doing all we can to help bring parties to the table, to help sustain the delivery of humanitarian aid and fuel aid into Yemen and ultimately find a way to end this devastating conflict. We are at the forefront of diplomatic efforts, including at the UN Security Council, as I know from direct experience. We wish to find a political solution to this conflict, and we are also leading on the humanitarian response. We are also, let me assure all noble lords and indeed everyone across the, uh, this House and the other place that we are putting our full weight behind the work, and I pay tribute to the work of our Special Envoy Martin Griffiths, the UN Special Envoy, and the UN-led peace process, and we are in constant engagement with him to ensure that our efforts are aligned, and we will continue to show leadership as part of international efforts to attend this appalling conflict, an appalling conflict that has gone on for far too long and has caused suffering to millions. My Lords, it remains for me to uh, express a warm gratitude to all those who have taken part in this short debate um, and uh, express gratitude to the Minister for his summing up his usual skilled handling of what is undoubtedly a difficult situation full of very grave dilemmas and indeed tragedies. I think we've all, several of us, expressed sorrow that uh, Alistair Burt has gone. This does seem to happen rather often nowadays, but um, <laughs> uh, no doubt he'll return. Um, also, all of the members of my committee, who I, I not, not only just for their speeches, but also for their enormous expertise and experience, which quite often outtrumps some of the experts sent to brief us, uh, and that requires careful handling at times. Um, also, I'm particularly grateful that um, Baroness, Noble Baroness Amos was able to join us today. We all admire enormously what she has done at the United Nations. Uh, I I've always admire Lord Judd's remarks on world arms situation, and he gave them today. We got a very sharp, devastating precision from uh, Lord Alton and Noble Lord, Lord Waverley, um, which was added to the spice of our debate. I think it was Lord Luce, finally, who said that uh, the bigger issue behind all this, the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, the Sunni-Shia rivalry, the thousands of tribes fighting against each other, all create an impossible context. I think, finally, my Lord, it was President Obama who once observed that he'd been briefed that everything in the Middle East um, relates to everything else. Uh, the whole thing is a gigantic connected puzzle of difficulty and tragedy and trauma. We can't solve all this, but I think the message from this afternoon to the Minister, if I may say so, is perfectly clear that the position needs constant and rigorous attention not to get out of balance. It is not quite right in the public view. There are horrors and dangers here. We're doing our best to meet the horrors, but are we doing our best on the political and on the strategic geopolitical side and on the trade side to just make sure that this conflict doesn't burn up into a really horrific horror in the Middle East, which it might yet do. So thank you. I thank again to all involved. Um, I beg to move. The question is, this motion will be agreed to. As many as of that opinion will say content, the contrary not content, the contents have it. Lord Chair, if you are. <coughs> my Lords, I, I beg to uh, move the motion standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Committee's report on Erasmus and Horizon was published on the 12th of February, and so it has not yet received an official government response. Nonetheless, due to the interest and indeed concern among the public and in this House, about the potential impact of Brexit on participants in the Erasmus and Horizon programmes and on the UK's research and education sectors. I hope members of the House will understand why the Committee wanted to bring this report to the House for debate now. The report was drafted following the agreement by negotiators of the Withdrawal Agreement and Political Declaration 
in the closing weeks of last year. It therefore considers the implications for UK participation in Erasmus and Horizon of leaving the EU under the terms of the withdrawal agreement compared to a no-deal scenario. My Lords, despite the turmoil at the other end of the palace at the moment, the withdrawal agreement remains the only negotiated deal on the table, and the Prime Minister has certainly shown tenacity in sticking with it. And the inquiry found that if the withdrawal agreement, or one with similar provisions as regards UK participation in EU programmes, were to be ratified, our involvement in Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 could continue largely unchanged until both programmes draw to a close at the end of 2020. An encouraging conclusion, though, my Lords, the end of 2020 is alarmingly close. In a no-deal scenario, which cannot, alas, be ruled out, the situation would be much trickier. At the time our report came out, the Government had said it wanted to preserve access to both programmes and had issued a guarantee to underwrite funding for UK participants until the end of 2020. This guarantee was, however, contingent on the EU agreeing to continued UK participation as a third country. And it was also unclear how the Government intended this guarantee to operate in practice. Since that time, the EU has pressed forward with its own no-deal contingency plans. For Erasmus, the EU has agreed that Erasmus Plus placements active at the point of a no-deal Brexit can continue up to a maximum of 12 months. Again, it is unclear how this would be administered and what advice and support is being offered to UK Erasmus participants. There is no equivalent contingency measure for Horizon 2020. The, UK, the EU has, however, published a proposal to maintain the UK's eligibility to receive funding from EU programmes uh, for agreements entered into before the withdrawal date in a no-deal scenario. If adopted, this proposal should ensure that UK research projects, including those funded by schemes like the European Research Council and Mary Stodowska Curie Actions, which are not open to third countries, could continue to be financed in 2019. This is subject to the condition that the UK commits to contribute to the financing of the EU 2019 budget and agrees to EU controls and audit requirements. And I should be grateful if the Minister would confirm that the Government does indeed intend to fulfil these conditions and so avoid disruption for UK beneficiaries of EU spending programmes in a no-deal scenario. And I'd be grateful if the Minister could also confirm how such a system would be administered. My Lords, whatever the terms of the UK's withdrawal from the EU, it is in our mutual interest to preserve current close levels of UK-EU cooperation on research and innovation in providing opportunities for young people and teachers to study, work and train abroad. The inquiry found, no surprise perhaps, that the UK is a respected and important partner in the Erasmus and Horizon programmes. It's a popular destination for students from the EU and a world leader in research with an exceptionally strong science base. <clears throat> it is clear, however, that the benefits of UK participation in these programmes do not only flow one way and that their value cannot be measured simply in financial terms. The inquiry received 50 evidence submissions as well as oral testimony and witnesses were unanimously positive about the impact of Erasmus and Horizon on the United Kingdom. My Lords, in the first two years of the current programme, Erasmus Plus supported nearly 5,000 UK projects and 128,000 UK participants took part in internal exchanges. Although best known as a mobility programme for university students, Erasmus Plus also supports study, work and trading programmes and training placements in vocational education and training adult education and schools. Witnesses to the inquiry 
called Erasmus, and I quote, an overwhelming force for good and one of the most important achievements of the U European Union. Yeah. For participants, going on an Erasmus placement leads to better employment outcomes, increased confidence and independent thinking and greater cultural awareness. And there are also wider positive implications for the UK, including tangible economic benefits from international students and higher standards of education resulting from international collaboration, shared innovations and best practice. Equally important, my Lords, Erasmus helps to increase opportunities for people from disadvantaged or underrepresented groups. Time and again throughout the inquiry, we heard how much they gain from outward student mobility and how much they would lose if the UK loses access to Erasmus as a result of Brexit. As for Horizon 2020, the UK has been the second most successful country in terms of funding received and the most successful in terms of participant and coordinator numbers. According to statistics published just last week, the UK was the most successful country in the most recent funding round of the European Research Council, with 47 out of a total 222 projects to be hosted by UK institutions. And the UK's research community does not just benefit financially from participation in Horizon 2020. As the largest multilateral international research programme in the world, Horizon 2020 provides a platform for international research collaboration, providing access to large-scale research infrastructure and facilities and supporting the mobility of the most talented researchers across Europe. And Horizon adds value in other areas too. For example, the prestigious reputation of EU research programmes helps to attract the best staff from around the world to UK research institutions, and the critical mass and strategic coordination of research across Europe has increased efficiency and reduced duplication. Being part of Horizon and its predecessors has, my Lords, been pivotal, pivotal in raising the standard of research in the UK and developing the thriving science and research community we enjoy today. Given the strength of the evidence the inquiry received on the importance of the Erasmus and Horizon programmes to the UK, it is unsurprising that the committee concluded that the UK should make every effort to remain involved in these programmes. Fortunately, this is, in theory at least, a perfectly feasible option. Negotiations are underway on the successor programmes to Erasmus Plus and Horizon 20, Erasmus and Horizon uh, Europe, which will run from 2021 to 2027, and the draft regulations for both provide for full or partial third country access to these programmes. The committee concluded that to preserve current levels, current close levels of cooperation on research and innovation and educational mobility, the UK should seek full access to the Erasmus and Horizon Europe programmes as an associated third country. This would, of course, mean making financial contributions to the programme budgets. But the committee concluded that this would be an essential investment to maintain UK access to all Erasmus and Horizon funding streams and international collaboration opportunities that raise the standard of education and support excellent science in the UK. Associate membership would not give the UK voting rights on the budget and strategic direction of these programmes, but the committee were reassured that the strength of the UK's science base would ensure the UK remains an influential player in European research and innovation. Association is also the only option that would allow the UK to access the key European Research Council and Mary Sadowska Curie schemes, which currently account for 44% of total UK receipts from Horizon 2020. My Lord, if the Government is not willing or is not able to secure association to these programmes, the Committee concluded that alternative UK funding schemes would be needed. However, it would be a formidable and a risky challenge to try to replicate at a national level the substantial benefits that participation 
and Erasmus and Horizon bring to the UK. Happily, my lords, statements made by the UK government and EU institutions in recent months indicate that both sides want a close future relationship in the areas of science and innovation, youth, culture and education, and we welcome this. It is not possible to begin negotiations on association agreement to the 2021 to 2027 Erasmus and Horizon Europe programmes while they are under negotiation and while the UK is still a member state. But our report calls on the government to confirm as soon as possible that it intends to seek association. This will maximise certainty and stability for UK students and researchers and enable them to plan for any changes. I hope that the noble Lord, the Minister, will be able to give this assurance. And in this context, I would be grateful if the Minister would comment too on the written statement made to this House on the 26th of March by the noble Lord, Lord Henley, on the Adrian Smith Review and the implications of that review for future UK association to Horizon Europe. My Lords, Erasmus provides huge benefits to the next generation of British citizens. Horizon supports the excellence of research in our universities. We simply must, in our and the wider European interest, maintain as close cooperation as we can in both Erasmus and Horizon in the future. I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. My Lords, I won't rehearse the many benefits of the UK's participation in the Horizon and Erasmus programmes. Lord Jay has already done that admirably, and they're set out in detail in his committee's report. I will simply say this. They've been very successful programmes in which the UK has played a hugely important part. There can be no doubt that our participation in these programmes has been beneficial to the UK and to UK universities and colleges and others, and I know the Minister won't demur. Of course, I support the recommendation of the European Union Committee that we should seek to remain part of them in future. But, my Lords, I want to focus today on the possibility that we may leave the EU without a deal on the 12th of April. It may be that by the end of this week we can rule out what I believe to be an awful prospect. But it still clearly remains possible. Some would even say likely. And this House must use its influence to press the Government to do all it possibly can to prepare to mitigate the consequences of that outcome. (coughs) My Lords, just three weeks ago, I asked a question about the continued funding of these two programmes. I was supported across the House, but I received no reassurance from the Noble Lord, the Minister. He referred to the Spring Statement, but that didn't give any answers either, and I followed it up with a written question. So I make no apologies for trying again. I'm going to use my intervention to ask the Minister to answer four extremely important pressing and specific questions relating to both the Horizon and Erasmus programmes. My first question is, will the Government commit to providing funding for a UK alternative to the European Research Council and Marie Curie grants in 2019 and 2020 if we can't take part in those schemes following a no-deal Brexit? No such commitment has yet been given. If we're shut out of these elements of the Horizon programme, the UK research system will lose over a billion pounds compared to what we might have expected to win if we'd remained eligible. This would be a significant cut, and there'd be no time to prepare. Many research stars who will already have prepared applications may just decide to go elsewhere in Europe to ensure they can still draw on these prestigious grants. Will the Minister use his influence with his colleague, the Right Honourable Damon Hines MP, to urge the Treasury to ensure they don't allow this to happen? My second question. Can the Minister tell the House what will happen to researchers who are in the middle of grant preparation process with the European Commission or European Research Council if the EU leaves if the UK leaves the EU without a deal? Will these so called in flight applications be covered? by the government's financial underwrite. Question three. Will the government commit to funding opportunities for UK students to study abroad in 2019 and 2020 if we cannot continue to be part of the Erasmus scheme? Students expecting to go abroad in 2019 will have already made plans. 
about 17,000 UK students would have been expecting to call on an Erasmus grant funding to support their studies abroad. They are now in limbo. Will the government commit to fund a UK alternative scheme for these students if we are frozen out of Erasmus? And my final question. Will the Minister please confirm what will be the fee status of EU students who want to study in the UK beginning their courses in 2020? The recruitment cycle is now well underway and we still don't know what universities should tell prospective EU students. And this, my Lords, is for the Government to decide because it's a matter of law. It's likely that EU student recruitment will be hit because of Brexit. The UK Government risks making this worse by refusing to state, one way or another, what the status of EU students will be and whether they will pay home or international fees. Mm. My Lords, these are just four of the many hundreds of questions that universities and their representative bodies, including Universities UK, have been asking government. They're questions to which only government can provide an answer, unlike many other areas of uncertainty which are dependent on negotiations with the EU. Together, they represent four areas in which the UK risks inflicting further and unnecessary damage on our universities and research system over and above what would follow from a no-deal exit, which may be outside the government's control. Where my questions relate to financial issues, I want to spell something out. Government has committed to providing funding via the EU to allow UK universities to participate in Erasmus and Horizon if there is a deal. In the no-deal scenario, in which money wouldn't pass from the UK to Brussels but would remain in the UK, the government could decide to use it for the same purpose. In short, my Lords, the Government appear to be willing to pay for the ERC and Erasmus if there is a deal, but will use that money for something else if there is no deal. My Lords, that can't be right. Taking back control shouldn't mean inflicting further unnecessary economic damage on ourselves. My Lords, I wasn't able to give the Minister these questions in advance, which I would have liked to do, and I doubt he'll be able to answer all of them although I know that they've been much debated in Whitehall. So I urge him to commit to returning to this House with answers as soon as he can do so, and certainly before the 12th of April, if that really does look like it will be the day of our departure. My Lords, I promise to stop asking the questions if we get some answers. My Lords, I'm grateful to the noble Lord, Lord Jay, for enabling this debate but also for chairing our committee, uh, the committee of which I'm a member, um, this inquiry into another range of issues which need to be urgently addressed if they are not to be disrupted by the Brexit process. This would be with great loss to UK students and universities, but also great loss to the UK, whether financial, reputational or economic. These are two huge success stories in terms of EU achievements and UK participation. Erasmus, in terms of mobility of studies, benefits for individuals in gaining skills and jobs, to universities in the establishment of international bases for courses, but also opportunities for students from disadvantaged backgrounds with disabilities or special needs. Horizon 2020, with major contributions to research and innovation in the UK, but also enhancing the UK's reputation on an international stage, enabling access to world-class research facilities and attracting top-class academic experts and researchers to the UK and UK institutions. Erasmus Plus and its predecessor uh, is particularly of interest to me as I'm, I'm a former language teacher and um, I do believe it's best known for the international opportunities to study really for HE students, particularly in terms of foreign language learning, understanding and appreciation of diverse cultures, acquisition of globally recognised skills and learning, and the gaining of successful employment and future opportunities. However, it also provides opportunities to work and study abroad for a whole range of other participants, including college students and adult learners who may be in full or part-time study, students from disadvantaged backgrounds, many of whom may never have travelled further than from their own town, 
and, and certainly as a teacher I encountered very many of those young people who lacked so much in uh, having their, opportunity, their, their horizons widened. And I think in the report there's an example of a young woman uh, from a, a, a college who had spent time in Seville and went on to be student of the year at her college. Students with disabilities or learning difficulties too, it's important to point out that the next multi-annual financial framework from 21 to 27 um, has proposals for major investment in greater participation of these students. Equally, pupils in, in schools or youth work schemes um, have been funded by Erasmus+. Plus. An example is the report um, uh, instance of a, a partnership working with youth groups in Northern Ireland, rebuilding relationships within that community, following the troubles there. No other project has offered such flexible funded opportunities to these students, who would lose out significantly should there be any downgrading of the UK's commitment to Erasmus. Although our witnesses welcomed the commitment by government to underwrite uh, the funding for successful bids to EU programmes. If the UK leaves without a deal, as the noble Baroness Lady Warwick has just told us, there will be great concern expressed, without exception, for the likely impact of both programmes of this happening. The consequences are well documented in the report, but are range from complete disruption in the failure of a in the event of a failure to agree terms with the EU for UK organisations to continue to participate. Potentially students ending schemes early, going home, resulting in the need for universities to review and perhaps discontinue courses at short notice with subsequent lack of jobs, and followed by measures to limit spending on projects at short notice. <clears throat> this could result in a lack of confidence in UK educational institutions, which will take many years to recover in terms of reputations in the international context. The report recommends that the government should urgently clarify how it intends to, how it tends to uh, operate the underwrite guarantee and to minimise disruption for UK participants changing into a new system. The withdrawal agreement, as has been said by the Noble Lord, Lord Jay, does offer a, a better hope for the, the programme to continue to 2020, but as he said, 2020 is getting very close. And as he said too, all our witnesses were convinced that the only way forward was in a full partnership association with both projects. Third country status would limit greatly the UK's ability to influence the Erasmus programme strategically, although we were reassured that the meetings operate collaboratively and all countries are treated as valued partners. As a third country, the UK would only have observer status in the Horizon Europe programme and would have no strategic influence again on the direction of the programme. My Lord, the witnesses we heard were all extremely concerned concerned that both the immediate and longer term future involvement of the UK of these two highly successful projects is at risk in the light of current circumstances. The government's assurances of support are welcome, but as yet unspecified and without details, so that existing participants in these schemes are unclear as to how they are to continue. The next cycle is about to be finalised with even greater resource investment planned for the next six years. And yet again, the UK's position is far from clear. So I too would like to leave some questions for the Minister. What progress is made in settling the terms for UK organisations to continue to participate in Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 projects as, a th as third country entities following exit from the EU? Will the government clarify the terms of the underwrite guarantee in saying how payments will be made and by whom, and also what terms and conditions will apply for organisations to benefit? What actions has the government taken with regard to UK involvement as a closely associated third party partner in the proposals for 2021-2027? 
I do hope that the uh, Minister will be able to give us some replies to these questions. And again, if these need to be in written form, that would also be helpful too. But these are two of the most successful, high prestige, high profile projects. The UK has participated, has gained great reputational value, and has shown the excellence of our own educational and research institutions in this country. I very much hope we are going to hear a firm commitment that they should continue. <coughs> this is getting to be a debate with a single message coming through to the Minister. Um, I think this is a compelling report. Um, I declare an interest in being a member of Lord Jay's subcommittee uh, and pay tribute to his chairmanship, but it's a very clear statement of a complex set of issues with a great deal of compelling evidence to my mind. And it demonstrates, as Baroness Yanka just said, that these are two of the most successful EU programmes and two from which the UK has derived enormous benefit and has had real impact on the lives of many thousands of young people down the years, including, incidentally, my two children, and also um, enabling the British university sector to establish its unrivaled international networks and countless projects that probably wouldn't have been funded uh, without uh, Horizon 2020. It would be a disaster if access to all this were to be cut off or seriously reduced. Just as both these programmes are expanding enormously for the 21 to 27 period. As others have said, at least if the withdrawal agreement is agreed, there is a breathing space until the end of the transition period, the end of 2020, which is very short, but is better than nothing. But I am much more concerned about what happens in the event of a no deal, which certainly is not impossible if the gridlock in the House of Commons continues until the 12th of April. Let me just take in turn each of the programmes very briefly. On Horizon Europe, clearly there would be a diminished British role even in the event that we had a transition and negotiated an association agreement. Um, I remind noble lords that uh, the UK has been, as our report says, disproportionately successful in winning grants uh, under the Horizon Scheme, uh, with over 15% of the total. And there will be financial rebalancing arrangements in the future programme, which will ensure that the UK can no longer be a net beneficiary. We will basically uh, take out more or less what we put in. And so there is going to be a shortfall even in the event of an association agreement, because Britain will no longer be a net beneficiary um, for the very large sums of money available under Horizon. No deal presents a real systemic risk, from what I hear from universities I have contact with, to the international networks that they've built up. Partly because if we cease brutally to be a member of the European Union, that will pose problems in many projects where uh, the quota of required members, numbers of members of the European Union uh, may well uh, make it impossible for us to continue. And the international nature of our university sector uh, comes out in everything uh, one reads from university leaders. Um, I quote from the uh, President's address at UCL, President Gast recently, we are international. Our international community, our collaborations, our partnerships and our own experiences in other cultures and places have had an immeasurable and profound effect on the world. Uh, Professor Gast is right, um, and um, Horizon has been a vital part of that. So I would be interested, perhaps this question has already been asked in other ways to the Minister, are there plans to make good the funding gap that would arise even in the case of a withdrawal agreement, given that we shall be getting less back from uh, Horizon in those circumstances than we put in. I understand in the case of a no deal uh, that the Commission's guidance is that there will be no new financial commitments to UK applicants in the event of, uh, of that situation. 
Um, they will continue funding, as Lord Jay said, provided we continue to pay into the budget for 2019, but nothing beyond there. And the evidence in our report is that uncertainty is already casting a shadow over the willingness of uh, researchers around the EU to collaborate with British partners in these circumstances. I wonder if the Minister could tell us what contingency work is going on to make sure that vital projects can continue after the end of 2019, even in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Um, and then it's in Erasmus where the human cost of the current uncertainty is, I think, most clear. As Baroness Janka said, 17,000 young people are preparing for the exciting opportunity to go abroad under Erasmus in September of this year. The Commission have said in their guidance that students and trainees abroad participating in Erasmus at the time of the UK's withdrawal can complete their studies and continue to receive their grants, unquote. But that's as far as clarity goes. Um, and many noble lords will have seen articles in the media about the problems that that is already causing for young people trying to make plans uh, for September this year, including one le young lady who told The Guardian that she'd been advised to take £1,200 in cash when she went in September, just in case there were problems with the grants and the funding. Well, that certainly is going to exclude disadvantaged people from mm. even thinking about taking up an Erasmus opportunity in those circumstances. There is also the impact on the UK universities of um, reluctance on the part of EU students to commit to coming here uh, in September. I see that both Spain and Norway are now advising their students to look elsewhere rather than the UK. Um, I wonder if there is any data on the fallout uh, for British universities yet of declining Erasmus applications for this coming year because I think it could be important. A university that I particularly have a link with is University of Kent, uh, the UK's European university with a wonderful network of four campuses in Europe. Um, they send a large number of students across Europe and of course they receive a lot as well and I'm sure many others are in the same position. These universities really do change the lives of young people using the Erasmus program. Um, I think to put any substitute in place of bilateral links is going to take a lot of time, consume a lot of resources, um, and in the end mean that a lot of young people can't travel and take those opportunities. Uh, in my view, my lords, we must not jeopardise what has been achieved under these schemes. Yeah. My Lords, it's a very great pleasure to be able to follow the noble Lord, Lord Ricketts, but sadly I cannot, uh, as he did, declare an interest as a member of the committee, because when I had the temerity to vote for some amendments last year on the European Withdrawal Bill, I was uh, dismissed from the committee uh, for uh, failing to support the government. Had, in fact, the government listened a little more carefully to some of the amendments we passed in your Lordship's House, we might not be in the predicament we are at the moment. But um, sufficient for that, this is a very good report. And I pay tribute to the noble Lord, Lord Jay, and his colleagues for producing it. It is a forensic analysis of a very difficult situation and a potentially disastrous one. The noble baroness, uh, uh, Lady, uh, Lady Warwick of Undercliffe, talked about the problems if there is no deal. My lords, I would like every one of those members of your lordship's house, there are not many in this house, and every one of the ERG and others in the other place, who have said they don't mind no deal, or some have even said that they would relish no deal, I would like them all to be locked in a room, instructed to read this report, and then to go out of the room and meet 20 or 30 students. In the case of the other place, students who are their constituents. Because, my lords, this does deal a potentially devastating blow to many young people. I speak as the grandfather of two uh, 
university students, one a postgraduate, the other an undergraduate, both of whom are attracted by the possibility of continuing work and research in other countries. And my lords, of course, I fervently hope that when we come out, we will be able to continue to take advantage. But I take no comfort from those words until 2020. My lords, that is not good enough. We have got to come to an arrangement with our friends and neighbours so that we can participate as closely as possible for a non-member state from 2021 to 2027 and beyond. My lords, uh, the great Erasmus himself personified one of the fundamentals of civilized truth. Learning knows no boundaries. And if you prevent or do not assist young people to know other countries as well as their own, you are depriving them. And my lords, the Erasmus programme has at least one unique feature in that it gives enhanced grants to the disadvantaged and the disabled. And that is something which I think it has every reason to be proud of. And of course that is very much in the tradition of Erasmus and his time when all the great institutions of this country and most of those on continent, in continental Europe particularly gave of their learning to uh, young men, they all were in those days I'm afraid, but young men who did not have the advantage of a wealthy background. Much of that learning was given in church institutions, but our own colleges in Oxford and Cambridge and in the Scottish universities very much kept to that tradition. And it's something that we should not contemplate separating ourselves from. And as far as the uh, horizon 2020 is concerned, this is enormously exciting and invigorating and the continuation from 2021 to 2027 will be as well. And my lords, I just would beg those in government to make sure, and I address these remarks particularly to my noble friend, and he is my friend, on the front bench, for whom I have very real affection and regard. Please talk to your colleagues in government, I would say to him, because we really do have a duty to our young people and to those pioneers in research and learning in our country of whatever age to continue to collaborate in the best possible way with our European friends and neighbours. And 2020 is not a satisfactory answer. I accept that we are leaving the European Union. I accept it with regret. I would have voted for the Prime Minister's deal last week, and I made that point plain in this House on a number of occasions, and it would indeed have brought with it some safeguards. But whatever replaces it has got to bring safeguards. And we would be delivering a real blow to the future prospects and hopes and aspirations of our young people if we turned our back on programs of this nature. We must participate in association even as a third country. But, my lords, I was struck by two paragraphs in particular. Uh, paragraph 13 on page 56, uh, where 
It says as a non-associated third country, the UK would not even have a seat at the table in Erasmus programme committees. And paragraph 19, as an associated third country, the UK would have observer status in Horizon Europe programmes, but no vote. And all that isn't good enough. We've got to get it better. I'm delighted to be able to speak in this debate and to follow the noble Lord, Lord Cormac, who has stood up for what he believes in on European questions over the last months and years, and, as he made clear, to the detriment of his own position on a committee in your Lordship's House. Unlike many speakers in this debate, my interest to declare is not being a member of your Lordship's European Affairs Committee, but I do have an interest to declare. As an academic at Cambridge University, reader in European politics, I am actively involved in a whole range of European-funded projects. Horizon 2020 projects, Erasmus Plus projects, and slightly more tangentially, a network on the Marie Curie um, program. My Lords, I am not unusual in this. Academics in the United Kingdom, as we've already heard, have benefited more than most from the European funding schemes. The United Kingdom has been a significant net beneficiary of EU research and higher education funding. The UK has always had a rather utilitarian approach to understanding the nature of the European Union. Margaret Thatcher never fully understood that participating in the European community as it then was wasn't simply about putting money in and getting the same amount of money out. It was about participating in networks, participating in a whole range of policies. But in the area of research, the United Kingdom actually did have a very good story to tell because the UK research and development is of the highest standard our universities are some of the best in the world. And our partners right across the European Union have been very keen to collaborate with the United Kingdom. Various institutions across the UK have been significant net beneficiaries. Now, my Lords, this might seem as if it's going to be a speech that simply says, oh, woe is me, as an academic who has benefited from EU funding I might be going to lose that. And certainly during the referendum, there was a lot of suspicion among those who were advocating Brexit that somehow anyone that was advocating membership, ongoing membership of the European Union, somehow had a naked self-interest in membership of the European Union. Anyone that was a beneficiary of EU grant funding was somehow viewed as having an interest that was a purely personal interest and therefore wasn't one that should contribute more generally to the debate. But my Lords, during the last few days, inevitably there have been letters from the Universities UK and also from the Royal Society stressing the importance of European research collaboration not just for the individual, but for the wider community, for the research communities, but, my Lords, also for society as a whole. Because while my research might be about social sciences, and perhaps, therefore, not of the blue skies thinking that research in medicine or other hard sciences might be, for others, for many of those who benefit from funding from the European Research Council, and other parts of Horizon 2020 funding. It is about global leadership. And as the President of the Royal Society, Venki Ramakrishnan, has stated, the UK is a global leader in science because top homegrown and international scientists want to work here. We must do everything we can to ensure that the UK maintains its role at the heart of European science because that is in everyone's interests everyone's best interests. If science loses, everyone loses. My Lords, this isn't just about the individuals concerned. It is about British scientific research. It isn't just about funding. It's about collaborative networks, as other noble Lords have made clear. 
if you are a, a, theor a theoretician, your research might be done sitting at your computer on your own in isolation. But for most research scientists, research is done in collaborative groups where the tools of that research are very costly. Working together on a transnational basis is going to be far more effective than working in isolation. My Lords, by leaving the European Union, the danger is that the United Kingdom is going to cut itself off from some of those key networks. Already, European, key leading European scientists have begun to leave the United Kingdom. They've decided that they would rather hold grants in other European countries because the uncertainty of Brexit means they're no longer sure that they will be welcome in the United Kingdom. So, my Lords, the United Kingdom has already lost before we even leave the European Union. But if we leave the European Union with no deal, this raises huge questions about our ongoing relationship with research funding bodies and collaborative networks across the European Union. My Lords, we've already heard that if we have a third country status, we won't have a seat at the table. We won't have any opportunity to influence research funding priorities. As the noble Lord, Lord Cormac, has already made clear, that is clearly not desirable. My Lords, the committee's report is very clear that it would be better to have an associated status if we're going to be outside the European Union. That will at least give us a seat at the table, but we still won't have a vote. It is clearly a suboptimal position to be in. My Lords, the report also suggests that if the UK is to leave the European Union with no deal, we should have a UK mobility fund. My Lords, that is so far a second best that I would hope we never have to work on that recommendation. My Lords, it is essential that the government looks for finding a deal that is going to leave the United Kingdom able to participate as fully as any third country can, as an associated third country. My Lords, I looked round the chamber earlier in the hope of seeing a Brexiteer who might be listening to this debate because during the referendum, we were reminded on countless occasions, usually by the noble Lord, Lord Forsyth, who's not in his place, that you don't, it's not necessary to be part of the European Union to be part of Erasmus. My Lords, it isn't necessary to be part of the European Union. But if we're a non-associated third country, our ability to participate in such schemes is very, very weakened. My Lords, we need to find ways to be associated. Can the Minister tell us that the Government is trying to achieve that? My Lords, I welcome this report from the EU Committee and in my contribution to the debate will highlight the importance of the Erasmus Plus programme in particular to the teaching, learning and use of foreign languages in the UK. The Committee did touch on the benefits for languages and I'll enlarge on this a little more because, like other noble lords, I'm hoping that tonight we will finally get to hear some clear and specific news from the noble Viscount, the Minister, which takes us further than we've heard in answers to questions that I and many others have raised repeatedly over the past couple of years about what happens after the end of 2020. My Lords, several recent reports have been published from a wide range of bodies, including the British Academy, the British Council, and the All-Party Group on Modern Languages, of which I am co-chair. And all of them show that the UK is facing a crisis of language skills, which can no longer be ignored. I will resist the temptation to go into too much detail, but will just summarise the problem by saying that the lack of language skills costs our economy an estimated 3.5% of GDP every year. Employers are not happy with the foreign language skills either of school leavers or graduates and rely increasingly on overseas recruitment to meet their needs. 100,000 fewer GCSE language exams were taken in 2015 compared to a decade earlier. And since 2000, 
over 50 of our universities have scrapped some or all of their modern language degree courses. All this, my Lords, against a background of the prospect of a post-Brexit world in which the UK seeks to redefine its place and establish leadership in international relations, security and soft power, negotiating new free trade agreements, all in a world where, contrary to popular myth, 75% of the world's population don't speak English and where young people will need languages for the culturally agile, mobile and interconnected jobs of the future. Employers have consistently said how much they value graduates who've had some international and cross-cultural experience, usually by taking a year abroad as part of their degree course, which of course is an option not only for MFL students but for all students. And this underlines how important it is that the UK remain a full participating member of Erasmus Plus after Brexit, because this will undoubtedly have an impact on the future employability of our young people. Uncertainty over the UK's continued participation in Erasmus is one of the reasons for the further drop we have seen in the past year of applications for languages degrees. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important Erasmus is for giving students, again of all disciplines I emphasize, not just the linguists, the opportunity to improve language skills and develop an international and cross-cultural mindset. These are all qualities which employers value. One study in the US <clears throat> reported that employers rated these skills even more highly than expertise in STEM subjects, although I must say I hesitate to mention that study with my noble friend Lord Krebs sitting right in front of me, although perhaps he will be happier to know about another study which showed that graduates of all disciplines who spend a year abroad are 23% less likely to be unemployed than those who hadn't. Will the noble Viscount give an assurance that after Brexit the UK will continue to be part of the Erasmus Plus programme and that either this will continue beyond 2020 or there will be a like-for-like -like programme to replace it with no diminution of funding. And if it is to be the latter, will he please spell out what plans are in hand? What funding is available for after 2020? What would a replacement scheme look like? The committee report highlights the many challenges there would be to setting up an alternative scheme, including the point made in evidence to the committee by the University of East Anglia that there is no guarantee that important universities across Europe would all recognise a UK alternative mobility scheme. And I believe this strengthens the argument for simply just staying inside the Erasmus and Horizon programmes. This is even more important after the recent announcement by the European Commission that it wants to double the number of Erasmus Plus participants by 2025 by ensuring that school pupils, as well as undergraduates, can benefit from exchanges and placements. Erasmus Plus, my Lords, is also a vital part of the supply chain for MFL teachers. There are now fewer MFL graduates each year than there are MFL teacher training places. Without Erasmus, which supports the third year of broad, which is the jewel in the crown of most language degrees, a key driver for MFL teacher recruitment would disappear. In addition, MFL teachers themselves identify Erasmus Plus as the most frequent source of funded training, and schools use the scheme to provide vital in-service training for existing MFL teachers. The top three destinations for UK participants in Erasmus Plus are France, Spain and Germany, precisely the top three modern languages offered in our schools. My Lords, the Erasmus Plus programme is an integral part of the National Recovery Programme for Languages, which the All-Party Group has recently proposed. We cannot afford to let the national deficit in language skills get any worse. Will the Minister take the opportunity this evening to commit the UK to be a continuing full participant after 2020 in the Erasmus and Horizons successor programmes, 
rather than shortchange our young people and their opportunities and choices for the foreseeable future. My Lords, I had the pleasure of being a member of the committee which produced this report under the elegant and efficient chairing of the noble Lord, Lord Jay, and backed up by superb support from our Secretariat. Lord Jay has well described both Erasmus Horizon programmes and their funding complexities. I wish to say something in particular about the Erasmus programme. Its logo is the profile of Erasmus, also mentioned by the noble Lord, Lord Cormac a great scholar and humanist of the 15th century, whose name is spelled out in the full title of the programme, European Community Action Scheme for the Mobility of University Students. Noble College will have to work out that acronym, but it says it all, I think, in the word mobility. It's a student exchange programme established in 1987, one which is highly successful, with the UK being an important player. It would be sad if the UK's standing and collaboration were impaired by Brexit. It was reassuring to hear from those closely involved in the organisation of Erasmus from the UK side that plans are being made to provide continuity for the programme. However, we heard from our witnesses and correspondents described in Chapter 3 that although some short-term certainty for continued and full participation under a withdrawal agreement exists, there is no full-blown optimism. Written evidence from Newcastle University stated, I quote, due to uncertainties in the immediate future, we remain extremely cautious. The Russell Group called attention to concerns that the UK students and researchers might not be aware that there were no restrictions to UK participants during any transition period, and they recommended that the UK Government and the UK, EU Commission communicate this message clearly and widely. In our current state of disarray, we can only hope that accurate information about both the Erasmus and Programme and the Horizon Programme is being distributed. The Government's technical note on Erasmus Plus, if there is no Brexit deal, confirms that the Government will seek agreement with the EU to allow for continued participation in Erasmus Plus projects and bids for new funding until 2020. If discussions with you are unsuccessful, then the government will engage in discussions to try to ensure that UK participants can continue as planned. The Erasmus Programme Guide to Bridges Applicants from the European Commission is somewhat more scary, stating that if the UK withdraws from the EU during the grant period, Without concluding an agreement with the EU, ensuring in particular that British applicants continue to be eligible, you, the applicant, will cease to re receive EU funding while continuing where possible to participate or be required to leave the project on the basis of the relevant provisions of the grant agreement on termination. Several witnesses interviewed by our committee thought that the EU would welcome the continued participation of the UK we heard descriptions set out in Chapter 2 of how universities had, in some cases, designed courses to fit in with the profiles of students who sought a year or a semester at a European business school, for example, under the Erasmus scheme. There was universal acknowledgement from students and academics that the scheme was of enormous benefit, enabling participants to grow and develop socially as well as academically and broaden their horizons and, and ambitions. One witness spoke of the positive experiences students report and of potential gain when approaching employers. She concluded, You look at that and it feels it's why we are fighting to stay in Erasmus, because we want to continue to offer those opportunities to our students. University UK points out that the next Erasmus programme would contribute to priorities to encourage disadvantaged or underrepresented students to gain from study abroad. They estimate that black graduates who had a period of study abroad were 70% less likely to be unemployed than their non-mobile peers and graduates from disadvantaged backgrounds and earn 6.1% more. 
The European Commission's proposal for the next Erasmus programme suggests a doubling of the budget. Universities UK therefore recommends that the UK should seek full associated country merit status for the next Erasmus programme starting in 2021. Lord Jay expressed this eloquently. The committee, in its conclusion, states that the UK is, rightly, a popular destination for students with our high reputation, particularly in science and research. We receive substantial funding from the EU and it is in our mutual interest to maintain close cooperation and collaboration. Social mobility is, in my view, one of the most important advantages. Will the Minister confirm that the UK should seek fully associated country status for the next Erasmus programme? And will he confirm that the positive indications in the political declaration on the future UK-EU relationship in paragraphs 173 will be vigorously pursued for the benefit of young people, not only in the UK, but in the other countries of Europe? My Lords, I would like to join other noble Lords in thanking uh, my noble friend, the Lord Jay of Uelm and his Select Committee, for an excellent report on such a key topic. I will focus on funding for scientific research through uh, EU programmes, particularly the European Research Council. And I speak, my Lords, as a career research scientist who's worked in universities and institutes in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, as well as in the USA and Canada. I know from my own personal experience how crucial international collaboration in science is. My Lords, research is possibly one of the most effective ways of building international shared values and cooperation. And this is more important than ever in times when international cooperation is under threat through nationalism, isolationism and barriers. It would therefore be a matter of very great regret if we were to withdraw from what is arguably the most mature and effective international scientific programme in the world. It's very hard to set up an international programme of research cooperation in which national interests are set aside in the pursuit of knowledge and understanding. And the European Research Council is a rare and perhaps unique instance in which this has happened. Thanks in substantial part to the efforts of the United Kingdom, the ERC was established in 2007 to put national interests aside and focus entirely on scientific excellence. The ERC funds Blue Skies research in a way that is increasingly difficult in the UK RI system, the United Kingdom Research Council system, because it is becoming more top-down and relevance-focused. My Lords, as we've already heard, uh, the UK is the leading beneficiary in Europe of ESR, ERC grants. Uh, the noble Lord, Lord Jay, has already mentioned the, the announcement last week of the latest round of awards under the Advanced Grants Scheme, in which the UK will host 47 grants, compared with 32 in Germany, 31 in France and 23 in the Netherlands. My own university, Oxford, will host nine of these advanced grants, including support for cutting-edge research on synthetic tissues for medical application and the safety and robustness of artificial intelligence systems. As the university's uh, pro-vice-chancellor for research told me last week, and I quote, the fact that these could be amongst the last awards we are eligible to receive through EU sources is a sobering moment and one which underlines the importance for the UK Government of securing ongoing access to these programmes. My Lords, Oxford University is the top university in Europe in terms of funding from Horizon 2020, with over €400 million Euros worth of grants. And Oxford is typical of leading universities in the UK. In fact, my Lords, five of the top ten universities in Europe for Horizon funding are in the United Kingdom. My Lords, we've already heard from others about the potential loss of funding in the event of a no-deal Brexit. The Royal Society estimates that the UK could lose out on a billion pounds of funding as a result of no-deal no Brexit and in, in the first year, and even 
a half a billion, even taking into account the government's offer to supply substitution funding. Furthermore, as the Royal Society highlights, and other noble lords have already mentioned, loss of funding is not the only risk we face. Uh, we will lose access to the best scientists, the best networks, mm. and the regulatory alignment that are key essentials if the UK science base is not to suffer severe damage. And indeed, as my noble friend Lord J. F. Uelm has mentioned, we will lose the prestige of winning grants in competition with 27 other countries. These are really prestigious awards. International networks, as I've already said, my lords, are really important for science, and we're already suffering the consequences of Brexit. As the noble Baroness Lady Smith of Newnham has mentioned, we are already losing the ability to attract students and researchers from other countries. I quote from the Wellcome Trust, the world's second largest biomedical charity that invests over a billion pounds a year in scientific and medical research. It has already seen a 14% drop in applicants from the European Economic Area for its prestigious and well-funded research fellowships. And the Wellcome Sanger Institute, outside Cambridge, where the human genome was first sequenced, has seen a 50% drop in applications for PhD places by EU nationals. My Lords, let's be honest. There is simply no upside for UK science yeah. from Brexit. No serious scientist that I know sees anything other than the loss of networks, of funding, of the movement of people, and ultimately the erosion of the United Kingdom's place as the leading scientific nation in Europe. However, it's just possible that I've missed something. And if I have, I do hope the noble Lord, the Minister, will enlighten me. <laughs> so what is the government's position? Science, it has to be said, my lords, does not appear to be at the very top of the government's worry list of the consequences of Brexit. As Sir Paul Nurse, Nobel Prize winner, former president of the Royal Society and current director of the Crick Institute, put it recently, if Brexit happens, then science won't have the influence and profile it will need in order to be protected, and we may fall off the end of the agenda. And he also says the statements we hear from government are relatively reassuring that the problem is that it's difficult to be fully confident and trust what's being said. I very much hope, my lords, that the noble lord, the minister, will remove some of this uncertainty, and I would like to end by asking three questions, some of which have already been uh, asked before, but there's no harm in repeating them. If the UK does not succeed in remaining part of the EU science funding mechanisms, can the noble lord, the minister, assure us unequivocally that the equivalent amount of funding will be made available nationally? Furthermore, can he assure us that whatever commitment the government makes will not be just for the short term, as other noble lords have emphasised 2020 is not far away, but will match those of the European Union schemes both in scale and in duration into the future? And thirdly, can he assure us that if the UK were to replace EU schemes with national funding, that the, this funding equivalent to the European Research Council funding would be for blue skies research and not for top-down driven strategic research that is becoming increasingly prevalent in UKRI funding. Um, I want to uh, just declare an interest that my husband is a research engineer on the Science Park in Cambridge and my last job before I came into your Lordship's house was as the Director of the Universities of the East of England and most of my work involved the exploitation of projects, the exact points that Lord Kreb was making about uh, how it is really important to have strategic development. But you cannot do that, my Lords, without Blue Skies research coming first. And the key point about uh, the ERC and the MSCA is that that Blue Skies funding is disappearing fast around the world, and UK universities and uh, research institutes have been relying very, very heavily on it. Uh, the UK is a world leader in research and innovation. We produce 15.2% of the world's most highly cited articles 
but with only 9% of, of population. And the UK ranks first amongst uh, competitors by field weighted citation impact, which is a real indicator of research quality. Uh, and that, frankly, my lords, is why we are major contributors to the current Horizon 2020 programme and why we have been net beneficiaries in the programme. And my lords, as, as other um, lords have spoken, I've been crossing parts of my speech out, and I think I'm ending up with, frankly, the highly political part of this report, which is uh, expressed in a beautifully delicate way, and I apologise in advance for being blunter and perhaps less delicate. Um, the underwrite guarantee offered uh, by the government uh, sounds fine in principle, uh, but my lords, as Vivian Stern, the Director of Universities UK International, tells us in the report at paragraph 72 on page 30, it is good up to a point. She also highlighted the issue of the UK becoming ineligible as a third country to access the ERC and MSCA which she said accounted for about 60% of all the funding that the UK wins from Horizon 2020. And the key thing, my Lords, here is how easily and how fast things can go wrong. And the report makes reference to some of the difficulties that Switzerland faced. Uh, and I was very aware of that in the run-up to and during the referendum, uh, because in one of those things, when you appear in public debates... It was like the Monty Python film, uh, where, you know, what have the Romans ever done for us? And I repeatedly cited Horizon 2020, where we had at that point put in about three billion, and we had, as a nation, received about five billion back, and that figure was about to increase. And there was a reason for that, my lords, and that was the absolute excellence of our blue skies research, whether in universities, research institutes, or even uh, in a few uh, more, more private organisations. And Switzerland, too, had a very proud history um, of research. Uh, and they wanted to be full participants. But in 2014, they held a referendum on mass immigration. And at the time, their own scientists were pretty relaxed about the possible consequences of that. But a narrow majority, my lords, approved the introductions of quotas and permits, even for migrants from within the EU, which ruptured a long-standing agreement with Brussels. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, as The Guardian cited at the time, the knock-on effects were swift and drastic. And um, a, a Belgian, Van der Weyer, commented at the time, certainly few people here thought the outcome would have any major impact on their work. So what happened afterwards came as a big shock to many. The consequences have been quite dramatic. And depending on what happens now, this is in 2015, they could get worse. My Lords, what happened was that Switzerland's status was rapidly revoked. They, they attempted to negotiate full associated company, country status, uh, and unfortunately, they were knocked out completely. For the following two and a half years, they had to sub that with money from the government and particularly from the Swiss National Science Foundation. But that was only ever intended to be temporary. So, my lords, what was the solution? The Swiss government changed the face of the bill to change the referendum arrangements to restrict free movement. Now, my lords, I cite this because on page 50 of this excellent report, it summarises some of the key points in the immigration white paper, which talk about um, having very time-limited visas for exchange students and to make sure that any UK citizens uh, have to get specific leave to remain if they stay here for any particular period, and even in the transition uh, period, anything other than Tier 4 may be difficult uh, to, get, uh, to get grants for. Now, it seems to me, my Lords, that uh, when I first read that immigration white paper, the alarm bells for the university sector in particular and Horizon 2020 and its successor programmes were ringing loud and clear. Uh, we absolutely need to understand that if we continue with the hostile environment where academics from the European Union are already finding that when they apply uh, for leave to remain early, they don't have to do it yet, 
Uh, one um, such colleague went back home for six months uh, to, to help look after a relative who was unwell and subsequently died, and when they came back, they've been told by the Home Office their service up to date has now been broken, and they have to start all over again on the clock. Uh, my Lords, I suspect Brussels is going to take a very dim view of arrangements like that. And so, my Lords, in in very uh, rapid conclusion, I just have one other question to add to all the others asked to the Minister. (coughs) What guarantee, in addition to the full underwrite guarantee, will the Minister be able to get from the Home Office to ensure that for the university and research sectors there will be true free movement that will enable Great, the UK to be able to participate fully in Horizon 2020 and its successor programmes, because other, otherwise, my lords, we are going to be in the same position as Switzerland, going very rapidly into a black hole and having to spend years trying to dig ourselves out of it. And the consequence of that, my lords, is that we will cease to be a leading research com- country in the world. My Lords, uh, I speak as a member of the EU Home Affairs Subcommittee, but I do not intend to add further commentary on the contents of this, our latest report. That task has been performed admirably by our excellent Chair and by other Noble Lords. Instead, I would like to offer a couple of thoughts about the process behind the report. I am relatively new to the subcommittee, and this is its first report during my tenure. Two things have struck me forcibly. First, what an extraordinary resource this committee represents, like I have no doubt your Lordship's other EU committees, as demonstrated this afternoon in the debate on Brexit, the Customs Challenge. Our subcommittee contains people with extensive experience of European matters, from the very highest levels of the diplomatic service, from membership of the European Parliament and from bodies working with the EU who understand its strengths and weaknesses. And for those who do not like to be guided by experts, the committee has wise and experienced members from all the main political parties and from the independent crossbenches. Our report is the culmination of an exercise that has brought together the foremost participants in the field to give us high-quality evidence, along with our quizzing of government ministers and officials and the input of our exceptional staff team. This is a thorough, highly civilised, effective mechanism for achieving a unanimous outcome across party divides and between those with considerable specialist knowledge and those with more general wisdom and experience. My first observation, therefore, is that this country, amidst all the chaos and confusion of Brexit, has an incredible resource in the House of Lords EU committees, a means of bringing clarity to complex issues, of achieving both understanding and consensus, and of bringing more light than heat to the debate. But my second observation is that this resource is largely ignored. This voice of reason is largely unheard, even within Parliament, let alone in the world outside. The report on the Erasmus and Horizon programmes before us tonight is no exception, despite its clear analysis and really important recommendations, members of the general public are unlikely to see or hear its contents. How many people know how valuable the Erasmus programmes are for tens of thousands of young people in this country, or how important to the UK's research and innovation is our involvement with the Horizon programmes? How many people know that currently we gain financially from these programmes, that that we are net beneficiaries, getting out more than we put in? Three billion in, five billion out, said the noble Baroness, Baroness Brenton. And that Brexit, with or without a deal, means that even if we pour in a lot more taxpayers' money, and the figures are in billions, not millions, we will still lose our influential key position in the decision-making for these funding programmes. Despite a sprinkling of media coverage of our report 
and some modest pieces in academic magazines and journals, it is likely that the committee's work will go more or less unnoticed. I think this is a great shame. My Lords, the report before us tonight exemplifies the clear, constructive, consensus-based role this House can play through its EU committees and subcommittees in guiding the nation on significant aspects of the UK's relationship with the EU. But it also illustrates how, surrounded by noise and dissent, this rational, evidence-based approach can be ignored. This is a waste of what should be a brilliant gift to the policy makers and practitioners. As any research council, policy think tank or research-based foundation will testify, producing a fine report is the start, not the end, of a process for achieving change. It requires persistence to get the message out with a clear communication strategy, ongoing participation in conferences, seminars and informal sessions with opinion formers, targeting of the news media and use of online social networks. Reports do no good gathering dust on library shelves. My Lords, at this time of fake news and divisive discourse, I would like to think the House's budget for disseminating and publicising the outputs from our committees, like tonight's excellent report, might be significantly increased. <clears throat> However, in the meantime, it is an urgent necessity the Government recognises that the Committee's vital report on the Erasmus and Horizon programmes deserve the Government's most positive consideration. My Lords, I declare my interest, including uh, being Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, Chair of the Advisory Board of the Cambridge Judge Business School, and a Bynum Tudor Fellow at Kellogg College, the University of Oxford. Uh, the Royal Society, as mentioned before, basically says no deal is a bad deal for science. Uh, one in six academic staff at UK higher education institutions are from elsewhere in the EU. Uh, the UK could lose access to over one billion a year in EU research funding. And Overlord Lord Kerbs has said that there is, Kerbs, that there is Kerbs, sorry, um, that there's no upside in leaving the EU for science. And uh, my friend Professor Savenki Ramakrishnan, President of the Royal Society, uh, said the UK is a global leader in science because a top homegrown international science want to work here. We must do everything we can to ensure that the UK maintains its role at the heart of European science because that is in everyone's best interest. If science loses, everyone loses. And UK science punches well above its weight. This is a point I've made many times. 1% of the world's population, 16% of the highest rated scientific papers. And over half of UK's research output was the result of international collaboration. I would like to congratulate the Lord Lord Jay and his committee on a truly outstanding and excellent comprehensive report. It shows very clearly the implications for the UK if we leave the EU uh, on these programmes, Horizon 2020 and, and, and Erasmus. Um, these are phenomenal programmes that we have played a major part in. We are the second, as we have heard before, second largest recipient of Horizon 2020 funding. We have received 15.2% of grants distributed so far, totalling 5.7 billion euros, um, as well as funding UK research project, Horizon 2020 supports scientific partnerships with countries across the Europe, uh, throughout Europe. So it's phenomenal. The, the report very clearly says how damaging a no-deal scenario uh, would be for these programmes. But it also highlights, as other noble lords have mentioned, that if we're not an associate member, we will lose out on the funding of the European Research Council and the Marie Sotowiska Curry actions, which are not open to third country participation and not covered. The government's own statistics, the report says, show that grants from these programmes account for about 44% of total UK receipts from Horizon 2020. Could the noble Lord the Minister assure us that we will be, have access to these programmes in the future? And also, the report very clearly says not just these programmes, Horizon 2020 and Erasmus, but what about the future programmes? Erasmus and Horizon Europe that are starting in 2021, year after next, up to 2027, which we don't want to lose out on. Uh, so the other point made by the report was very important is a stark warning that mobility opportunities for people in vocational education training would stop in their tracks without Erasmus funding. And that is so important because it would disproportionately affect people from disadvantaged backgrounds and those with medical needs or disabilities. So this is really, really serious. Uh, and, of course, the other aspects it, it talks about 
clear benefits over and above grant funding, cross-border research, research facilities, joint infrastructure. And then the point is made, the government keeps talking about increasing R&D and innovation spending to 2.4% of GDP from the 1.7% that we have. That's going to take time. Are we going to lose out in the future? And, and the people involved, 4,700 projects, 128,000 participants. Um, and then the Prime Minister talks about, in, in the Florence speech, we mustn't forget all these stage speeches that she made. So people will continue to be able to come and live in the, and work in the UK during the implementation period after the UK leaves the EU. There will be a registration system. And then we're considering options for the future. What are the options for the future? The Migration Advisory Committee's useless report, quite frankly, hopeless report, putting a threshold of £30,000 as a minimum salary. What about all the research assistants? What about the postdocs? What about all the people we're going to lose out of? Could the noble law, the minister, tell us what's going to happen about that? Are they going to listen to this report? And as the president of UKISA, the UK Council of International Student Affairs, that represents 450,000 international students in the UK, 130,000 of them are from the EU. 20% of our staff in most, many of our universities are from the EU. The National Union of Students is supportive of the UK remaining a member of these programmes and not losing out in the future. The international students bring in £26 billion to the economy. They create jobs. They pay taxes. It is phenomenal. We don't want to lose out. At the moment, EU students are entitled to the home student fees, they're entitled to home student loans, and they're entitled to permanent right to work after they finish their studies. What's going to happen to those 130,000 students if those three things are not available to them? Could the noble order minister tell us? And we've lagged behind competitors like the States, Australia and Germany in terms of the proportion of students who gain overseas experience. Thanks to things like the Erasmus programme, we've been catching up. Now we are in danger of falling behind again. And the impact survey has found time after time the employability nearly doubled of people who have been on the Erasmus programme. The soft power of Britain has been increased by being on the Erasmus programme. The inward mobility students gain a better understanding and affinity for the UK. These are all priceless benefits. And what about the future? The European Commission wants to double the funding to £30 billion. Will the Noble Lords Minister assure us that we will join the new programme and we will commit to the extra funding? It's going to be more inclusive and more open. It's going to be more open to students from disadvantaged programs, uh, backgrounds. It's going to extend mobility. Do we want to lose out on all this? I don't think we do. And I'd like the Noble Lord the Minister to assure us we will continue to benefit from these further enhanced programs in the future. And the Royal Society, again, it go, continually says we need to continue with this. EU countries are among the UK's top 10 strongest scientific collaborators. 17% of R&D undertaken by UK SMEs comes from the EU. The pillars of the Horizon 2020, the pillars of the, horizon, of the new Horizon Europe, they are similar. Do we want to lose out on open science, global challenge and industrial competitiveness, open innovation? So, my Lords, we are going to lose out big time if we're not careful. Universities UK backs it. Noble Lord, Lord Cormac mentioned, what about the uncertainty of the 17,000 British students who plan to study in Europe under Erasmus Plus from this September? And a note published by the government failed to guarantee, could the Noble Lord the Minister assure us these students will be able to do it? In recent weeks, Spain and Norway have advised their students planning to study in the UK to go elsewhere. And no one has brought up the, the programme for entrepreneurs. There is a European Union funded programme, Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. Can the government assure us this scheme is going to continue in the future? My Lords, I, I want to uh, conclude with a point that the Noble Lord, Lord Cormac touched on, the youth. This is about the youth predominantly. Since the referendum three years ago, 800,000 a year is our birth rate. We've got 2.4 million more youngsters who were not allowed to vote three years ago. Two of my children, one born in October 2016, one born on the 21st of March this year, are old enough to vote and missed out on voting three years ago. It's their future that is being taken away from them. They're the ones that want to benefit from Erasmus. They're the ones that want to benefit from Horizon. And Noble Lord Cormac talk, spoke about Erasmus, learning knows no boundaries. Mahatma Gandhi said, live as if you're going to die tomorrow and learn as if you're going to live forever. And going back to Venki Ramakrishnan, Nobel Prize winner, President of the Royal Society, fellow Trinity College Cambridge, he has said, given the gridlock, I personally feel it would be best to revoke Article 50 and I sign the ongoing petition accordingly in a personal capacity. Politicians need to rise above partisan politics and self-interest 
and act soon in the best interests of the country. Whatever they decide, it is time. The threat of a no-deal Brexit is buried permanently. And my lords, finally, what's going on in the other place? It's now gone beyond the will of the people. It's supposedly re um, respecting the will of the manifestos. Well, what about the Prime Minister respecting the will of her manifesto? She backtracked on the dementia attack four days after it was published. Then she ditched so many other manifesto pledges. The free vote on fox hunting, ending free school lunches for children aged five to seven, dropping the triple lock on pensions, ending the ban on new grammar schools. So she can go on and continually U-turn, forget about a manifesto, and the manifesto did not get a majority. The Conservative government did not get a majority last time. And yet we cannot ask the people to change their mind even once when the Prime Minister has gone back three times to get the MPs to change their mind and wants to go back a fourth time. The only solution. The world has changed in three years. We've got to save what we've been talking about in this debate. We've got to preserve the benefit of Erasmus. We've got to preserve the benefit of Horizon. And the only way of doing that is to put it back to the people for a people's vote, and I'm sure we will end up remaining in the European Union, which is the best deal we have by far. Uh, my Lords, can I join in the thanks to the Noble Lord Lord Jay for introducing this debate so comprehensively and for his chairmanship of the committee which produced this authoritative and important report, although sadly without the contribution of the Noble Lord Lord Cormac. Um, as the Noble Lord Lord Ricketts said, it's been a debate with a single message and perhaps it's not surprising that there's been a rare agreement among the speakers today in support of two European programmes which have been so important to our students, our universities, our citizens and the country. We've long been pressing the Minister for assurances that we shall continue to be part of Erasmus and Horizon. His assurances have been modest and time-limited, and I rather expect that today he will not be able to give us the longer-term assurances which we would all wish to see. And we can only hope that he can give some plans beyond 2020 and, indeed, answer the questions of the noble Lady Baroness Warwick. As Universities UK and the Royal Society have reminded us, the UK is a world leader in research and in innovation, and continuing to build our research capacity is vital for future economic growth and closing the UK's productivity gap. As my noble friends Baroness Smith and Baroness Brinton can attest from first-hand experience, and indeed my noble friend Baroness Brinton's tales of Switzerland were, I think, salutary. The UK's research success is down to homegrown talent, high levels of international cooperation, and world-class facilities. In science and research, the UK produces 15.2% of the world's most highly cited articles, with only 0.9% of the world's populations, and ranks first among competitors by field-weighted citation impact, which is an indicator of research quality. And the noble Lord, Lord Krebs spoke of the importance of this scientific research, and indeed the noble Lord Lord Billy Moore added his voice to this. And much of this is due to funding and collaboration through the Horizon programme. What steps is the government taking to secure associated status with Horizon Europe? Uh, we've heard that the UK will not be able to start negotiations to gain associated status until the UK has left the EU, but it's surely important that the UK influences the shape of this programme as a current member of the EU. The noble Lord, Lord Best bemoans the lack of attention to this report and the lack of realisation more widely of the huge benefits that we have had from these two great programmes, Erasmus and Horizon. And the range of universities who contributed to the report bear witness of the importance through higher education of these programmes. It's surely in all our interests for collaboration to continue. And when we think of Erasmus, there's copious evidence of transformational experiences of young people who spend time in other countries developing linguistic skills but also gaining an understanding of cultural, political, economic and social differences and learning to respect international differences. Like my noble friend Baroness Janke, I'm a former modern language teacher and I know the enormous benefits of time spent in the country by language students, but for other students as well. And, of course, the noble Lady Baroness Cousin, Cousins is a tireless supporter for modern languages and of time spent abroad. I have to say this is a far cry from my days reading languages at Oxford, where women were discouraged from spending time abroad because it would take away from our academic studies. I was still at the time fluent in French, having spent a childhood in France. This was totally irrelevant to my degree. What really mattered was the medieval texts. But there we are. We've moved on. And, of course, the people on Erasmus develop soft skills as well as skills and knowledge to enhance international relations, and goodness do we need those skills now. The country will certainly feel the loss if our younger generation lose out on opportunities to study, work and live in other countries. 
We hear from the report that under Erasmus+, Plus, €1 billion Euros expected to be allocated to the UK between 2014 and 2020 to support university student exchanges, work and vocational training placements, youth projects, and we've had mention of the importance to young people here, opportunities for staff working at all levels of education to teach or train abroad. And extra funding, of course, is available for people from disadvantaged backgrounds and those with disabilities or additional needs to ensure these mobility opportunities are inclusive and accessible to all, and that has come out from all sides of the Chamber. This is all invaluable, but will it still be available? The next Erasmus programme will align well with UK priorities, including measures that will make it easier for disadvantaged students to take part and be more flexible, as the noble Lady Baroness Massey reminded us. The European Commission's proposal for the next programme suggests a doubling of the overall budget. The UK should therefore seek as close a status as possible for the next uh, Erasmus programme, starting in 2021. Erasmus has done wonders for those from disadvantaged backgrounds and has enhanced vocational as well as academic learning. Does the Minister have any plans for what programmes might the Government introduce if we lose Erasmus? As the report says, the UK is a respected and important partner in both Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 programmes. It's a possible de a popular destination for mobility placements and a world leader in research with an exceptionally strong science base. And it goes on, in return, the UK receives substantial amounts of funding, access to professional networks and opportunities to connect and collaborate with European partners built over decades of cooperation under the shared framework of the Erasmus and Horizon programmes. And we've heard this mentioned in the debate as well. Of course, the funding is a crucial part, but it is the cooperation which is also critically important to the research excellence of our universities. The UK has so far received 5.7 billion euros of funding from Horizon 2020. Can the Minister say what plans the government has made to replicate this in the event we leave without a replacement arrangement? The funding, of course, is for fellowships, for joint research projects, for collaboration between universities, colleges and schools, and has a significant impact on youth projects and policy in Europe and beyond. These are worldwide collaborations, which surely in these fractious times we should be supporting as much as possible. The Government has committed to underwrite funding from EU programmes until the end of 2020, but what then, my Lords? There's lack of clarity over how this will operate, particularly given that the European Research Council and the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions are not open to third country participation. The UK could hope to participate in the successor programmes to Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020, Erasmus and Horizon Europe, which will run from 2021 to 2027 as a third country. What plans does the government have to ensure that we are best positioned for this? And of course, let us not forget the vocational support for Erasmus, as the noble Lord Barry Moria mentioned. We should certainly be concerned that, as the report sets out, mobility opportunities for people in vocational education and training would stop in their tracks without Erasmus funding. This is particularly damaging for those from disadvantaged backgrounds and those with disabilities. Can the Minister give us any reassurances about the vocational education programme? My Lords, the Great Erasmus programme has been around since 1987. It's expanded from universities to lifelong learning, adult education, youth and sport programmes, youth workers, education staff and teachers who've all had employment opportunities enhanced. Hundreds of thousands of people, young and old, have had lives transformed, yet there is total uncertainty about the way forward. We do understand that the Minister's hands will be tied, but we would welcome any assurances he can give that the Government appreciates just how valuable these programmes are and what a huge loss it will be to the country if we can no longer play a full part. I look forward to his reply. My Lords, um, it is a great pleasure to speak in this debate on a subject which uh, may well come to define future hopes and aspirations of our next generation of students, researchers, entrepreneurs and business leaders. Lord Jay is to be congratulated for the report that has been produced and for the excellence uh, and the quality of this evening's debate which it has so uh, ably uh, supported. These two programmes, Erasmus and Horizon 2020, have their origins in the mid-1980s at a time when the European Parliament and the Commission 
were looking expansively at ways in which Europe's emerging knowledge economy recognised the need to be more ambitious. The UK's part in these programmes has long been regarded as critical to their success, largely because we punch way above our weight, I think as Lord Villamoria said earlier. We have just 1% of the world population, but gather 15.2% of the world's most highly cited research articles. We are ranked first among competitors by field-weighted citation impact. UK universities tell us that Horizon 2020 is the largest multilateral international funding pot in the world with a budget of £75 billion over a seven-year period. Since its inception, the UK is the second most successful country in terms of funding received. The programme provides a tailor-made platform for collaboration with key partners in Europe with over 50% of UK collaborations with members of the EU. The Horizon 2020 budget is set to grow to £100 billion in the period 21-27. At our current level of success in securing funding, UK universities could expect to benefit to the tune of between £14 and £18 billion pounds over that period. Whatever the outcome of Commons votes tonight and later in the week and the shape of any withdrawal deal, it is the EU committee report, as it says, essential that the UK government secures continued access to the EU research framework programmes through association with Horizon Europe. Our universities, to ensure their preeminence as research institutions leading in part and participating in collaborative programmes, need this guarantee. A failure to secure this beyond the current spending period will, as many speakers have said tonight, damage permanently our university sector and the businesses that depend upon it. The Government's commitment to increase research funding to 2.4 of GDP by 2027 is of course welcome, but merely underlines the centrality of research to the UK's future prosperity. Does it go far enough? This I doubt. The weakness in the strategy is that access to Horizon Europe is dependent on a guarantee that post-2020 funding will be commensurate with the UK's ambition. Again, a failure to be ambitious will mean we cease to be a net beneficiary from future Horizon Europe budgets. My fear is that because being an associate member won't give the UK more than observer status at programme committees, the temptation of this government and perhaps future administrations will be to restrain funding and minimise costs. If the UK participates as a non-associated member, it will lose access to major funding opportunities and have no influence over the direction of research programmes and priorities. So, my Lords, we echo the calls for the Government to secure at least associated status in the event of the UK leaving the EU, so that negotiations can begin about our participation and shaping some of the, the future research agenda. The underwrite guarantee helps ensure cross-university collaborative work in the short term but, my Lords, what happens beyond Horizon 2020? Perhaps the Minister can help us with some assurances. Can the Minister also provide a cast-iron assurance that funding commensurate with the expected returns from the ERC and Marie Sklodowska uh, Curie actions, estimated that being worth $1.3 billion over the final 20 months of the Horizon programme, will be available? Uh, Baroness uh, Warwick and I think Baroness Smith asked and expressed concern about the uh, uncertainty researchers uh, might suffer from and be encouraged to move as a consequence to other EU institutions. It is equally possible that if we have no deal that negotiations might stall. It might be helpful if the government therefore gave assurances to those researchers that UK research and innovation will sign grant agreements in such a situation. If, as a product of Brexit, uh, the UK, in the UK we lose access to funding opportunities, then it is clear we will need replacement programmes. The Government must work with research communities to ensure, in the event uh, of crashing out or failing to negotiate a workable deal with the EU, we have a well-funded alternative. It does need to be understood by Government that it will take many years to replicate the scope of current programmes and undo the damage to our reputation internationally and field-leading position. My Lords, turning to Erasmus Plus programmes, many similar challenges exist. 
Currently, the budget of 16.4 billion for the programme period reaches over 4 million, 4 million people through study, training, work experience, sports and volunteering abroad. Over the past 30 years, some 300,000 UK students have benefited from the Erasmus programmes. Of course, UK university students have always studied abroad. Like other noble lords, I can recall a few friends having years abroad during my time at Sussex in the early 70s. But the programmes had to be individually negotiated and were reliant on the goodwill of the two institutions involved uh, and an element of good fortune. Today's programmes are sophisticated, are a far cry from those back then which predated our membership of the EU. In the academic year 2015-16, some 15,000 plus students from UK universities took part. Of course, incoming students add to the broader cultural experience of students attending our university courses. The NUS estimate that on and off campus spending by international students, the vast majority of them in the EU, in 2014-15 alone, totaled some 25 billion and contributed 13.8 billion uh, to the UK's GDP. This supports the equivalent of over 20, 200,000 jobs and equates to 10.8 billion of export earnings. Or, to put it in tax revenue terms, it supplies a billion pounds a year to the Treasury and supports the salaries that pay for 31,000 nurses or 25,000 police officers. But the major benefit is probably to less measurable things. Students bring overseas thinking and ideas home with them. They add to the UK's influence through forms of soft power and soft influence. Students and researchers bring fresh, appro fresh approaches to our academic institutions, to our towns and our cities. Some research suggests that students who study abroad access better employment opportunities, achieve higher incomes and make a bigger contribution to the national economy. Unsurprisingly, Overseas study benefits social mobility and, as many noble lords have said, students from disadvantaged backgrounds. One study suggests that black and minority ethnic students who participate in Erasmus are 41% less likely to be unemployed, and that non-exchange students and that mobile students from poorer backgrounds earn over 6% more across their lifetime. Shutting off the opportunity for international change exchange for those students will undermine work to widen participation in higher education and improve upward mobility. Given all the benefits to our university sector and the wider economy of Erasmus, it is essential that in any post-Brexit deal with the EU, the UK Government negotiate full association with the 2021-2027 programme. Costs will be higher and of course we won't have the purchase on the content of the programme we currently do as voting members of programme committees. As a non-associated country, we will, of course, give up a seat at the table completely. If it's not possible to negotiate a sensible post-Brexit arrangement, it is essential that the UK Government establishes a new mobility scheme on an international basis with all the same features of our current arrangements. I agree with the report very much that this must not be at the expense of exchanges on our doorstep, not least because these are attractive to vocational students, those with special needs and those with strong family ties. I, ha I echo uh, many of what Lord Jay, much of what Lord Jay said uh, in his opening uh, speech because we've only seen government commitments to funding for the existing programmes. Can the Minister assure the House that the government has in mind a plan for the long term and the replication of UK's participation in Erasmus on current terms. Finally, it would be remiss of me not to mention the position of students seeking to study in the UK. Can we be assured that there's no threat to the status of students currently studying here? Can we be further assured that internal discussions are taking place within government and especially towards the Home Office to guarantee the extension of the temporary leave to remain scheme. Without that, the future of mobility learning will be jeopardised and our place as a centre of excellence for student experience placed at risk. No deal is a form of intellectual and academic self-harm. 
I share the fear of many peers tonight. I cannot believe a government serious and looking to the future of our country would allow this to take place, and I hope I'm right. My Lords, the government has offered little by way of reassurance so far, though there are some encouraging signs in the political statement that sits with the withdrawal agreement. Tonight, as we await the outcome of Commons votes, and at a point where we all need more answers to hard questions, I hope that the government can offer us more than the empty promises we have sadly become used to over the last couple of years, and which are a feature of Mrs May's administration. My Lords, these questions need answers. My Lords, I am very grateful to the noble Lord, Lord J. of Ewan, for securing this debate. And I would like to open by thanking the Home Affairs Subcommittee, of which he is Chair, for taking the time to consider the future of the Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 programmes after Brexit. This has been valuable work, which I know is informing the Government's thinking on these topics. And my Lords, I'd just like to make a few opening remarks because there have been, in my view, some excellent speeches this afternoon from many distinguished peers with backgrounds ranging from higher education to education and to the diplomatic service. And my message, uh, as I start out, is that these two programmes are very important. I certainly agree with so many of the comments that have been made on this point, and I'll be saying more about this later. And can I reassure the noble Lord Lord Best and the noble Baroness Lady Garden, amongst others, that the subcommittee's report will not go unnoticed. Next, I'd like to welcome the noble Lord Lord Basson onto the front bench. And I know that he has morphed from the shadow chief whip into this position. I have no idea whether it is permanent or, or temporary. I hope it is permanent, but he is very welcome indeed. Now, I'd also like to say, um, which is probably the case for all debates in the Lords here, that there have been an enormous number of questions uh, raised on these important subjects. Now, um, many of the questions uh, directed to me include a focus on the dates given and the guarantees that we have given and perhaps suggestions that we might extend these guarantees. Now, the noble Baroness Lady Garden anticipated that I might say this, but I don't think uh, hopefully the House will not expect me to, to actually give any guarantees this afternoon, but one thing is certain, I will be taking all views back to the department. But I hope at least I can give some reassurances which will help uh, the House this afternoon. The Government will be publishing a formal response to the Committee's report shortly. However, to follow a point raised by the noble Baroness uh, Lady Smith of Newnham, I will attempt to set out for you today the work that the Government is doing to ensure that opportunities for our researchers, businesses and students are protected and enriched in all scenarios. Let me start by saying, with a touch of understatement perhaps, that we don't know what the coming days will bring. <laughs> but, my Lords, the UK remains open for business and, importantly, remains open to ideas and exchanges with the EU and also globally and to the people who provide them. In the context of the UK's impending departure from the EU, it is imperative that we consider how the UK can maintain close ties with our European partners, in particular the fields of education, science and research. As your Lordships noted in the report, the Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 programmes have provided so many people in the UK with the opportunity to move across the EU to learn, work and carry out research and innovation. UK businesses and researchers have driven forward a wide range of inspiring Horizon 2020 projects. As of the end of September 2018, the UK had over 10,000 participations in the programme. And in response to a question raised by the noble Baroness Smith of Newnham and the noble Lord Lord Krebs, who raised um, an interesting point about EU scientists leaving the UK and the fact that science is losing out, I've absolutely taken note of what uh, both uh, peers have said. But we currently expect that at the point of exiting the EU, the UK will have over 11,000 live participations in Horizon 2020. Now, there's a little bit of caution here because the latest data released, September 18, does not suggest the UK is routinely locked out of consortia. But I do recognise that both the Noble Baroness and the Noble Lord are making points 
uh, which they say is happening on the ground, and I do recognise that. These projects range from increasing our understanding of how green roofs are used to tackle climate change to helping authorities better protect trafficked persons. The government recognises the important role that both schemes have played in the UK and remains committed to supporting collaboration with our neighbours in the EU and beyond. Now let me focus on Erasmus Plus first. And the Noble Lord Lord Jay and the Noble Lord Lord Basson will put this more eloquently than me, but the Erasmus Plus programme offers young people the opportunity to not only gain international experience, but also to boost their employability, as the Noble Baroness Lady Cousins said. It provides opportunities for teaching and training and supports innovation and the sharing of best practice. The uh, Noble Baroness uh, Lady Jank uh, asked me to clarify the terms of payment for the underwrite guarantee and the UKRI will use existing payment systems to ensure continuity for UK beneficiaries. In a no-deal scenario, UKRI will contact UK beneficiaries who have registered on the portal with further information on how the guarantee will operate in practice. While the UK benefits from sending our own young people on outgoing mobilities, the UK hosts around twice as many incoming Erasmus Plus mobilities as it sends out. And as the Noble Lord Lord Best and others have said, it is interesting to note that the UK's notional contribution to the Erasmus Plus budget currently exceeds its share of receipts. The Noble Baroness uh, Lady Garden, and particularly the Noble Baroness Lady Cousins, raised the question about modern foreign languages and the importance of Erasmus Plus for languages, and especially the supply chain for teachers. I do agree with the uh, noble baronesses, that the benefits for those who endeavour to learn new languages and study abroad can be huge. Languages provide an insight into other cultures and can open the door to travel and employment opportunities. They can also broaden pupils' horizons, helping them to flourish in new environments. And I want to assure the House that Erasmus Plus is not the only way students can travel abroad. Our world-leading higher education providers have a strong track record of partnering with overseas institutions and new UK evidence suggests that around half of mobilities already take place outside uh, Erasmus+. Plus. The government know that employers value languages too, as they are increasingly important to make sure that we can compete in the global marketplace. The noble baroness Lady Massey, I hope, might agree with this, but it is clear, therefore, that other, UK country, other EU countries strongly value and are benefiting from the UK's participation in Erasmus+. Plus. I'd li now like to move on to Horizon 2020. And as others have said, this is the biggest EU research and innovation programme ever, with nearly €80 billion Euros of funding available over seven years. That is the period from 2014 to 2020. It promises more breakthroughs, discoveries and world firsts by supporting great ideas at all stages from the lab to the market. The UK is one of the most attractive collaborators for research and innovation and a key player for Horizon 2020. I have already mentioned our high number of participations, which is second only to Germany. We are also a partner of choice across Europe. Every member state places the UK as one of the top five countries that they collaborate with under the programme. I'd now like to touch on the impact of Brexit on these two important programmes, which I know so many peers have raised this afternoon. As the committee's report notes, and as the Noble Lord Lord Jay said, passing the withdrawal agreement would ensure that UK participation in Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 would remain largely unchanged until the end of 2020. Despite the challenges that we continue to face at this present moment, it remains the government's priority to secure a negotiated deal. The Noble Lord, Lord Ricketts, asked what the, the Majesty's Government will do to allay the funding gap for the Horizon programme, even in, within the terms of the withdrawal agreement. And the EU programme for research and innovation is a competitive bid programme. Only the most excellent bids are funded. And under the terms of the withdrawal agreement, UK bids would continue to be measured against the same criteria as bids from other EU member states, which should avoid any fall in funding. However, the government is preparing for every eventuality. And in the event of a no deal, the government will underwrite funding for successful bids submitted to Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 before the end of 2020. 
and for the avoidance of doubt, this guarantee would apply for the lifetime of projects. This sizable funding pledge will not be part of, but additional to, funding already committed in existing departmental budgets. Uh, the Noble Lord, Lord Jay, asked if uh, the Government can confirm that it will spend the money required in the EU's regulation for a no-deal guarantee. But can I reassure him that the Government has been clear that if the UK left the EU without a deal, the UK has obligations to the EU and the EU obligations to the UK that will survive Brexit. And these would need to be negotiated. As your Lordships will know, UK Research and Innovation is the Government's delivery partner for Horizon 2020. Since last year, Bayers and UKRI have worked tirelessly to put the necessary systems in place to deliver this guarantee if required. In this scenario, all beneficiaries registered on the UKRI portal will receive detailed information about the next step they need to take. No Baroness Lady Warwick, amongst a number of questions, I think there were four, if not more, that she asked, and I will try and answer them all, asked about the terms of the underwrite guarantee funding. And underwrite funding will be paid to UK beneficiaries in pounds sterling. UKRI has confirmed that existing systems will be used to give continu continuity for UK grant holders. The report also makes clear the importance of confirming no-deal domestic funding streams for key sources of UK Horizon 2020 funding, including the ERC, that's the European Research Council, as the House will know. The Government has worked closely with UKRI and a wide range of stakeholders on no-deal planning for the Horizon 2020 programme. But it is appropriate that your Lordships are asking about this, and I can assure you that further updates will be provided to the research community in due course. In January, the Government published a technical notice on Erasmus+, Plus, providing guidance to organisations and participants on the UK's anticipated participation in the current Erasmus Plus programme in the event of a no-deal. The report has pointed towards the benefits of continuing to contribute towards Erasmus Plus, and I think, my laws, that it is right to look ahead. Indeed, the UK is very interested in exploring future participation in the Erasmus Plus successor scheme for the period 2021 to 2027. I understand the successor scheme will include increased school exchange opportunities and a greater emphasis on widening participation. The Government has welcomed proposals on this and will continue to participate in discussions while we remain in the EU. The Noble Baroness Lady Smith of Newnham and the Noble Baroness Lady Garden asked whether the Government will commit to seek alternatives to Erasmus Plus and associate third country status for Erasmus Plus. And perhaps in line of what I've just said, the Government is certainly very interested in the emerging proposals for the successor Erasmus Plus programme for that particular period, that is 2020 to 2027. The details of it are still being discussed by the EU, and the UK will continue to participate in discussions while we remain in the EU. But we note that the proposals so far contain a number of provisions that the UK can welcome. We will continue to consider the emerging proposals carefully, and whether the UK participates in the future programme and on what basis will be subject to the wider negotiations on the EU, EU's future relationship with the EU. The report also highlighted the importance of an alternative scheme if participation in Erasmus Plus cannot be negotiated. And I can assure this House that the Government understands the value that international mobility can bring and is currently driving forward work on domestic alternative options to support it. And again, to reassure the Noble Baroness Lady Garden, the potential benefits of the UK establishing its own international mobility scheme is the ability to tailor the scheme to UK needs and target the funding where it is most needed. And of course, whatever international mobility scheme we are part of in the future, the Government will want to ensure value for money for the taxpayer. The Noble Baroness Lady Warwick um, asked a question, I think previously of me, perhaps maybe it was in the oral question the other day, of funding for domestic alternatives for Erasmus+. Plus. And I would like to reassure the House that the Government is preparing for every foreseeable scenario. In a no-deal scenario, the Government's underwrite guarantee will cover the payment of awards to UK beneficiaries for all Erasmus Plus bids. That is additional funding, which I may have alluded to earlier. Regarding domestic alternatives, the Government is developing a range of options. But, of course, the Government needs to carefully balance the uh, 
the, the, the support on international ability and ensuring value for money, which as I also said earlier. I would now like to turn to Horizon Europe, which the House may know is a successor to Horizon 2020, and touch upon some of the thoughts set out in the report. Recognising the value brought through international collaboration, the Prime Minister made it clear in her speech at Jodrell Bank last year that the UK would like the option to fully associate to the excellent-based EU science research and innovation programmes post-2020, including Horizon Europe. UK officials and ministers are continuing to play an active role in the development of the Horizon Europe programme to ensure that it remains in line with the UK's priority uh, for excellence, openness to the world and added value. As a potential future associate to the programme, we believe that Horizon Europe should continue to treat associated countries as partners rather than competitors. The benefits that associated countries bring to the programme must be recognised and also welcomed. The noble Baroness uh, Lady Jank asked what progress has been made in settling the terms of third country participation. And she may not be surprised that I say to her that negotiations on the Horizon Europe programme, including provisions on third country participation, are ongoing within the EU institutions. At the moment, it's too early to make an informed decision about our future participation, but we are committed to continuing the strong, positive relationship that we currently have with the EU in science, research and innovation. Noble Lord, Lord Cormac, my noble friend Lord Cormac, um, asked how the UK will have influence on research and innovation without a seat at the table, which is a fair question. But can I just reassure him that the UK is a great place to do science, and we account for 4.1% of the world's researchers, 10.7% of all citations, 15.2% of the world's most highly cited articles, three of the world's top ten universities. We know that collaboration between researchers is key to achieving great science, and that's why our plans to ensure that the UK remains a world leader in science and innovation after Brexit focuses on encouraging close relationships with the EU and beyond. My Lords, let me be clear. Science, research and innovation really matter, and that is why we have committed to considering all options to support UK research and further the government's strategic objectives, regardless of whether we choose to associate to Horizon Europe. And this is in line with the committee's recommendation that every effort be made in this respect. And that's why the government has announced the appointment of Professor Sir Adrian Smith, Director and Chief Executive of the Alan Turing Institute, as an independent advisor to the government on the development of future funding programmes for international collaboration. The terms of reference have been agreed, and Sir Adrian, I would say, has hit the ground running. And we look forward to his uh, thoughts and recommendations. And to answer a question raised by the Noble Lord, Lord Jay, about what the implications are of the uh, Smith Review on Association to Horizon Europe. Professor Smith's advice will help set the direction for the implementation of the government's ambition to ensure the UK continues to be a global leader. In the event that the UK does not associate to Horizon Europe, the government will support measures to enable world-class collaborative research that align to UK priorities. I can also confirm that Bayes is working closely with the National Academies and UKRI to develop ambitious and credible alternatives to association to Horizon Europe, which could also enable world-class collaborative research. Your Lordships will appreciate that this thinking is still at an early stage and is currently being tested with both devolved administrations and key stakeholders from the wider research and innovation communities represented by Minister Skidmore's high-level stakeholder group on EU exit. And you should be aware that all decisions on future funding for international science collaboration remain subject to the spending review, so caveated to, to some extent. The noble uh, Baroness Lady Warwick uh, asked me to confirm what the fee status will be for EU students beginning courses in 2020. I think this uh, point has been raised on several occasions in the House before. And I know that students, staff and providers are concerned about what EU exit means for study and collaboration opportunities. To help give certainty, in July 2018, we announced guarantees on student finance for EU nationals 
These guarantees are not altered if the EU leaves, uh, if the UK leaves the EU without a deal. With regards to courses starting in 2020, we understand how important it is that students and institutions have information available for student support before applications for courses are open. The applications for courses starting in the academic year 2021 do not open until September 2019, and I'm sure the Noble Baroness will say that that deadline is coming up quite shortly. The Government is aware of this and will ensure students and institutions have the information they need well in advance of that particular date. The Noble Baroness um, Lady Smith of Newnham asked about teaching and uh, stated that less students in the UK are start sh starting teacher training, which is an interesting point. Uh, in September 2018, we announced a renewed package of generous financial incentives for international teacher training, including tax-free scholarships worth £28,000 and tax-free bursaries worth £26,000 for trainees in modern foreign languages. The Noble Baroness Lady Brinton asked what guarantee uh, that I can give um, from the Home Office that there will be free movement for students. And the Immigration White Paper published in December, which you will know about, sets out the government's position on this particular issue and for a future single immigration system for the UK. For students, the White Paper proposals on post-study uh, went further than the MAC recommendations for students, extending um, post-study work to six months for undergraduate students attending institutions with degree awarding powers, six months for all master's students and 12 months for PhD students. And my laws, there is no limit to the number of students who can actually come to study in the UK, nor is there any intention to impose one. My laws, I do hope that I... Yes. I do apologise if I didn't make myself clear. My question was actually about people taking part in research projects rather than in students and concerns about the immigration white paper. OK, I, what I will do, given the time, is I will write uh, an answer to that particular uh, question. Yes. I might also press a particular point which I raised, which is the money which, in the event of a no deal, and I appreciate entirely the comments that he's made and the very helpful comments that I... Uh, think he's made. I'll read them very carefully about the, the, the actions that we'll take in the event of a deal. In the event of a no deal, I did raise a question about the amounts that will be saved because we're not spending them on these two programmes and the reassurance it would give if that money was guaranteed to be reapplied to whatever schemes the government chooses to uh, invest in subsequently. Uh, well, the, the Baroness would expect me to not to be able to give any particular reassurances, but I think my understanding is that the money would return to the Treasury. And then the question is, what does the Treasury do? Now, if I am wrong on that, um, I will write. But actually, I think I should write in any case just to provide clarification on that. That is the normal uh, process, I think, for, for that. Yeah. Um, I thank the Noble Lord Minister. I'm very sorry to interrupt at this late hour. But just for clarification, one of the questions that I ended with was about the fact that the European Research Council grants are for blue skies research. And I just wondered if uh, the Minister could comment on whether the thinking, perhaps under Professor Sir Adrian Smith's uh, report, about what we would do if we were not part of the ERC nationally, whether there would be clarity that any new scheme would be for blue skies research rather than strategic or applied research. I think that's the question that um, I know, uh, I'm sure, we'll somehow get back to Sir Adrian. Um, again, I will take that away. And if there's an answer that I can give to him in writing, I most certainly will. I'm, I'm extremely sorry, and I thank the Noble Lord the Minister for giving way. I asked quite a few pointed questions, and the Noble Lord the Minister hasn't answered any of them. So I'd be very grateful if he could write to me and copy it to all members who participated and put a copy in the Library of the House as well, please. Well, I did say at the beginning that I'm not sure that I could answer every single question. I know that the Noble Lord, Lord Billamoria, has taken part in so many debates that I have responded to. I do apologise to him. My intention is always to answer every question, but given the time, and I know that the Noble Lord feels passionately about the position that he, that he takes, I will most certainly uh, write to him. But to conclude fairly quickly, there's just one or two final important points. But I do hope that I have demonstrated to, to you today that the work that the government is doing to ensure that the UK man maintains its position as a world leader in education, research and innovation, and also that a nation uh, that it, that remains open to international mobility. 
Uh, and as the noble lords will have noted, on Thursday the Commission announced results of the 2018 ERC advance grant call. This is great news as senior researchers based in the uh, UK secured 47 of the 222 grants awarded, reaffirming that the UK research and innovation community maintains its world-leading status, despite all the uncertainties, my lords. And I am pleased to confirm that these grants will be funded through the underwrite guarantees should we leave the UU without a deal. This will uh, ensure that this groundbreaking research can go ahead. And may I just finally thank Noble Lord Jay again and all Noble Lords for taking part in this debate and for some in in incisive and very thoughtful comments. Uh, I am very grateful too to all those who have taken part in the uh, debate and I am very grateful for the Minister's thoughtful reply. I think that the debate has shown that there is continues to be real concern in the House and outside the House uh, at the potential cost of Brexit to uh, many of our young and to our universities, and that there really is a need also for the government to do all it can to mitigate the adverse effects of that. As, the, as my noble friend uh, Lord Krebs said, there really is no upside to this. But I'm sure that the noble Lord, the Minister, will take that message uh, back to his colleagues, and I much look forward to the response to our report, and I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say content, content. the contrary not content, the contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. The House do adjourn. <laughs>